Dungeons & Dragons Player's Handbook 5th Edition Preface Once upon a time, long, long ago, in a realm called the Midwestern United States, specifically the states of Minnesota and Wisconsin, a group of friends gathered together to forever alter the history of gaming. It wasn't their intent to do so. They were tired of merely reading tales about worlds of magic, monsters, and adventure. They wanted to play in those worlds rather than observe them. That they went on to invent Dungeons and & Dragons and thereby ignite a revolution in gaming that continues to this day speaks to two things. First, it speaks to their ingenuity and genius in figuring out that games were the perfect way to explore worlds that could not otherwise exist. Almost every modern game, whether played on a digital device or a tabletop, owes some debt to D&D. Second, it is a testament to the inherent appeal of the game they created. Dungeons & Dragons sparked a thriving global phenomenon. It is the first role-playing game, and it remains one of the best of its breed. To play D&D, and to play it well, you don't need to read all the rules, memorize every detail of the game, or master the fine art of rolling funny-looking dice. None of those things have any bearing on what's best about the game. What you need are two things, the first being friends with whom you can share the game. Playing games with your friends is a lot of fun, but D&D does something more than entertain. Playing D&D is an exercise in collaborative creation. You and your friends create epic stories filled with tension and memorable drama. You create silly in-jokes that make you laugh years later. The dice will be cruel to you, but you will soldier on. Your collective creativity will build stories that you will tell again and again, ranging from the utterly absurd to the stuff of legend. If you don't have friends interested in playing, don't worry. There's a special alchemy that takes place around a D&D table that nothing else can match. Play the game with someone enough and the two of you are likely to end up friends. It's a cool side effect of the game. Your next gaming group is as close as the nearest game store, online forum, or gaming convention. The second thing you need is a lively imagination or, more importantly, the willingness to use whatever imagination you have. You don't need to be a master storyteller or a brilliant artist. You just need to aspire to create, to have the courage of someone who is willing to build something and share it with others. Luckily, just as D&D can strengthen your friendships, it can help build in you the confidence to create and share. D&D is a game that teaches you to look for the clever solution, share the sudden idea that can overcome a problem and push yourself to imagine what could be, rather than simply accept what is. The first characters and adventures you create will probably be a collection of cliches. That's true of everyone, from the greatest dungeon masters in history on down. Accept this reality and move on to create the second character or adventure, which will be better, and then the third, which will be better still. Repeat that over the course of time, and soon you'll be able to create anything, from a character's background story to an epic world of fantasy adventure. Once you have that skill, it's yours forever. Countless writers, artists, and other creators can trace their beginnings to a few pages of D&D notes, a handful of dice, and a kitchen table. Above all else, D&D is yours. The friendships you make around the table will be unique to you. The adventures you embark on, the characters you create, the memories you make, these will be yours. D&D is your personal corner of the universe, a place where you have free reign to do as you wish. Go forth now. Read the rules of the game and the story of its worlds, but always remember that you are the one who brings them to life. They are nothing without the spark of life that you give them. Introduction The Dungeons & Dragons role-playing game is about storytelling in worlds of swords and sorcery. It shares elements with childhood games of make-believe. Like those games, D&D is driven by imagination. It's about picturing the towering castle beneath the stormy night sky and imagining how a fantasy adventurer might react to the challenges that scene presents. Dungeon Master DM After passing through the craggy peaks, the road takes a sudden turn to the east and Castle Ravenloft towers before you. Crumbling towers of stone keep a silent watch over the approach. They look like abandoned guardhouses. Beyond these, a wide chasm gapes, disappearing into the deep fog below. A lower drawbridge spans the chasm, leading to an arched entrance to the castle courtyard. The chains of the drawbridge creak in the wind, their rust-eaten iron straining with the weight. From atop the high strong walls, stone gargoyles stare at you from hollow sockets and grin hideously. A rotting wooden portcullis, green with growth, hangs in the entry tunnel. Beyond this, the main doors of Castle Ravenloft stand open, a rich warm light spilling into the courtyard. Philip, playing Gareth, want to look at the gargoyles. Have a feeling they're not just statues. Amy playing Riva the drawbridge looks precarious? Want to see how sturdy it is? Do you think we can cross it? Or is it going to collapse under our weight? 
Unlike a game of make-believe, D&D gives structure to the stories, a way of determining the consequences of the adventurer's action. Players roll dice to resolve whether their attacks hit or miss or whether their adventurers can scale a cliff, roll away from the strike of a magical lightning bolt, or pull off some other dangerous task. Anything is possible, but the dice make some outcomes more probable than others. Dungeon Master, DM OK, one at a time. Philip, you're looking at the gargoyles? Philip, yeah. Is there any hint they might be creatures and not decorations? DM, make an intelligence check. Philip, does my investigation skill apply? DM, sure. Philip, rolling a d20, ugh, 7. DM, they look like decorations to you. And Amy Riva is checking out the drawbridge? In the Dungeons and Dragons game, each player creates an adventurer, also called a character, and teams up with other adventurers played by friends. Working together, the group might explore a dark dungeon, a ruined city, a haunted castle, a lost temple deep in a jungle, or a lava-filled cavern beneath a mysterious mountain. The adventurers can solve puzzles, talk with other characters, battle fantastic monsters, and discover fabulous magic items and other treasure. One player, however, takes on the role of the dungeon master, DM, the game's lead storyteller and referee. The DM creates adventures for the characters who navigate its hazards and decide which paths to explore. The DM might describe the entrance to Castle Ravenloft, and the players decide what they want their adventurers to do. Will they walk across the dangerously weathered drawbridge? Tie themselves together with rope to minimize the chance that someone will fall if the drawbridge gives way? Or cast a spell to carry them over the chasm? Then the DM determines the results of the adventurer's actions and narrates what they experience. Because the DM can improvise to react to anything the players attempt, D&D is infinitely flexible and each adventure can be exciting and unexpected. The game has no real end when one story or quest wraps up, another one can begin, creating an ongoing story called a campaign. Many people who play the game keep their campaigns going for months or years, meeting with their friends every week or so to pick up the story where they left off. The adventurers grow in might as the campaign continues. Each monster defeated, each adventure completed, and each treasure recovered not only adds to the continuing story, but also earns the adventurers new capabilities. This increase in power is reflected by an adventurer's level. There's no winning and losing in the Dungeons & Dragons game, at least not the way those terms are usually understood. Together, the DM and the players create an exciting story of bold adventurers who confront deadly perils. Sometimes an adventurer might come to a grisly end, torn apart by ferocious monsters or done in by a nefarious villain. Even so, the other adventurers can search for powerful magic to revive their fallen comrade, or the player might choose to create a new character to carry on. The group might fail to complete an adventure successfully, but if everyone had a good time and created a memorable story, they all win. World of Adventure The many worlds of the Dungeons and Dragons game are places of magic and monsters, of brave warriors and spectacular adventures. They begin with a foundation of medieval fantasy and then add the creatures, places, and magic that make these worlds unique. The worlds of the Dungeons & Dragons game exist within a vast cosmos called the Multiverse, connected in strange and mysterious ways to one another and to other planes of existence, such as the elemental plane of fire and the infinite depths of the abyss. Within the D&D game, the legends of the Forgotten Realms, Dragonlance, Greyhawk, Dark Sun, Mistara, and Eberron settings are woven together in the fabric of the multiverse. Alongside these worlds are hundreds of thousands more, created by generations of D&D players for their own games. And amid all the richness of the multiverse, you might create a world of your own. All these worlds share characteristics, but each world is set apart by its own history and cultures, distinctive monsters and races, fantastic geography, ancient dungeons, and scheming villains. Some races have unusual traits in different worlds. The halflings of the Dark Sun setting, for example, are jungle-dwelling cannibals and the elves are desert nomads. Some worlds feature races unknown in other settings, such as Eberron's warforged, soldiers created and imbued with life to fight in the last war. Some worlds are dominated by one great story, like the War of the Lance that plays a central role in the Dragonlance setting. But they're all D&D worlds, and you can use the rules in this book to create a character and play in any one of them. Your DM might set the campaign on one of these worlds or on one that he or she created. Because there is so much diversity among the worlds of D&D, you should check with your DM about any house rules that will affect your play of the game. Ultimately, the Dungeon Master is the authority on the campaign and its setting, even if the setting is a published world.
Using this book, the player's handbook is divided into three parts. Part 1, Chapters 1-6 is about creating a character, providing the rules and guidance you need to make the character you'll play in the game. It includes information on the various races, classes, backgrounds, equipment, and other customization options that you can choose from. Many of the rules in Part 1 rely on material in Parts 2 and 3. If you come across a game concept in Part 1 that you don't understand, consult the book's index. Part 2, Chapters 7, 9, details the rules of how to play the game beyond the basics described in this introduction. That part covers the kinds of die rolls you make to determine success or failure at the tasks your character attempts, and describes the three broad categories of activity in the game, exploration, interaction, and combat. Part 3, Chapters 10 to 11, is all about magic. It covers the nature of magic in the worlds of D&D, the rules for spellcasting, and the huge variety of spells available to magic using characters and monsters in the game. How to play? The play of the Dungeons & Dragons game unfolds according to this basic pattern. 1. The DM describes the environment. The DM tells the players where their adventurers are and what's around them, presenting the basic scope of options that present themselves, how many doors lead out of a room, what's on a table, who's in the tavern, and so on. 2. The players describe what they want to do. Sometimes one player speaks for the whole party, saying, we'll take the east door, for example. Other times, different adventurers do different things. One adventurer might search a treasure chest while a second examines an esoteric symbol engraved on a wall and a third keeps watch for monsters. The players don't need to take turns, but the DM listens to every player and decides how to resolve those actions. Sometimes resolving a task is easy. If an adventurer wants to walk across a room and open a door, the DM might just say that the door opens and describe what lies beyond. But the door might be locked, the floor might hide a deadly trap, or some other circumstance might make it challenging for an adventurer to complete a task. In those cases, the DM decides what happens, often relying on the roll of a die to determine the results of an action. 3. The DM narrates the results of the adventurer's actions. Describing the results often leads to another decision point, which brings the flow of the game right back to step one. This pattern holds whether the adventurers are cautiously exploring a ruin, talking to a devious prince, or locked in mortal combat against a mighty dragon. In certain situations, particularly combat, the action is more structured and the players and DM do take turns choosing and resolving actions. But most of the time, play is fluid and flexible, adapting to the circumstances of the adventure. Often the action of an adventure takes place in the imagination of the players and DM relying on the DM's verbal descriptions to set the scene. Some DMs like to use music, art, or recorded sound effects to help set the mood and many players and DMs alike adopt different voices for the various adventurers, monsters, and other characters they play in the game. Sometimes a DM might lay out a map and use tokens or miniature figures to represent each creature involved in a scene to help the players keep track of where everyone is. Game Dice The game uses polyhedral dice with different numbers of sides. You can find dice like these in game stores and in many bookstores. In these rules, the different dice are referred to by the letter D followed by the number of sides, D4, D6, D8, D10, D12, and D20. For instance, a D6 is a six-sided die, the typical cube that many games use. Percentile dice, or D100, work a little differently. You generate a number between 1 and 100 by rolling two different 10-sided dice numbered from 0 to 9. One die, designated before you roll, gives the 10's digit and the other gives the 1's digit. If you roll a 7 and a 1, for example, the number rolled is 71. Two zeros represent 100. Some 10-sided dice are numbered in 10's 0, 0, 10, 20, and so on, making it easier to distinguish the 10's digit from the 1's digit. In this case, a roll of 70 and 1 is 71, and 0, 0, and 0 is 100. When you need to roll dice, the rules tell you how many dice to roll of a certain type, as well as what modifiers to add. For example, 3d8 plus 5 means you roll 3 8-sided dice, add them together, and add 5 to the total. The same D notation appears in the expressions 1d3 and 1d2. To simulate the roll of 1d3, roll a d6 and divide the number rolled by 2 round up. To simulate the roll of 1d2, roll any die and assign a 1 or 2 to the roll depending on whether it was odd or even. Alternatively, if the number rolled is more than half the number of sides on the die, it's a 2. 
The D20. Does an adventurer's sword swing hurt a dragon or just bounce off its iron hard scales? Will the ogre believe an outrageous bluff? Can a character swim across a raging river? Can a character avoid the main blast of a fireball? Or does he or she take full damage from the blaze? In cases where the outcome of an action is uncertain, the Dungeons and Dragons game relies on rolls of a 20-sided die, AD20, to determine success or failure. Every character and monster in the game has capabilities defined by six ability scores. The abilities are Strength, Dexterity, Constitution, Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma, and they typically range from 3 to 18 for most adventurers. Monsters might have scores as low as 1 or as high as 30. These ability scores and the ability modifiers derived from them are the basis for almost every D20 royal that a player makes on a character's or monster's behalf. Ability checks, attack rolls, and saving throws are the three main kinds of D20 rolls forming the core of the rules of the game. All three follow these simple steps. 1. Roll the die and add a modifier. Roll a D20 and add the relevant modifier. This is typically the modifier derived from one of the six ability scores and it sometimes includes a proficiency bonus to reflect a character's particular skill. See Chapter 1 for details on each ability and how to determine an ability's modifier. 2. Apply circumstantial bonuses and penalties. A class feature, a spell, a particular circumstance, or some other effect might give a bonus or penalty to the check. 3. Compare the total to a target number. If the total equals or exceeds the target number, the ability check, attack roll, or saving throw is a success. Otherwise, it's a failure. The DM is usually the one who determines target numbers and tells players whether their ability checks, attack rolls, and saving throws succeed or fail. The target number for an ability check or a saving throw is called a difficulty class, DC. The target number for an attack roll is called an armor class, AC. This simple rule governs the resolution of most tasks in D&D play. Chapter 7, Using Ability Scores, provides more detailed rules for using the D20 in the game. Advantage and Disadvantage Sometimes an ability check, attack roll, or saving throw is modified by special situations called advantage and disadvantage. Advantage reflects the positive circumstances surrounding a D20 roll, while disadvantage reflects the opposite. When you have either advantage or disadvantage, you roll a second D20 when you make the roll. Use the higher of the two rolls if you have advantage and use the lower roll if you have disadvantage. For example, if you have disadvantage and roll a 17 and a 5, you use the 5. If you instead have advantage and roll those numbers, you use the 17. More detailed rules for advantage and disadvantage are presented in Chapter 7. Specific Beats General this book contains rules, especially in parts 2 and 3, that govern how the game plays. That said, many racial traits, class features, spells, magic items, monster abilities, and other game elements break the general rules in some way, creating an exception to how the rest of the game works. Remember this, if a specific rule contradicts a general rule, the specific rule wins. Exceptions to the rules are often minor. For instance, many adventurers don't have proficiency with longbows, but every wood elf does because of a racial trait. That trait creates a minor exception in the game. Other examples of rule-breaking are more conspicuous. For instance, an adventurer can't normally pass through walls, but some spells make that possible. Magic accounts for most of the major exceptions to the rules. Round down. There's one more general rule you need to know at the outset. Whenever you divide a number in the game, round down if you end up with a fraction even if the fraction is one half or greater. Adventures The Dungeons and Dragons game consists of a group of characters embarking on an adventure that the Dungeon Master presents to them. Each character brings particular capabilities to the adventure in the form of ability scores and skills, class features, racial traits, equipment, and magic items. Every character is different with various strengths and weaknesses, so the best party of adventurers is one in which the characters complement each other and cover the weaknesses of the Dungeons & Dragons game consists of a group of characters embarking on an adventure that the Dungeon Master presents to them. Each character brings particular capabilities to the adventure in the form of ability scores and skills, class features, racial traits, equipment, and magic items. Every character is different with various strengths and weaknesses, so the best party of adventurers is one in which the characters complement each other and cover the weaknesses of their companions. The adventurers must cooperate to successfully complete the adventure. The adventure is the heart of the game, a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. 
An adventure might be created by the dungeon master or purchased off the shelf, tweaked and modified to suit the DM's needs and desires. In either case, an adventure features a fantastic setting, whether it's an underground dungeon, a crumbling castle, a stretch of wilderness, or a bustling city. It features a rich cast of characters, the adventurers created and played by the other players at the table as well as non-player characters, NPCs. Those characters might be patrons, allies, enemies, hirelings, or just background extras in an adventure. Often, one of the NPCs is a villain whose agenda drives much of an adventure's action. Over the course of their adventures, the characters are confronted by a variety of creatures, objects, and situations that they must deal with in some way. Sometimes the adventurers and other creatures do their best to kill or capture each other in combat. At other times, the adventurers talk to another creature or even a magical object with a goal in mind. And often, the adventurers spend time trying to solve a puzzle, bypass an obstacle, find something hidden, or unravel the current situation. Meanwhile, the adventurers explore the world, making decisions about which way to travel and what they'll try to do next. Adventures vary in length and complexity. A short adventure might present only a few challenges, and it might take no more than a single game session to complete. A long adventure can involve hundreds of combats, interactions, and other challenges, and take dozens of sessions to play through, stretching over weeks or months of real time. Usually, the end of an adventure is marked by the adventurers heading back to civilization to rest and enjoy the spoils of their labors. But that's not the end of the story. You can think of an adventure as a single episode of a TV series made up of multiple exciting scenes. A campaign is the whole series, a string of adventures joined together with a consistent group of adventurers following the narrative from start to finish. The Three Pillars of Adventure Adventurers can try to do anything their players can imagine, but it can be helpful to talk about their activities in three broad categories, exploration, social interaction, and combat. Exploration includes both the adventurers' movement through the world and their interaction with objects and situations that require their attention. Exploration is the give and take of the players describing what they want their characters to do and the dungeon master telling the players what happens as a result. On a large scale, that might involve the characters spending a day crossing a rolling plane or an hour making their way through caverns underground. On the smallest scale, it could mean one character pulling a lever in a dungeon room to see what happens. Social interaction features the adventurers talking to someone or something else. It might mean demanding that a captured scout reveal the secret entrance to the goblin lair, getting information from a rescued prisoner, pleading for mercy from an orc chieftain, or persuading a talkative magic mirror to show a distant location to the adventurers. The rules in Part 2, especially Chapters 7 and 8, support exploration and social interaction as do many class features and personality traits in Part 1. Combat, the focus of Chapter 9, involves characters and other creatures swinging weapons, casting spells, maneuvering for position, and so on, all in an effort to defeat their opponents, whether that means killing every enemy, taking captives, or forcing a rout. Combat is the most structured element of a D&D session, with creatures taking turns to make sure that everyone gets a chance to act. Even in the context of a pitched battle, there's still plenty of opportunity for adventurers to attempt wacky stunts like surfing down a flight of stairs on a shield, to examine the environment, perhaps by pulling a mysterious lever, and to interact with other creatures, including allies, enemies, and neutral parties. The wonders of magic. Few D&D adventures end without something magical happening. Whether helpful or harmful, magic appears frequently in the life of an adventurer, and it is the focus of part three. In the worlds of Dungeons and Dragons, practitioners of magic are rare, set apart from the masses of people by their extraordinary talent. Common folk might see evidence of magic on a regular basis, but it's usually minor, a fantastic monster, a visibly answered prayer, a wizard walking through the streets with an animated shield guardian as a bodyguard. For adventurers, though, magic is key to their survival. Without the healing magic of clerics and paladins, adventurers would quickly succumb to their wounds. Without the uplifting magical support of bards and clerics, warriors might be overwhelmed by powerful foes. Without the sheer magical power and versatility of wizards and druids, every threat would be magnified tenfold. Magic is also a favored tool of villains. Many adventures are driven by the machinations of spellcasters who are hellbent on using magic for some ill end. A cult leader seeks to awaken a god who slumbers beneath the sea, a hag kidnaps youths to magically drain them of their vigor, a mad wizard labors to invest an army of automatons with a facsimile of life. 
A dragon begins a mystical ritual to rise up as a god of destruction. These are just a few of the magical threats that adventurers might face. With magic of their own, in the form of spells and magic items, the adventurers might prevail. Part 1. Creating a Character Chapter 1. Step-by-Step -step Characters Your first step in playing an adventurer in the Dungeons & Dragons game is to imagine and create a character of your own. Your character is a combination of game statistics, role-playing hooks, and your imagination. You choose a race, such as human or halfling, and a class, such as fighter or wizard. You also invent the personality, appearance, and backstory of your character. Once completed, your character serves as your representative in the game, your avatar in the Dungeons and Dragons world. Before you dive into Step Below, think about the kind of adventurer you want to play. You might be a courageous fighter, a skulking rogue, a fervent cleric, or a flamboyant wizard. Or you might be more interested in an unconventional character, such as a brawny rogue who likes hand-to-hand -hand combat, or a sharpshooter who picks off enemies from afar. Do you like fantasy fiction featuring dwarves or elves? Try building a character of one of those races. Do you want your character to be the toughest adventurer at the table? Consider a class like Barbarian or Paladin. If you don't know where else to begin, take a look at the illustrations in this book to see what catches your interest. Once you have a character in mind, follow these steps in order, making decisions that reflect the character you want. Your conception of your character might evolve with each choice you make. What's important is that you come to the table with a character you're excited to play. Throughout this chapter, we use the term character sheet to mean whatever you use to track your character, whether it's a formal character sheet, like the one at the end of this book, some form of digital record, or a piece of notebook paper. An official D&D character sheet is a fine place to start until you know what information you need and how you use it during the game. Each step of character creation includes an example of that step, with a player named Bob building his dwarf character, Bruiner. 1. Choose a race. Every character belongs to a race, one of the many intelligent humanoid species in the D&D world. The most common player character races are dwarves, elves, halflings, and humans. Some races also have subraces, such as mountain dwarf or wood elf. Chapter 2 provides more information about these races, as well as the less widespread races of dragonborn, gnomes, half-elves, half-ors, and tieflings. The race you choose contributes to your character's identity in an important way by establishing a general appearance and the natural talents gained from culture and ancestry. Your character's race grants particular racial traits, such as special senses, proficiency with certain weapons or tools, proficiency in one or more skills, or the ability to use minor spells. These traits sometimes dovetail with the capabilities of certain classes. See Step 2. For example, the racial traits of Lightfoot Halflings make them exceptional rogues and High Elves tend to be powerful wizards. Sometimes playing against type can be fun, too. Half-Orc Paladins and Mountain Dwarf Wizards, for example, can be unusual but memorable characters. Your race also increases one or more of your ability scores, which you determine in Step 3. Note these increases and remember to apply them later. Record the traits granted by your race on your character sheet. Be sure to note your starting languages and your base speed as well. Building Bruiner Example Step 1 Bob is sitting down to create his character. He decides that a gruff mountain dwarf fits the character he wants to play. He notes all the racial traits of dwarves on his character sheet, including his speed of 25 feet and the languages he knows, common and dwarvish. Step 2 Choose a class Every adventurer is a member of a class. Class broadly describes a character's vocation, what special talents he or she possesses, and the tactics he or she is most likely to employ when exploring a dungeon, fighting monsters, or engaging in a tense negotiation. The character classes are described in Chapter 3, Classes. Your character receives a number of benefits from your choice of class. Many of these benefits are class features capabilities, including spellcasting, that set your character apart from members of other classes. You also gain a number of proficiencies, armor, weapons, skills, saving throws, and sometimes tools. Your proficiencies define many of the things your character can do particularly well, from using certain weapons to telling a convincing lie. On your character sheet, record all the features that your class gives you at first level. Level Typically, a character starts at first level and advances in level by adventuring and gaining experience points XP. A first-level character is inexperienced in the adventuring world, although he or she might have been a soldier or a pirate and done dangerous things before. Starting off at first level marks your character's entry into the adventuring life. 
If you're already familiar with the game, or if you were joining an existing D&D campaign, your DM might decide to have you begin at a higher level on the assumption that your character has already survived a few harrowing adventures. Quick build. Each class description in Chapter 3 includes a section offering suggestions to quickly build a character of that class, including how to assign your highest ability scores, a background suitable to the class, and starting spells. Record your level on your character sheet. If you're starting at a higher level, record the additional elements your class gives you for your levels past first. Also record your experience points. A once level character has zero XP. A higher level character typically begins with the minimum amount of XP required to reach that level C beyond first level later in this chapter. Hit points and hit dice. Your character's hit points define how tough your character is in combat and other dangerous situations. Your hit points are determined by your hit dice, short for hit point dice. Refer to the following ability score summary. At first level, your character has one hit die and the die type is determined by your class. You start with hit points equal to the highest roll of that die as indicated in your class description. You also add your constitution modifier, which you'll determine in step three. This is also your hit point maximum. Record your character's hit points on your character sheet. Also record the type of hit die your character uses and the number of hit dice you have. After you rest, you can spend hit dice to regain hit points, see resting in Chapter 8, Adventuring. Proficiency Bonus The table that appears in your class description shows your proficiency bonus, which is plus 2 for a first level character. Your proficiency bonus applies to many of the numbers you'll be recording on your character sheet. Attack rolls using weapons you're proficient with. Attack rolls with spells you cast. Ability checks using skills you're proficient in. Ability checks using tools you're proficient with. Saving throws you're proficient in. Saving throw DCs for spells you cast explained in each spellcasting class. Your class determines your weapon proficiencies, your saving throw proficiencies, and some of your skill and tool proficiencies. Skills are described in Chapter 7 using ability scores and tools in Chapter 5, Equipment. Your background gives you additional skill and tool proficiencies and some races give you more proficiencies. Be sure to note all of these proficiencies as well as your proficiency bonus on your character sheet. Your proficiency bonus can't be added to a single die roll or other number more than once. Occasionally, your proficiency bonus might be modified, doubled, or halved, for example, before you apply it. If a circumstance suggests that your proficiency bonus applies more than once to the same role or that it should be multiplied more than once, you nevertheless add it only once, multiply it only once, and have it only once. Building Bruino Example Step 2 Bob imagines Bruiner charging into battle with an axe, one horn on his helmet broken off. He makes Bruino a fighter and notes the fighter's proficiencies and first-level class features on his character sheet. As a first-level fighter, Bruino has one hit die, AD10, and starts with hit points equal to 10 plus his constitution modifier. Bob notes this and will record the final number after he determines Bruiner's constitution score, see Step 3. Bob also notes the proficiency bonus for a first-level character, which is plus 2. 3. Determine ability scores. Much of what your character does in the game depends on his or her six abilities, strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Each ability has a score, which is a number you record on your character sheet. The six abilities and their use in the game are described in Chapter 7. The Ability Score Summary Table provides a quick reference for what qualities are measured by each ability, what races increases which abilities, and what classes consider each ability particularly important. You generate your character's six ability scores randomly. Roll four six-sided dice and record the total of the highest three dice on a piece of scratch paper. Do this five more times so that you have six numbers. If you want to save time or don't like the idea of randomly determining ability scores, you can use the following scores instead, 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, 8. Now take your six numbers and write each number beside one of your character's six abilities to assign scores to strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Afterward, make any changes to your ability scores as a result of your race choice. After assigning your ability scores, determine your ability modifiers using the ability scores and modifiers table. To determine an ability modifier without consulting the table, subtract 10 from the ability score and then divide the result by 2, round down. Write the modifier next to each of your scores. Building Bruiner, Step 3. 
Bob decides to use the standard set of scores, 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, 8, for Bruiner's abilities. Since he's a fighter, he puts his highest score, 15, in strength. His next highest, 14, goes in constitution. Bruiner might be a brash fighter, but Bob decides he wants the dwarf to be older, wiser, and a good leader, so he puts decent scores in wisdom and charisma. After applying his racial benefits, increasing Bruiner's constitution by 2 and his strength by 2, Bruiner's ability scores and modifiers look like this. Strength 17, plus 3, Dexterity 10, plus 0, Constitution 16, plus 3. Intelligence 8, minus 1, Wisdom 13, plus 1, Charisma 12, plus 1. Bob fills in Bruiner's final hit points. 10 plus his constitution modifier of plus 3 for a total of 13 hit points. Variant Customizing Ability Scores At your Dungeon Master's option, you can use this variant for determining your ability scores. The method described here allows you to build a character with a set of ability scores you choose individually. You have 27 points to spend on your ability scores. The cost of each score is shown on the Ability Score Point Cost Table. For example, a score of 14 costs 7 points. Using this method, 15 is the highest ability score you can end up with before applying racial increases. You can't have a score lower than 8. This method of determining ability scores enables you to create a set of 3 high numbers and 3 low ones, 15, 15, 15, 8, 8, 8, a set of numbers that are above average and nearly equal, 13, 13, 13, 12, 12, 12, or any set of numbers between those extremes. 4. Describe your character. Once you know the basic game aspects of your character, it's time to flesh him or her out as a person. Your character needs a name. Spend a few minutes thinking about what he or she looks like and how he or she behaves in general terms. Using the information in Chapter 4, Personality and Background, you can flesh out your character's appearance and personality. Choose your character's alignment, the moral compass that guides his or her decisions and ideals. Chapter 4 also helps you identify the things your character holds most dear, called bonds, and the flaws that could one day undermine him or her. Your character's background describes where he or she came from, his or her original occupation, and the character's place in the D&D world. Your DM might offer additional backgrounds beyond the ones included in Chapter 4 and might be willing to work with you to craft a background that's a more precise fit for your character concept. A background gives your character a background feature, a general benefit, and proficiency in two skills, and it might also give you additional languages or proficiency with certain kinds of tools. Record this information along with the personality information you develop on your character sheet. Your character's abilities. Take your character's ability scores and race into account as you flesh out his or her appearance and personality. A very strong character with low intelligence might think and behave very differently from a very smart character with low strength. For example, high strength usually corresponds with a burly or athletic body, while a character with low strength might be scrawny or plump. A character with high dexterity is probably lithe and slim, while a character with low dexterity might be either gangly and awkward or heavy and thick-fingered. A character with high constitution usually looks healthy with bright eyes and abundant energy. A character with low constitution might be sickly or frail. A character with high intelligence might be highly inquisitive and studious, while a character with low intelligence might speak simply or easily forget details. A character with high wisdom has good judgment, empathy, and a general awareness of what's going on. A character with low wisdom might be absent-minded, foolhardy, or oblivious. A character with high charisma exudes confidence, which is usually mixed with a graceful or intimidating presence. A character with a low charisma might come across as abrasive, inarticulate, or timid. Building Bruiner, Step 4 Bob fills in some of Bruiner's basic details, his name, his sex, male, his height and weight, and his alignment, lawful good. His high strength and constitution suggest a healthy, athletic body, and his low intelligence suggests a degree of forgetfulness. Bob decides that Bruiner comes from a noble line, but his clan was expelled from its homeland when Bruiner was very young. He grew up working as a smith in the remote villages of Icewind Dale. But Bruiner has a heroic destiny to reclaim his homeland, so Bob chooses the folk hero background for his dwarf. He notes the proficiencies and special feature this background gives him. 
Bob has a pretty clear picture of Bruiner's personality in mind, so he skips the personality traits suggested in the folk hero background, noting instead that Bruiner is a caring, sensitive dwarf who genuinely loves his friends and allies. But he hides the soft heart behind a gruff, snarling demeanor. He chooses the ideal of fairness from the list in his background, noting that Bruiner believes that no one is above the law. Given his history, Bruinos' bond is obvious. He aspires to someday reclaim Mithril Hall, his homeland, from the shadow dragon that drove the dwarves out. His flaw is tied to his caring, sensitive nature. He has a soft spot for orphans and wayward souls, leading him to show mercy even when it might not be warranted. 5. Choose Equipment Your class and background determine your character's starting equipment, including weapons, armor, and other adventuring gear. Record this equipment on your character sheet. All such items are detailed in Chapter 5, Equipment. Instead of taking the gear given to you by your class and background, you can purchase your starting equipment. You have a number of gold pieces, GP, to spend based on your class, as shown in Chapter 5. Extensive lists of equipment with prices also appear in that chapter. If you wish, you can also have one trinket at no cost, see the trinkets table at the end of Chapter 5. Your strength score limits the amount of gear you can carry. Try not to purchase equipment with a total weight in pounds, exceeding your strength score times 15. Chapter 7 has more information on carrying capacity. Armor Class Your armor class, AC, represents how well your character avoids being wounded in battle. Things that contribute to your AC include the armor you wear, the shield you carry, and your dexterity modifier. Not all characters wear armor or carry shields, however. Without armor or a shield, your character's AC equals 10 plus his or her dexterity modifier. If your character wears armor, carries a shield, or both, calculate your AC using the rules in Chapter 5. Record your AC on your character sheet. Your character needs to be proficient with armor and shields to wear and use them effectively, and your armor and shield proficiencies are determined by your class. There are drawbacks to wearing armor or carrying a shield if you lack the required proficiency, as explained in Chapter 5. Some spells and class features give you a different way to calculate your AC. If you have multiple features that give you different ways to calculate your AC, you choose which one to use. Weapons For each weapon your character wields, calculate the modifier you use when you attack with the weapon and the damage you deal when you hit. When you make an attack with a weapon, you roll a d20 and add your proficiency bonus, but only if you are proficient with the weapon and the appropriate ability modifier. For attacks with melee weapons, use your strength modifier for attack and damage rolls. A weapon that has the finesse property, such as a rapier, can use your dexterity modifier instead. For attacks with ranged weapons, use your dexterity modifier for attack and damage rolls. A melee weapon that has the throne property, such as a hand axe, can use your strength modifier instead. Building Bruino example, Step 5 Bob writes down the starting equipment from the fighter class and the folk hero background. His starting equipment includes chain mail and a shield, which combine to give Bruino an armor class of 18. For Bruiner's weapons, Bob chooses a battle axe and two hand axes. His battle axe is a melee weapon, so Bruino uses his strength modifier for his attacks and damage. His attack bonus is his strength modifier, plus 3, plus his proficiency bonus, plus 2, for a total of plus 5. The battle axe deals 1d8 slashing damage, and Bruino adds his strength modifier to the damage when he hits, for a total of 1d8 plus 3 slashing damage. When throwing a hand axe, Bruino has the same attack bonus hand axes as thrown weapons, use strength for attacks and damage, and the weapon deals 1d6 plus 3 slashing damage when it hits. 6. Come together. Most D&D characters don't work alone. Each character plays a role within a party, a group of adventurers working together for a common purpose. Teamwork and cooperation greatly improve your party's chances to survive the many perils in the worlds of Dungeons & Dragons. Talk to your fellow players and your DM to decide whether your characters know one another, how they met, and what sorts of quests the group might undertake. Beyond First Level as your character goes on adventures and overcomes challenges, he or she gains experience, represented by experience points. A character who reaches a specified experience point total advances in capability. This advancement is called gaining a level. When your character gains a level, his or her class often grants additional features as detailed in the class description. Some of these features allow you. Each time you gain a level, you gain one additional hit die. 
Roll the hit die, add your constitution modifier to the roll and add the total minimum of one to your hit point maximum. Alternatively, you can use the fixed value shown in your class entry, which is the average result of the die roll rounded up. When your constitution modifier increases by one, your hit point maximum increases by one for each level you have attained. For example, when Bruiner reaches eighth level as a fighter, he increases his constitution score from 17 to 18, thus increasing his constitution modifier from plus three to plus four. His hit point maximum then increases by eight. The character advancement table summarizes the XP you need to advance in levels from level 1 through level 20 and the proficiency bonus for a character of that level. Consult the information in your character's class. Tiers of Play The shading in the character advancement table shows the four tiers of play. The tiers don't have any rules associated with them, they are a general description of how the play experience changes as characters gain levels. In the first tier, levels 1, 4, characters are effectively apprentice adventurers. They are learning the features that define them as members of particular classes, including the major choices that flavor their class features as they advance, such as a wizard's arcane tradition or a fighter's martial archetype. The threats they face are relatively minor, usually posing a danger to local farmsteads or villages. In the second tier, levels 5 to 10, characters come into their own. Many spellcasters gain access to third-level spells at the start of this tier, crossing a new threshold of magical power with spells such as Fireball and Lightning Bolt. At this tier, many weapon-using classes gain the ability to make multiple attacks in one round. These characters have become important, facing dangers that threaten cities and kingdoms. In the third tier, levels 11 to 16, characters have reached a level of power that sets them high above the ordinary populace and makes them special even among adventurers. At 11th level, many spellcasters gain access to 6th level spells, some of which create effects previously impossible for player characters to achieve. Other characters gain features that allow them to make more attacks or do more impressive things with those attacks. These mighty adventurers often confront threats to whole regions and continents. At the 4th tier, levels 17 to 20, characters achieve the pinnacle of their class features, becoming heroic or villainous archetypes in their own right. The fate of the world or even the fundamental order of the multiverse might hang in the balance during their adventures. Chapter 2. Races. A visit to one of the great cities in the worlds of Dungeons and Dragons, Waterdeep, the free city of Greyhawk, or even Uncanny Sigil, the city of doors, overwhelms the senses. Voices chatter in countless different languages. The smells mingle with the odors of crowded streets and poor display the diverse origins of their inhabitants. And the people themselves, people of varying size, shape, and color, dressed in a dazzling spectrum of styles and hues, represent many different races, from diminutive halflings and stout dwarves to majestically beautiful elves, mingling among a variety of human ethnicities. Scattered among the members of these more common races are the true exotics, a hulking dragonborn here, pushing his way through the crowd, and a sly tiefling there, lurking in the shadows with mischief in her eyes. A group of gnomes laughs as one of them activates a clever wooden toy that moves of its own accord. Half-elves and half-orcs live and work alongside humans without fully belonging to the races of either of their parents. And there, well out of the sunlight, is a lone drow, a fugitive from the subterranean expanse of the Underdark, trying to make his way in a world that fears his kind. Choosing a race. Humans are the most common people in the worlds of D&D, but they live and work alongside dwarves, elves, halflings, and countless other fantastic species. Your character belongs to one of these peoples. Not every intelligent race of the multiverse is appropriate for a player-controlled adventurer. Dwarves, elves, halflings, and humans are the most common races to produce the sort of adventurers who make up typical parties. Dragonborn, gnomes, half-elves, halferks, and tieflings are less common as adventurers. Drow, a subrace of elves, are also uncommon. Your choice of race affects many different aspects of seven-year character. It establishes fundamental qualities that exist throughout your character's adventuring career. When making this decision, keep in mind the kind of character you want to play. For example, a halfling could be a good choice for a sneaky rogue, a dwarf makes a tough warrior, and an elf can be a master of arcane magic. Underscore your character race not only affects your ability scores and traits, but also provides the cues for building your character's story. Each race's description in this chapter includes information to help you roleplay a character of underscore that race, including personality, physical appearance, creatures of society, and racial alignment tendencies. 
Essay details are suggestions to help you think about your character. Adventurers can deviate widely from the norm for their race. It's worthwhile to consider why your character's background and personality. Racial trails. The description of each race includes racial traits that are common to members of that race. The following entries appear among the traits of most races. Ability score increase. Every race increases one or more of a character's ability scores. Age. The age entry notes the age when a member of the race is considered an adult as well as the race's expected lifespan. This information can help you decide how old your character is at the start of the game. You can choose any age for your character, which could provide an explanation for some of your ability scores. For example, if you play a young or very old character, your age could explain a particularly low strength or constitution score, while advanced age could account for a high intelligence or wisdom. Alignment. Most races have tendencies towards certain alignments described in this entry. These are not binding for player characters, but considering why your dwarf is chaotic, for example, in defiance of lawful dwarf society can help you better define your character. Size. Characters of most races are medium a size category including creatures that are roughly 4 to 8 feet tall. Members of a few races are small between 2 and 4 feet tall, which means that certain rules of the game affect them differently. The most important of these rules is that small characters have trouble wielding heavy weapons, as explained in Chapter 5, Equipment. Speed. Your speed determines how far you can move when traveling, Chapter 8, Adventuring, and Fighting, Chapter 9, Combat. Languages. By virtue of your race, your character can speak, read, and write certain languages. Chapter 4, Personality and Background, lists the most common languages of the D&D multiverse. Subraces. Some races have subraces. Members of a subrace have the traits of the parent race in addition to the traits specified for their subrace. Relationships among subraces vary significantly from race to race and world to world. In the Dragonlance campaign setting, for example, mountain dwarves and hill dwarves live together as different clans of the same people, but in the Forgotten Realms, they live far apart in separate kingdoms and call themselves shield dwarves and gold dwarves, respectively. Dwarf. You late, elf? Came the rough edge of a familiar voice. Bruiner Battlehammer walked up the back of his dead foe, disregarding the fact that the heavy monster lay on top of his elven friend. In spite of the added discomfort, the dwarf's long, pointed, often broken nose and gray streak, though still fiery red beard came as a welcome sight to Drizzt. Knew I'd find ye in trouble if I came out and looked for ye. R. A. Salvatore, the Crystal Shard. Kingdoms rich in ancient grandeur, halls carved into the roots of mountains, the echoing of picks and hammers in deep mines and blazing forges, a commitment to clan and tradition, and a burning hatred of goblins and orcs, these common threads unite all dwarves. Short and stout. Bold and hardy, dwarves are known as skilled warriors, miners, and workers of stone and metal. Though they stand well under five feet tall, dwarves are so broad and compact that they can weigh as much as a human standing nearly two feet taller. Their courage and endurance are also easily a match for any of the larger folk. Dwarven skin ranges from deep brown to a paler hue tinged with red, but the most common shades are light brown or deep tan, like certain tones of earth. Their hair, worn long but in simple styles, is usually black, gray, or brown, though paler dwarves often have red hair. Male dwarves value their beards highly and groom them carefully. Long memory, long grudges. Dwarves can live to be more than 400 years old, so the oldest living dwarves often remember a very different world. For example, some of the oldest dwarves living in Citadel Felbar, in the world of the Forgotten Realms, can recall the day more than three centuries ago. When orcs conquered the fortress and drove them into an exile that lasted over 250 years. This longevity grants them a perspective on the world that shorter-lived races such as humans and halflings lack. Dwarves are solid and enduring like the mountains they love, weathering the passage of centuries with stoic endurance and little change. They respect the traditions of their clans, tracing their ancestry back to the founding of their most ancient strongholds in the youth of the world and don't abandon those traditions lightly. Part of those traditions is devotion to the gods of the dwarves who uphold the dwarven ideals of industrious labor, skill in battle, and devotion to the forge. Individual dwarves are determined and loyal, true to their word and decisive in action, sometimes to the point of stubbornness. Many dwarves have a strong sense of justice and they are slow to forget wrongs they have suffered. A wrong done to one dwarf is a wrong done to the dwarf's entire clan, so what begins as one dwarf's hunt for vengeance can become a full-blown clan feud. Clans and Kingdoms 
Dwarven kingdoms stretch deep beneath the mountains where the dwarves mine gems and precious metals and forge items of wonder. They love the beauty and artistry of precious metals and fine jewelry and in some dwarves this love festers into avarice. Whatever wealth they can't find in their mountains, they gain through trade. They dislike boats, so enterprising humans and halflings frequently handle trade in dwarven goods along water routes. Trustworthy members of other races are welcome in dwarf settlements, though some areas are off-limits even to them. The chief unit of dwarven society is the clan, and dwarves highly value social standing. Even dwarves' identities and affiliations recognize related dwarves and invoke their ancestors' names in oaths and curses. To be clanless is the worst fate that can befall a dwarf. Dwarves in other lands are typically artisans, especially weaponsmiths, armorers, and jewelers. Some become mercenaries or bodyguards highly sought after for their courage and loyalty. Gods, gold, and clan. Dwarves who take up the adventuring life might be motivated by a desire for treasure, for its own sake, for a specific purpose, or even out of an altruistic desire to help others. Other dwarves are driven by the command or inspiration of a deity, a direct calling, or simply a desire to bring glory to one of the dwarf gods. Clan and ancestry are also important motivators. A dwarf might seek to restore a clan's lost honor, avenge an ancient wrong the clan suffered, or earn a new place within the clan after having been exiled. Or a dwarf might search for the axe wielded by a mighty ancestor lost on the field of battle centuries ago. Slow to trust. Dwarves get along passably well with most other races. The difference between an acquaintance and a friend is about a hundred years is a dwarf saying that might be hyperbole but certainly points to how difficult it can be for a member of a short-lived race like humans to earn a dwarf's trust. Elves? It's not wise to depend on the elves. No telling what an elf will do next, when the hammer meets the orc's head, they're as apt to start singing as to pull out a sword. They're flighty and frivolous. Two things to be said for them, though, they don't have many smiths, but the ones they have do very fine work. And when orcs or goblins come streaming down out of the mountains, an elf's good to have at your back. Not as good as a dwarf, maybe, but no doubt they hate the orcs as much as we do. Halflings. Sure, they're pleasant folk. But show me a halfling hero. An empire, a triumphant army. Even a treasure for the ages made by halfling hands. Nothing. How can you take them seriously? Humans. You take the time to get to know a human, and by then the human's on her deathbed. If you're lucky, she's got kin, a daughter, or granddaughter, maybe, who's got hands and heart as good as hers. That's when you can make a human friend. And watch them go. They set their hearts on something, they'll get it, whether it's a dragon's hoard or an empire's throne. You have to admire that kind of dedication, even if it gets them in trouble more often than not. Dwarf Names A dwarf's name is granted by a clan elder, in accordance with tradition. Every proper dwarven name has been used and reused down through the generations. A dwarf's name belongs to the clan, not to the individual. A dwarf who misuses or brings shame to a clan name is stripped of the name and forbidden by law to use any dwarven name in its place. Dwarf Traits Your dwarf character has an assortment of inborn abilities, part and parcel of dwarven nature. Ability Score Increase Your constitution score increases by 2. Age Dwarves mature at the same rate as humans, but they're considered young until they reach the age of 50. On average, they live about 350 years. Alignment. Most dwarves are lawful, believing firmly in the benefits of a well-ordered society. They tend toward good as well, with a strong sense of fair play and a belief that everyone deserves to share in the benefits of a just order. Size. Dwarves stand between 4 and 5 feet tall and average about 150 pounds. Your size is medium. Darkvision. Accustomed to life underground, you have superior vision in dark and dim conditions. You can see in dim light within 60 feet of you as if it were bright light and in darkness as if it were dim light. You can't discern color in darkness, only shades of gray. Dwarven Resilience You have advantage on saving throws against poison and you have resistance against poison damage, explained in Chapter 9, Combat. Dwarven Combat Training You have proficiency with the battle axe, hand axe, light hammer, and warhammer. Tool Proficiency you gain proficiency with the artisan's tools of your choice, smith's tools, brewer's supplies, or mason's tools. Stoke cunning. Whenever you make an intelligence history, check related to the origin of stonework, you are considered proficient in the history skill and add double your proficiency bonus to the check instead of your normal proficiency bonus. Languages. You can speak, read, and write common and dwarvish. Dwarvish is full of hard consonants and guttural sounds and those characteristics spill over into whatever other language a dwarf might speak. 
Subrace. Two main subraces of dwarves populate the worlds of D&D, hill dwarves and mountain dwarves. Choose one of these subraces. Hill dwarf as a hill dwarf, you have keen senses, deep intuition, and remarkable resilience. The gold dwarves of Fairain in their mighty southern kingdom are hill dwarves, as are the exiled Nidar and the debased Klar of Kryn in the Dragonlance setting. Ability score increase. Your wisdom score increases by one. Dwarven toughness. Your hit point maximum increases by one, and it increases by one every time you gain a level. Mountain dwarf as a mountain dwarf, you're strong and hardy, accustomed to a difficult life in rugged terrain. You're probably on the tall side for a dwarf and tend toward lighter coloration. The shield dwarves of Northern Fairton, as well as the ruling Hyler clan and the noble Daywar clan of Dragonlance, are mountain dwarves. Ability score increase. Your strength score increases by two. Dwarven armor training. You have proficiency with light and medium armor. Duergar. In cities deep in the Underdark live the Duergar, or Grey Three Dwarves. These vicious, stealthy slave traders raid the surface world for captives, then sell their prey to the other races of equals M the Underdark. They have innate magical abilities to become invisible and to temporarily grow to giant size. Elf. I have never imagined such beauty existed, Goldmoon said softly. The day's march had been difficult, but the reward at the end was beyond their dreams. The companions stood on a high cliff over the fabled city of Qualinast. For slender spires rose from the city's corners like glistening spindles, their brilliant white stone marbled with shining silver. Graceful arches, swooping from spire to spire, soared through the air. Crafted by ancient dwarven metalsmiths, they were strong enough to hold the weight of an army, yet they appeared so delicate that a bird lighting on them might overthrow the balance. These glistening arches were the city's only boundaries. There was no wall around Qualinast. The elven city opened its arms lovingly to the wilderness. Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, dragons of autumn twilight. Elves are a magical people of otherworldly grace, living in the world but not entirely part of it. They live in places of ethereal beauty in the midst of ancient forests or in silvery spires glittering with fairy light, where soft music drifts through the air and gentle fragrances waft on the breeze. Elves love nature and magic, art and artistry, music and poetry, and the good things of the world. Slender and graceful. With their unearthly grace and fine features, elves appear hauntingly beautiful to humans and members of many other races. They are slightly shorter than humans on average, ranging from well under five feet tall to just over six feet. They are more slender than humans, weighing only 100 to 145 pounds. Males and females are about the same height, and males are only marginally heavier than females. Elves' coloration encompasses the normal human range and also includes skin in shades of copper, bronze, and almost bluish-white, hair of green or blue, and eyes like pools of liquid gold or silver, elves have no facial and little body hair. They favor elegant clothing in bright colors and they enjoy simple yet lovely jewelry. A timeless perspective. Elves can live well over 700 years, giving them a broad perspective on events that might trouble the shorter-lived races more deeply. They are more often amused than excited and more likely to be curious than greedy. They tend to remain aloof and unfazed by petty happenstance. When pursuing a goal, however, whether adventuring on a mission or learning a new skill or art, elves can be focused and relentless. They are slow to make friends and enemies and even slower to forget them. They reply to petty insults with disdain and to serious insults with vengeance. Like the branches of a young tree, elves are flexible in the face of danger. They trust in diplomacy and compromise to resolve differences before they escalate to violence. They have been known to retreat from intrusions into their woodland homes, confident that they can simply wait the invaders out. But when the need arises, elves reveal a stern martial side, demonstrating skill with sword, bow, and strategy. Hidden Woodland Realms Most elves dwell in small forest villages hidden among the trees. Elves hunt game, gather food, and grow vegetables, and their skill and magic allow them to support themselves without the need for clearing and plowing land. They are talented artisans, crafting finely worked clothes and art objects. Their contact with outsiders is usually limited, though a few elves make a good living by trading crafted items for metals, which they have no interest in mining. Elves encountered outside their own lands are commonly traveling minstrels, artists, or sages. Human nobles compete for the services of elf instructors to teach sword play or magic to their children. Exploration and Adventure Elves take up adventuring out of wanderlust. Since they are so long-lived, they can enjoy centuries of exploration and discovery. 
They dislike the pace of human society, which is regimented from day to day but constantly changing over decades, so they find careers that let them travel freely and set their own pace. Elves also enjoy exercising their martial prowess or gaining greater magical power, and adventuring allows them to do so. Some might join with rebels fighting against oppression, and others might become champions of moral causes. Elf Names Elves are considered children until they declare themselves adults, sometime after the hundredth birthday, and before this period they are called by child names. On declaring adulthood, an elf selects an adult name, although those who knew him or her as a youngster might continue to use the child name. Each elf's adult name is a unique creation, though it might reflect the names of respected individuals or other family members. Little distinction exists between male names and female names. The groupings here reflect only general tendencies. In addition, every elf bears a family name, typically a combination of other elvish words. Some elves traveling among humans translate their family names into common, but others retain the elvish version. Haughty but gracious. Although they can be haughty, elves are generally gracious even to those who fall short of their high expectations, which is most non-elves. Still, they can find good in just about anyone. Dwarves. Dwarves are dull, clumsy elves. But what they lack in humor, sophistication, and manners, they make up in valor. And must admit, their best smiths produce art that approaches elven quality. Halflings. Halflings are people of simple pleasures, and that is not a quality to scorn. They're good folk, they care underscore for each other and tend their gardens, and they have proven underscore themselves tougher than they seem when the need arises. Humans. All that haste, their ambition and drive to underscore accomplish something before their brief lives pass away, human endeavors seem so futile sometimes. But then you look at what they have accomplished and you have to underscore appreciate their achievements. If only they could slow down and learn some refinement. Elf Traits Your elf character has a variety of natural abilities, the result of thousands of years of elven refinement. Ability Score Increase Your dexterity score increases by 2. Age Although elves reach physical maturity at about the same age as humans, the elven understanding of adulthood goes beyond physical growth to encompass worldly experience. An elf typically claims adulthood and an adult name around the age of 100 and can live to be 750 years old. Alignment Elves love freedom, variety, and self-expression, so they lean strongly toward the gentler aspects of chaos. They value and protect others' freedom as well as their own, and they are more often good than not. The drow are an exception, their exile into the Underdark has made them vicious and dangerous. Drow are more often evil than not. Size Elves range from under 5 to over 6 feet tall and have slender builds. Your size is medium. Speed Your base walking speed is 30 feet. Darkvision Accustomed to twilight forests and the night sky, you have superior vision in dark and dim conditions. You can see in dim light within 60 feet of you as if it AE were bright light and in darkness as if it were dim light. You can't discern color in darkness, only shades of gray. Keen senses. You have proficiency in the perception skill. Fey ancestry. You have advantage on saving throws against being charmed and magic can't put you to sleep. Trance. Elves don't need to sleep. Instead, they meditate deeply, remaining semi-conscious for four hours a day. The common word for such meditation is trance. While meditating, you can dream after a fashion. Such dreams are actually mental exercises that have become reflexive through years of practice. After resting in this way, you gain the same benefit that a human does from eight hours of sleep. Languages. You can speak, read, and write common and elvish. Elvish is fluid with subtle intonations and intricate grammar. Elven literature is rich and varied, and their songs and poems are famous among other races. Many bards learn their language so they can add elvish ballads to their repertoires. Subrace. Ancient divides among the elven people resulted in three main subraces, high elves, wood elves, and dark elves, who are commonly called drow. Choose one of these subraces. In some worlds, these subraces are divided still further, such as the sun elves and moon elves of the Forgotten Realms, so if you wish, you can choose a narrower subrace. High elf as a high elf, you have a keen mind and a mastery of at least the basics of magic. In many of the worlds of D&D, there are two kinds of High Elves. One type, which includes the Grey Elves and Valley Elves of Greyhawk, the Sylvanesti of Dragonlance, and the Sun Elves of the Forgotten Realms, is haughty and reclusive, believing themselves to be superior to non-elves and even other elves. The other type, including the High Elves of Greyhawk, the Qualanesti of Dragonlance, and the Moon Elves of the Forgotten Realms, are more common and more friendly and often encountered among humans and other races.
The Sun Elves of Fairton, also called Gold Elves or Sunrise Elves, have bronze skin and hair of copper, black, or golden blonde. Their eyes are golden, silver, or black. Moon Elves, also called Silver Elves or Gray Elves, are much paler, with alabaster skin sometimes tinged with blue. They often have hair of silver white, black, or blue, but various shades of blonde, brown, and red are not uncommon. Their eyes are blue or green and flecked with gold. Ability Score Increase Your intelligence score increases by 1. Elf Weapon Training You have proficiency with the longsword, shortsword, shortbow, and longbow. Cantrip you know one cantrip of your choice from the wizard spell list. Intelligence is your spell casting ability for it. Extra language. You can speak, read, and write one extra language of your choice. Wood elf. As a wood elf, you have keen senses and intuition and your fleet feet carry you quickly and stealthily through your native forests. This category includes the wild elves Grugak of Greyhawk and the Kaganesti of Dragonlance, as well as the races called wood elves in Greyhawk and the Forgotten Realms. In Fairfin, wood elves also called wild elves, green elves, or forest elves are reclusive and distrusting of non-elves. Wood elves' skin tends to be copperish in hue, sometimes with traces of green. Their hair tends toward browns and blacks, but it is occasionally blonde or copper-colored. Their eyes are green, brown, or hazel. Ability score increase. Your wisdom score increases by one. Elf weapon training. You have proficiency with the longsword, shortsword, shortbow, and longbow. Mask of the Wild. You can attempt to hide even when you are only lightly obscured by foliage, heavy rain, falling snow, mist, and other natural phenomena. Dark Elf Drow Descended from an earlier subrace of elves, the drow were banished from the surface world for following the goddess Lolth down the path of evil. Now they have built their own civilization in the depths of the Underdark, patterned after the way of Lolth. Also called Dark Elves, the drow have skin that resembles charcoal or obsidian as well as stark white or pale yellow hair. They commonly have very pale eyes, so pale as to be mistaken for white, in shades of lilac, silver, pink, red, and blue. They tend to be smaller and thinner than most elves. Ability score increase. Your charisma score increases by one. Superior dark vision. Your dark vision has a radius of 120 feet. Sunlight sensitivity. You have disadvantage on attack rolls and on wisdom, perception, checks that rely on sight when you, the target of your attack, or whatever you are trying to perceive is in direct sunlight. Drow magic. You know the dancing lights cantrip. When you reach third level, you can cast the fairy fire spell once with this trait and regain the ability to do so when you finish a long rest. When you reach fifth level, you can cast the darkness spell once with this trait and regain the ability to do so when you finish a long rest. Charisma is your spell casting ability for these spells. Drow Weapon Training You have proficiency with rapiers, short swords, and hand crossbows. The Darkness of the Drow Were it not for one renowned exception, the race of Drow would be universally reviled. To most, they are a race of demon-worshipping marauders dwelling in the subterranean depths of the Underdark, emerging only on the blackest nights to pillage and slaughter the surface dwellers they despise. Their society is depraved and preoccupied with the favor of Lolth, their spider goddess who sanctions murder and the extermination of entire families as noble houses vie for position. Yet one drow at least broke the mold. In the world of the Forgotten Realms, Driz Duerden, Ranger of the North, has proven his quality as a good-hearted defender of the weak and innocent. Rejecting his heritage and adrift in a world that looks upon him with terror and loathing, Drizzt is a model for those few drow who follow in his footsteps, trying to find a life apart from the evil society of their underdark homes. Drow grow up believing that surface-dwelling races are re-inferior, worthless except as slaves. Drow who develop a conscience or find it necessary to cooperate with other races find it hard to overcome that prejudice, especially when they are so often on the receiving end of hatred. Halfling. Regis the halfling, the only one of his kind for hundreds of miles in any direction, locked his fingers behind his head and leaned back against the mossy blanket of the tree trunk. Regis was short, even by the standards of his diminutive race, with the fluff of his curly brown locks barely cresting the three-foot mark, but his belly was amply thickened by his love of a good meal or several as the opportunities presented themselves. The crooked stick that served as his fishing pole rose up above him, clenched between two of his toes, and hung out over the quiet lake, mirrored perfectly in the glassy surface of Mare Duel Don. R.A. Salvatore, the Crystal Shard. The comforts of home are the goals of most halflings' lives, a place to settle in peace and quiet, far from marauding monsters and clashing armies, a blazing fire and a generous meal, fine drink and fine conversation. 
Though some halflings live out their days in remote agricultural communities, others form nomadic bands that travel constantly, lured by the open road and the wide horizon to discover the wonders of new lands and peoples. But even these wanderers love peace, food, hearth, and home, The home might be a wagon jostling along a dirt road or a raft floating downriver. Small and practical. The diminutive halflings survive in a world full of larger creatures by avoiding notice or, barring that, avoiding offense. Standing about three feet tall, they appear relatively harmless and so have managed to survive for centuries in the shadow of empires and on the edges of wars and political strife. They are inclined to be stout, weighing between 40 and 45 pounds. Halfling skin ranges from tan to pale with a ruddy cast, and their hair is usually brown or sandy brown and wavy. They have brown or hazel eyes. Halfling men often sport long sideburns, but beards are rare among them and mustaches even more so. They like to wear simple, comfortable, and practical clothes, favoring bright colors. Halfling practicality extends beyond their clothing. They're concerned with basic needs and simple pleasures and have little use for ostentation. Even the wealthiest of halflings keep their treasures locked in a cellar rather than on display for all to see. They have a knack for finding the most straightforward solution to a problem and have little patience for dithering. Kind and curious. Halflings are an affable and cheerful people. They cherish the bonds of family and friendship as well as the comforts of hearth and home, harboring few dreams of gold or glory. Even adventurers among them usually venture into the world for reasons of community, friendship, wanderlust, or curiosity. They love discovering new things, even simple things such as an exotic food or an unfamiliar style of clothing. Blend into the crowd. Halflings are adept at fitting into a community of humans, dwarves, or elves making themselves valuable and welcome. The combination of their inherent stealth and their unassuming nature helps halflings to avoid unwanted attention. Halflings work readily with others and they are loyal to their friends, whether halfling or otherwise. They can display remarkable ferocity when their friends, families, or communities are threatened. Pastoral Pleasantries Most halflings live in small, peaceful communities with large farms and well-kept groves. They rarely build kingdoms of their own or even hold much land beyond their quiet shires. They typically don't recognize any sort of halfling nobility or royalty, instead looking to family elders to guide them. Families preserve their traditional ways despite the rise and fall of empires. Many halflings live among other races, where the halflings' hard work and loyal outlook offer them abundant rewards and creature comforts. Some halfling communities travel as a way of life, driving wagons or guiding boats from place to place and maintaining no permanent home. Affable and Positive Halflings try to get along with everyone else and are loath to make sweeping generalizations, especially negative ones. Dwarves. Dwarves make loyal friends and you can count on them to keep their word. But would it hurt them to smile once in a while? Elves. They're so beautiful. Their faces, their music, their grace and all. It's like they stepped out of a wonderful dream. But there's no telling what's going on behind their smiling faces, surely more than they ever let on. Humans. Humans are a lot like us, really. At least some of them are. Step out of the castles and keeps, go talk to the farmers and herders and you'll find good, solid folk. Not that there's anything wrong with the barons and soldiers, you have to admire their conviction. And by protecting their own lands, they protect us as well. Exploring Opportunities Halflings usually set out on the adventurer's path to defend their communities, support their friends, or explore a wide and wonder-filled world. For them, adventuring is less a career than an opportunity or sometimes a necessity. Halfling Names a halfling has a given name, a family name, and possibly a nickname. Family names are often nicknames that stuck so tenaciously they have been passed down through the generations. Halfling Traits Your halfling character has a number of traits in common with all other halflings. Ability Score Increase Your dexterity score increases by 2. Age A halfling reaches adulthood at the age of 20 and generally lives into the middle of his or her second century. Alignment Most halflings are lawful good. As a rule, they are good-hearted and kind, hate to see others in pain, and have no tolerance for oppression. They are also very orderly and traditional, leaning heavily on the support of their community and the comfort of their old ways. Size Halflings average about 3 feet tall and weigh about 40 pounds. Your size is small. Lucky When you roll a 1 on the d20 for an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you can re-roll the die and must use the new roll. Brave you have advantage on saving throws against being frightened. Halfling nimbleness. You can move through the space of any creature that is of a size larger than yours. Languages. You can speak, read, and write common and halfling. 
The halfling language isn't secret, but halflings are loath to share it with others. They write very little, so they don't have a rich body of literature. Their oral tradition, however, is very strong. Almost all halflings speak common to converse with the people in whose lands they dwell or through which they are traveling. Subrace. The two main kinds of halfling, lightfoot and stout, are more like closely related families than true subraces. Choose one of these subraces. Lightfoot. As a lightfoot halfling, you can easily hide from notice, even using other people as cover. You're inclined to be affable and get along well with others. In the Forgotten Realms, lightfoot halflings have spread the farthest and thus are the most common variety. Lightfoots are more prone to wanderlust than other halflings and often dwell alongside other races or take up a nomadic life. In the world of Greyhawk, these halflings are called hare feet or tall fellows. Ability score increase. Your charisma score increases by one. Naturally stealthy. You can attempt to hide even when you are obscured only by a creature that is at least one size larger than you. Stout. As a stout halfling, you're hardier than average and have some resistance to poison. Some say that stouts have dwarven blood. In the Forgotten Realms, these halflings are called strong hearts and they're most common in the South. Ability score increase. Your constitution score increases by one. Stout resilience. You have advantage on saving throws against poison and you have resistance against poison damage. Human. These were the stories of a restless people who long ago took to the seas and rivers in longboats, first to pillage and terrorize, then to settle. Yet there was an energy, a love of adventure, that sang from every page. Long into the night lyrial red, lighting candle after precious candle. She'd never given much thought to humans, but these stories fascinated her. In these yellowed pages were tales of bold heroes, strange and fierce animals, mighty primitive gods, and a magic that was part and fabric of that distant land. Elaine Cunningham, daughter of the drow. In the reckonings of most worlds, humans are the youngest of the common races, late to arrive on the world scene and short-lived in comparison to dwarves, elves, and dragons. Perhaps it is because of their shorter lives that they strive to achieve as much as they can in the years they are given. Or maybe they feel they have something to prove to the elder races, and that's why they build their mighty empires on the foundation of conquest and trade. Whatever drives them, humans are the innovators, the achievers, and the pioneers of the worlds. A broad spectrum. With their penchant for migration and conquest, humans are more physically diverse than other common races. There is no typical human. An individual can stand from 5 feet to a little over 6 feet tall and weigh from 125 to 250 pounds. Human skin shades range from nearly black to very pale, and hair colors from black to blonde, curly, kinky, or straight. Males might sport facial hair that is sparse or thick. A lot of humans have a dash of non-human blood, revealing hints of elf or or other lineages. Humans reach adulthood in their late teens and rarely live even a single century. Variety in all things. Humans are the most adaptable and ambitious people among the common races. They have widely varying tastes, morals, and customs in the many different lands where they have settled. When they settle, though, they stay, they build cities to last for the ages and great kingdoms that can persist for long centuries. An individual human might have a relatively short lifespan, but a human nation or culture preserves traditions with origins far beyond the reach of any single human's memory. They live fully in the present, making them well-suited to the adventuring life, but also plan for the future, striving to leave a lasting legacy. Individually and as a group, humans are adaptable opportunists, and they stay alert to changing political and social dynamics. Everyone's second best friends. Just as readily as they mix with each other, humans mingle with members of other races. They get along with almost everyone, though they might not be close to many. Humans serve as ambassadors, diplomats, magistrates, merchants, and functionaries of all kinds. Dwarves. They're stout folk, stalwart friends, and true to their word. Their greed for gold is their downfall, though. Elves. It's best not to wander into elven woods. They don't parents give their children names from other languages, like intruders, and you'll as likely be bewitched as peppered such as dwarvish or elvish pronounced more or less with arrows. Still, if an elf can get past that damned racial pride and actually treat you like an equal, you can learn a lot from them, correctly, but most parents give names that are linked. Halflings. It's hard to beat a meal in a halfling home as long as you don't crack your head on the ceiling good food and good stories in front of a nice, warm fire. If halflings had a shred of ambition, they might really amount to something. Lasting institutions. Where a single elf or dwarf might take on the responsibility of guarding a special location or a powerful secret, humans found sacred orders and institutions for such purposes. 
While dwarf clans and halfling elders pass on the ancient traditions to each new generations, human temples, governments, libraries, and codes of law fix their traditions in the bedrock of history. Humans dream of immortality, but except for those few who seek undeath or divine ascension to escape death's clutches, they achieve it by ensuring that they will be remembered when they are gone. Although some humans can be xenophobic, in general their societies are inclusive. Human lands welcome large numbers of non-humans compared to the proportion of humans who live in non-human lands. Exemplars of Ambition Humans who seek adventure are the most daring and ambitious members of a daring and ambitious race. They seek to earn glory in the eyes of their fellows by amassing power, wealth, and fame. More than other people, humans champion causes rather than territories or groups. Human names and ethnicities Having so much more variety than other cultures, humans as a whole have no typical names. Some human parents give their children names from other languages, such as Dwarvish or Elvish, but most parents give names that are linked to their region's culture or to the naming traditions of their ancestors. The material culture and physical characteristics of humans can change wildly from region to region. In the Forgotten Realms, for example, the clothing architecture, cuisine, music, and literature are different in the northwestern lands of the Silver Marches than in distant Turnish or Impilter to the east and even more distinctive in far-off character. Human physical characteristics, though, vary according to the ancient migrations of the earliest humans so that the humans of the Silver Marches have every possible variation of coloration and features. In the Forgotten Realms, nine human ethnic groups are widely recognized, though over a dozen others are found in more localized areas of Faron. These groups and the typical names of their members can be used as inspiration no matter which world your human is in. Kalashite Shorter and slighter in build than most other humans, Kalashites have dusky brown skin, hair, and eyes. They're found primarily in southwest Faran. Condathan. Condathans are slender, tawny-skinned folk with brown hair that ranges from almost blonde to almost black. Most are tall and have green or brown eyes, but these traits are hardly universal. Humans of Condathan descent dominate the central lands of Faran around the inner sea. Dameron. Found primarily in the northwest of Fairton, Damarans are of moderate height and build with skin hues ranging from tawny to fair. Their hair is usually brown or black and their eye color varies widely, though brown is most common. Eluskin. Eluskins are tall, fair-skinned folk with blue or steely gray eyes. Most have raven black hair, but those who inhabit the extreme northwest have blonde, red, or light brown hair. Mulan. Dominant in the eastern and southeastern shores of the inner sea, the Mulan are generally tall, slim, and amber-skinned with eyes of hazel or brown. Their hair ranges from black to dark brown, but in the lands where the Mulan are most prominent, nobles and many other Mulan shave off all their hair. Rashami. Most often found east of the inner sea and often underscore intermingled with the Mulan, Rashamis tend to be short, stout, and muscular. They usually have dusky skin, dark eyes, and thick black hair. Show. The Sho are the most numerous and powerful ethnic group in Karatu far to the east of Fairton. They are yellowish bronze in hue with black hair and dark eyes. Sho surnames are usually presented before the given name. Tetherian. Widespread along the entire Sword Coast at the western edge of Fairfin, Tetherians are of medium build and height with dusky skin that tends to grow fairer the farther north they dwell. Their hair and eye color varies widely, but brown hair and blue eyes are the most common. Tetherians primarily use Condathan names. Tarami. Native to the southern shore of the inner sea, the Tarami people are generally tall and muscular, with dark mahogany skin, curly black hair, and dark eyes. Human traits. It's hard to make generalizations about humans, but your human character has these traits. Ability score increase. Your ability scores each increase by one. Age. Humans reach adulthood in their late teens and live less than a century. Alignment. Humans tend toward no particular alignment. The best and the worst are found among them. Size. Humans vary widely in height and build from barely 5 feet to well over 6 feet tall. Regardless of your position in that range, your size is medium. Speed. Your base walking speed is 30 feet. Languages. You can speak, read, and write common and one extra language of your choice. Humans typically learn the languages of other peoples they deal with, including obscure dialects. They are fond of sprinkling their speech with words borrowed from other tongues or curses, elvish musical expressions, dwarvish military phrases, and so on. Variant Human Traits If your campaign uses the optional feat rules from Chapter 6, your dungeon master might allow these variant traits, all of which replace the human's ability score increase trait. Ability Score Increase 
Two different ability scores of your underscore choice increase by one. Skills. You gain proficiency in one skill of your choice. Feet you gain one feet of your choice. Dragaborn. Her father stood on the first of the three stairs that led down from the portal unmoving. The scales of his face had grown paler around the edges, but clanless Mehen still looked as if he could wrestle down a dire bear himself. His familiar well-worn armor was gone, replaced by violet-tinted scale armor with bright silvery tracings. There was a blazon on his arm as well, the mark of some foreign house. The sword at his back was the same, though the one he had carried since even before he had found the twins left in swaddling at the gates of Arush Vayim. For all her life, Farida had known that reading her father's face was a skill she'd been fortunate to learn. A human who couldn't spot the shift of her eyes or Havelers would certainly see only the indifference of a dragon in clanless Menon's face. But the shift of scales, the arch of a ridge, the set of his eyes, the gape of his teeth, her father's face spoke volumes. But every scale of it this time seemed completely still the indifference of a dragon even to Farida. Aaron M. Evans, the adversary. Born of dragons, as their name proclaims, the Dragaborn walk proudly through a world that greets them with fearful incomprehension. Shaped by draconic gods or the dragons themselves, Dragonborn originally hatched from dragon eggs as a unique race, combining the best attributes of dragons and humanoids. Some Dragonborn are faithful servants to true dragons, others form the ranks of soldiers in great wars, and still others find themselves adrift with no clear calling in life. Proud Dragonkin Dragonborn look very much like dragons standing erect in humanoid form, though they lack wings or a tail. The first Dragonborn had scales of vibrant hues matching the colors of their dragon kin, but generations of interbreeding have created a more uniform appearance. Their small, fine scales are usually brass or bronze in color, sometimes ranging to scarlet, rust, gold, or copper green. They are tall and strongly built, often standing close to 6% feet tall and weighing 300 pounds or more. Their hands and feet are strong, talon-like claws with three fingers and a thumb on each hand. The blood of a particular type of dragon runs very strong through some Dragonborn clans. These Dragonborn often boast scales that more closely match those of their dragon ancestor bright red, green, blue, or white, lustrous black, or gleaming metallic gold, silver, brass, copper, or bronze. Self-sufficient clans. To any Dragonborn, the clan is more important than life itself. Dragonborn owe their devotion and respect to their clan above ale else, even the gods. Each dragonborn's conduct reflects on the honor of his or her clan, and bringing dishonor to the clan can result in expulsion and exile. Each dragonborn knows his or her station and duties within the clan, and honor demands maintaining the bounds of that position. A continual drive for self-improvement reflects the self-sufficiency of the race as a whole. Dragonborn value skill and excellence in all endeavors. They hate to fail, and they push themselves to extreme efforts before they give up on something. A Dragonborn holds mastery of a particular skill as a lifetime goal. Members of other races who share the same commitment find it easy to earn the respect of a Dragonborn. Though all Dragonborn strive to be self-sufficient, they recognize that help is sometimes needed in difficult situations. But the best source for such help is the clan, and when a clan needs help, it turns to another Dragonborn clan before seeking aid from other races or even from the gods. Dragonborn Names Dragonborn have personal names given at birth, but they put their clan names first as a mark of honor. A childhood name or nickname is often used among clutchmates as a descriptive term or a term of endearment. The name might recall an event or center on a habit. Uncommon Races The Dragonborn and the rest of the races in this chapter are uncommon. They don't exist in every world of D&D and even where they are found, they are less widespread than dwarves, elves, halflings, and humans. In the cosmopolitan cities of the D&D multiverse, most people hardly look twice at members of even the most exotic races. But the small towns and villages that dot the countryside are different. The common folk aren't accustomed to seeing members of these races and they react accordingly. Dragaborn. It's easy to assume that a Dragaborn is a monster, especially if his or her scales betray a chromatic heritage. Unless the Dragonborn starts breathing fire and causing destruction, though, people are likely to respond with caution rather than outright fear. Gnome. Gnomes don't look like a threat and can quickly disarm suspicion with good humor. The common folk are often curious about gnomes, likely never having seen one before, but they are rarely hostile or fearful. Half-elf. Although many people have never seen a half-elf, virtually everyone knows they exist. 
A half-elf stranger's arrival is followed by gossip behind the half-elf's back and stolen glances across the common room rather than any confrontation or open curiosity. Half-orc. It's usually safe to assume that a half-orc is belligerent and quick to anger, so people watch themselves around an unfamiliar half-orc. Shopkeepers might surreptitiously hide valuable or fragile goods when a half-orc comes in, and people slowly clear out of a tavern, assuming a fight will break out soon. Tiefling. Half-orcs are greeted with a practical caution, but tieflings are the subject of supernatural fear. The evil of their heritage is plainly visible in their features, and as far as most people are concerned, a tiefling could very well be a devil straight from the Nine Hells. People might make warding signs as a tiefling approaches, cross the street to avoid passing near, or bar shop doors before a tiefling can enter. Dragoborn Traits Your draconic heritage manifests in a variety of traits you share with other dragonborn. Ability score increase. Your strength score increases by 2 and your charisma score increases by 1. Age. Young dragonborn grow quickly. They walk hours after hatching, attain the size and development of a 10-year-old human child by the age of 3 and reach adulthood by 15. They live to be around 80. Alignment. Dragonborn tend to extremes, making a conscious choice for one side or the other in the cosmic war between good and evil, represented by Bahamut and Tiamat, respectively. Most Dragonborn are good, but those who side with Tiamat can be terrible villains. Size Dragonborn are taller and heavier than humans, standing well over 6 feet tall and averaging almost 250 pounds. Your size is medium. Speed Your base walking speed is 30 feet. Draconians in the Dragonlance setting, the followers of the evil goddess Takesis learned a dark ritual that let them corrupt the eggs of metallic dragons, producing evil Dragonborn called Draconians. Five types of Draconians, corresponding to the five types of metallic dragons, fought for Takesis in the War of the Lance, Orax, Gold, Baz, Brass, Bozak, Bronze, Kapak, Copper, and Civic, Silver. In place of their Draconic breath weapons, they have unique magical abilities. Draconic Ancestry You have Draconic Ancestry. Choose one type of dragon from the Draconic Ancestry table. Your breath weapon and damage resistance are determined by the dragon type as shown in the table. Breath Weapon. You can use your action to exhale destructive energy. Your Draconic Ancestry determines the size, shape, and damage type of the exhalation. When you use your Breath Weapon, each creature in the area of the exhalation must make a saving throw, the type of which is determined by your Draconic Ancestry. The DC for the saving throw equals 8 plus your Constitution modifier plus your Proficiency bonus. A creature takes 2d6 damage on a failed save and half as much damage on a successful one. The damage increases to 3d6 at 6th level, 4d6 at 11th level, and 5d6 at 16th level. After you use your breath weapon, you can't use it again until you complete a short or long rest. Damage Resistance You have resistance to the damage type associated with your Draconic Ancestry. Languages You can speak, read, and write common and Draconic. Draconic is thought to be one of the oldest languages and is often used in the study of magic. The language sounds harsh to most other creatures and includes numerous hard consonants and sibilants. Gnome. Skinny and flaxen-haired, his skin walnut-brown and his eyes a startling turquoise, Virgil stood halge as tall as Aaron and had to climb up on a stool to look out the peephole. Like most habitations in Obel, that particular tenement had been built for humans and smaller residents coped with the resulting awkwardness as best they could but at least the relative largeness of the apartment gave Virgil room to pack in all his gnome-sized gear. The front room was his workshop and it contained a bewildering miscellany of tools, hammers, chisels, saws, lopics, tinted lenses, jeweler's loops, and jars of powdered and shredded ingredients for casting spells. A fat gray cat, the mage's familiar, lay curled atop a grimoire. It opened its eyes, gave Aaron a disdainful yellow stare, then appeared to go back to sleep. Richard Lee Byers, the Black Bouquet a constant hum of busy activity pervades the warrens and neighborhoods where gnomes form their close-knit communities. Louder sounds punctuate the hum, a crunch of grinding gears here, a minor explosion there, a yelp of surprise or triumph, and especially bursts of laughter. Gnomes take delight in life, enjoying every moment of invention, exploration, investigation, creation, and play. Vibrant expression. A gnome's energy and enthusiasm for living shines through every inch of his or her tiny body. Gnomes average slightly over 3 feet tall and weigh 40 to 45 pounds. Their tan or brown faces are usually adorned with broad smiles beneath their prodigious noses and their bright eyes shine with excitement. 
Their fair hair has a tendency to stick out in every direction as if expressing the gnome's insatiable interest in everything around. A gnome's personality is writ large in his or her appearance. A male gnome's beard, in contrast to his wild hair, is kept carefully trimmed but often styled into curious forks or neat points. A gnome's clothing, though usually made in modest earth tones, is elaborately decorated with embroidery, embossing, or gleaming jewels. Delighted Dedication As far as gnomes are concerned, being alive is a wonderful thing, and they squeeze every ounce of enjoyment out of their three to five centuries of life. Humans might wonder about getting bored over the course of such a long life, and elves take plenty of time to savor the beauties of the world in their long years, but gnomes seem to worry that even with all that time, they can't get in enough of the things they want to do and see. Gnomes speak as if they can't get the thoughts out of their heads fast enough. Even as they offer ideas and opinions on a range of subjects, they still manage to listen carefully to others adding the appropriate exclamations of surprise and appreciation along the way. Though gnomes love jokes of all kinds, particularly puns and pranks, they're just as dedicated to the more serious tasks they undertake. Many gnomes are skilled engineers, alchemists, tinkers, and inventors. They're willing to make mistakes and laugh at themselves in the process of perfecting what they do, taking bold, sometimes foolhardy, risks and dreaming large. Bright burrows. Gnomes make their homes in hilly wooded lands. They live underground but get more fresh air than dwarves do, enjoying the natural living world on the surface whenever they can. Their homes are well hidden by both clever construction and simple illusions. Welcome visitors are quickly ushered into the bright, warm burrows. Those who are not welcome are unlikely to find the burrows in the first place. Gnomes who settle in human lands are commonly gem cutters, engineers, sages, or tinkers. Some human families retain gnome tutors, ensuring that their pupils enjoy a mix of serious learning and delighted enjoyment. A gnome might tutor several generations of a single human family over the course of his or her long life. Gnome Names Gnomes love names and most have half a dozen or so. A gnome's mother, father, clan elder, aunts, and uncles each give the gnome a name and various nicknames from just about everyone else might or might not stick over time. Gnome names are typically variants on the names of ancestors or distant relatives, though some are purely new inventions. When dealing with humans and others who are stuffy about names, a gnome learns to use no more than three names, a personal name, a clan name, and a nickname, choosing the one in each category that's the most fun to say. Deep Gnomes A third subrace of gnomes, the Deep Gnomes, or Sferfneblin, live in small communities scattered in the Underdark. Unlike the Duergar and the Drow, Sferfneblin are as good as their surface cousins. However, their humor and enthusiasm are dampened by their oppressive environment and their inventive expertise is directed mostly toward stonework. Seeing the world. Curious and impulsive, gnomes might take up adventuring as a way to see the world or for the love of exploring. As lovers of gems and other fine items, some gnomes take to adventuring as a quick, if dangerous, path to wealth. Regardless of what spurs them to adventure, gnomes who adopt this way of life eke as much enjoyment out of it as they do out of any other activity they undertake, sometimes to the great annoyance of their adventuring companions. Gnome Traits Your gnome character has certain characteristics in common with all other gnomes. Ability Score Increase Your intelligence score increases by 2. Age Gnomes mature at the same rate humans do and most are expected to settle down into an adult life by around age 40. They can live 350 to almost 500 years. Alignment. Gnomes are most often good. Those who tend toward law are sages, engineers, researchers, scholars, investigators, or inventors. Those who tend toward chaos are minstrels, tricksters, wanderers, or fanciful jewelers. Gnomes are good-hearted and even the tricksters among them are more playful than vicious. Size. Gnomes are between 3 and asterisk 4. Feet tall and average about 40 pounds. Your size is small. Speed. Your base walking speed is 25 feet. Dark vision. Accustomed to life underground, you have superior vision in dark and dim conditions. You can see in dim light within 60 feet of you as if it were bright light and in darkness as if it were dim light. You can't discern color in darkness, only shades of gray. Gnome cunning. You have advantage on all intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws against magic. Languages. You can speak, read, and write common and gnomish. The Gnomish language, which uses the Dwarvish script, is renowned for its technical treatises and its catalogs of knowledge about the natural world. Subrace Two subraces of gnomes are found among the worlds of D&D, forest gnomes, and rock gnomes. Choose one of these subraces. Always appreciative. 
it's rare for a gnome to be hostile or malicious unless he or she has suffered a grievous injury. Gnomes know that most races don't share their sense of humor, but they enjoy anyone's company just as they enjoy everything else they set out to do. Forest Gnome As a forest gnome, you have a natural knack for illusion and inherent quickness and stealth. In the worlds of D&D, forest gnomes are rare and secretive. They gather in hidden communities in sylvan forests, using illusions and trickery to conceal themselves from threats or to mask their escape should they be detected. Forest gnomes tend to be friendly with other good-spirited woodland folk, and they regard elves and good fae as their most important allies. These gnomes also befriend small forest animals and rely on them for information about threats that might prowl their lands. Ability score increase. Your dexterity score increases by one. Natural illusionist. You know the minor illusion cantrip. Intelligence is your spellcasting ability for it. Speak with small beasts. Through sounds and gestures, you can communicate simple ideas with small or smaller beasts. Forest gnomes love animals and often keep squirrels, badgers, rabbits, moles, woodpeckers, and other creatures as beloved pets. Rock gnome is a rock gnome. You have a natural inventiveness and underscore hardiness beyond that of other gnomes. Most gnomes in the worlds of D&D are rock gnomes, including the Tinker Gnomes of the Dragonlance setting. Ability score increase. Your constitution score increases by one. Artificer's lore. Whenever you make an intelligence, history, check related to magic items, alchemical objects, or technological devices, you can add twice your proficiency bonus instead of any proficiency bonus you normally apply. Tinker. You have proficiency with artisan's tools, Tinker's tools. Using those tools, you can spend 1 hour and 10 GP worth of materials to construct a tiny clockwork device, AC5, 1 horsepower. The device ceases to function after 24 hours unless you spend 1 hour repairing it to keep the device functioning, or when you use your action to dismantle it, at that time you can reclaim the materials used to create it. You can have up to 3 such devices active at a time. When you create a device, choose one of the following options. Clockwork Toy this toy is a clockwork animal, monster, or person, such as a frog, mouse, bird, dragon, or soldier. When placed on the ground, the toy moves five feet across the ground on each of your turns in a random direction. It makes noises as appropriate to the creature it represents. Firestarter. The device produces a miniature flame, which you can use to light a candle, torch, or campfire. Using the device requires your action. Music Box. When opened, this music box plays a single song at a moderate volume. The box stops playing when it reaches the song's end or when it is closed. Half-Elf Flint squinted into the setting sun. He thought he saw the figure of a man striding up the path. Standing, Flint drew back into the shadow of a tall pine to see better. The man's walk was marked by an easy grace, an elvish grace, Flint would have said, yet the man's body had the thickness and tight muscles of a human while the facial hair was definitely humankind's. All the dwarf could see of the man's face beneath the green hood was tan skin and a brownish-red beard. A longbow was slung over one shoulder and a sword hung at his left side. He was dressed in soft leather, carefully tooled in the intricate designs the elves loved. But no elf in the world of Kryn could grow a beard. No elf but... Tannis, said Flint hesitantly as the man neared. The same. The newcomer's bearded face split in a wide grin. He held open his arms and, before the dwarf could stop him, engulfed Flint in a hug that lifted him off the ground. The dwarf clasped his old friend close for a brief instant, then, remembering his dignity, squirmed and freed himself from the half-elf's embrace. Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, Dragons of Autumn Twilight Walking in two worlds but truly belonging to neither, half-elves combine what some say are the best qualities of their elf and human parents, human curiosity, inventiveness, and ambition tempered by the refined senses, love of nature, and artistic tastes of the elves. Some half-elves live among humans, set apart by their emotional and physical differences, watching friends and loved ones age while time barely touches them. Others live with the elves, growing restless as they reach adulthood in the timeless elven realms while their peers continue to live as children. Many half-elves, unable to fit into either society, choose lives of solitary wandering or join with other misfits and outcasts in the adventuring life. Of two worlds, to humans, half-elves look like elves and to elves, they look human. In height, they're on par with both parents, though they're neither as slender as elves nor as broad as humans. They range from under 5 feet to about 6 feet tall and from 100 to 180 pounds, with men only slightly taller and heavier than women. Half-elf men do have facial hair and sometimes grow beards to mask their elven ancestry.
Half-elven coloration and features lie somewhere between their human and elf parents and thus show a variety even more pronounced than that found among either race. They tend to have the eyes of their elven parents, diplomats or wanderers. Half-elves have no lands of their own, though they were welcome in human cities and somewhat less welcome in elven forests. In large cities in regions where elves and humans interact often, half-elves are sometimes numerous enough to form small communities of their own. They enjoy the company of other half-elves, the only people who truly understand what it is to live between these two worlds. In most parts of the world, though, half-elves are uncommon enough that one might live for years without meeting another. Some half-elves prefer to avoid company altogether, wandering the wilds as trappers, foresters, hunters, or adventurers and visiting civilization only rarely. Like elves, they are driven by the wanderlust that comes of their longevity. Others, in contrast, throw themselves into the thick of society, putting their charisma and social skills to great use in diplomatic roles or as swindlers. Half-elf names. Your half-elf character has some qualities in common with elves and some that are unique to half-elves. Ability score increase. Your charisma score increases by two and two other ability scores of your choice increase by one. Age. Half-elves mature at the same rate humans do and reach adulthood around the age of 20. They underscore live much longer than humans, however, often exceeding 180 years. Alignment. Half-elves share the chaotic bent of their underscore elven heritage. They value both personal freedom and creative expression, demonstrating neither love of leaders nor desire for followers. They chafe at rules, resent others' demands, and sometimes prove unreliable or at least unpredictable. Size. Half-elves are about the same size as humans, ranging from 5 to 6 feet tall. Your size is medium. Speed. Your base walking speed is 30 feet. Dark vision. Thanks to your elf blood, you have superior vision in dark and dim conditions. You can see in dim light within 60 feet of you as if it were bright light and in darkness as if it were dim light. You can't discern color in darkness, only shades of gray. Fey Ancestry You have advantage on saving throws against being charmed, and magic can't put you to sleep. Skill Versatility You gain proficiency in two skills of your choice. Languages You can speak, read, and write common, elvish, and one extra language of your choice. Excellent Ambassadors As a race, they have elven grace without elven aloofness and human energy without human burrishness. They often make excellent ambassadors and go-betweens except between elves and humans since each side suspects the half-elf of favoring the other. Half-orc The warchief Murn roused himself from his sleeping furs and his women and pulled a short hauberk of heavy steel rings over his thick, well-muscled torso. He usually rose before most of his warriors since he had a strong streak of human blood in him and he found the daylight less bothersome than most of his tribe did. Among the bloody skulls, a warrior was judged by his strength, his fierceness, and his wits. Human ancestry was no blemish against a warrior, provided he was every bit as strong, enduring, and bloodthirsty as his full-blooded kin. Half-orcs who were weaker than their orc comrades didn't last long among the skulls or any other orc tribe for that matter. But had a bit of human blood gave a warrior just the right mix of cunning, ambition, and elf discipline to go far eye as Myrn had. He was master of a tribe that could muster 2,000 spears and the strongest chief in there. Richard Baker, Swordmitch? Whether united under the leadership of a mighty warlock or having fought to a standstill after years of conflict, orc and human tribes sometimes form alliances, joining forces into a larger horde to the terror of civilized lands nearby. When these alliances are sealed by marriages, half-orcs are born. Some half oars rise to become proud chiefs of orc tribes, their human blood giving them an edge over their full-blooded orc rivals. Some venture into the world to prove their worth among humans and other more civilized races. Many of these become adventurers, achieving greatness for their mighty deeds and notoriety for their barbaric customs and savage fury. Scarred and strong. Half orcs' grayish pigmentation, sloping foreheads, jutting jaws, prominent teeth, and towering builds make their orcish heritage plain for all to see. Hayforks stand between 5 and 7 feet tall and usually weigh between 180 and 250 pounds. Orcs regard battle scars as tokens of pride and ornamental scars as things of beauty. Other scars, though, mark an orc or half-orc as a former slave or a disgraced exile. Any half-orc who has lived among or near orcs has scars, whether they are marks of humiliation or of pride, recounting their past exploits and injuries. Such a half-orc living among humans might display these scars proudly or hide them in shame. The Mark of Grumsh 
The one-eyed god Grimsh created the orcs, and even those orcs who turn away from his worship can't fully escape his influence. The same is true of half-orcs, though their human blood moderates the impact of their orcish heritage. Some half-orcs hear the whispers of Grimsh in their dreams, calling them to unleash the rage that simmers within them. Others feel Grimsh's exultation when they join in melee combat and either exult along with him or shiver with fear and loathing. How forces are not evil by nature, but evil does lurk within them, whether they embrace it or rebel against it. Beyond the rage of Grimsh, half-orcs feel emotion powerfully. Rage doesn't just quicken their pulse, it makes their bodies burn. An insult stings like acid and sadness saps their strength. But they laugh loudly and heartily, and simple bodily pleasures, feasting, drinking, wrestling, drumming, and wild dancing fill their hearts with joy. They tend to be short-tempered and sometimes sullen, more inclined to action than contemplation and to fighting than arguing. The most accomplished half-orcs are those with enough self-control to get by in a civilized land. Tribes and Slums Half-orcs most often live among orcs. Of the other races, humans are most likely to accept half-orcs, and half-orcs almost always live in human lands when not living among orc tribes. Whether proving themselves among rough barbarian tribes or scrabbling to survive in the slums of larger cities, half-orcs get by on their physical might, their endurance, and the sheer determination they inherit from their human ancestry. Half-orc names Half-ors usually have names appropriate to the culture in which they were raised. A half-orc who wants to fit in among humans might trade an orc name for a human name. Some half-orcs with human names decide to adopt a guttural orc name because they think it makes them more intimidating. Grudging acceptance. Each half-orc finds a way to gain acceptance from those who hate orcs. Some are reserved, trying not to draw attention to themselves. A few demonstrate piety and good-heartedness as publicly as they can, whether or not such demonstrations are genuine. And some simply try to be so tough that others just avoid them. Half-orc traits. Ability score increase. Your strength score increases by two and your constitution score increases by one. Age. Half-orcs mature a little faster than humans, reaching adulthood around age 14. They age noticeably faster and rarely live longer than 75 years. Alignment. Half-orcs inherit a tendency toward chaos from their orc parents and are not strongly inclined toward good. Half-orcs raised among orcs and willing to live out their lives among them are usually evil. Size. Half-orcs are somewhat larger and bulkier than humans and they range from 5 to well over 6 feet tall. Your size is medium. Speed. Your base walking speed is 30 feet. Dark vision. Thanks to your orc blood, you have superior vision in dark and dim conditions. You can see in dim light within 60 feet of you as if it were bright light and in darkness as if it were dim light. You can't discern color in darkness, only shades of gray. Menacing. You gain proficiency in the intimidation skill. Relentless endurance. When you are reduced to zero hit points but not killed outright, you can drop to one hit point instead. You can't use this feature again until you finish a long rest. Savage attacks. When you score a critical hit with a melee weapon attack, you can roll one of the weapon's damage dice one additional time and add it to the extra damage of the critical hit. Languages. You can speak, read, and write common in Orc. Orc is a harsh, grating language with hard consonants. It has no script of its own but is written in the Dwarvish script. Tiefling. But you doc the way people look at you, devil's child. Those black eyes, cold as a winter storm, were staring right into her heart and the sudden seriousness in his voice jolted her. What is it they say? He asked. One's a curiosity, two's a conspiracy, eh? Three's a curse, she finished. You think I haven't heard that rubbish before? I know you have. When she glared at him, he added, it's not as if I'm plumbing the depths of your mind, dear girl. That is the burden of every tiefling. Some break under it, some make it the millstone around their neck, some that wicked glint in his eyes. You fight it, don't you? Like a little wildcat, I wager. Every little jab and comment just sharpens your claws. Aaron M. Evans, Brimstone Angels. To be greeted with stares and whispers, to suffer violence and insult on the street, to see mistrust and fear in every eye, this is the lot of the tiefling. And to twist the knife, tieflings know that this is because a pact struck generations ago infused the essence of Asmodeus, overlord of the nine hells, into their bloodline. Their appearance and their nature are not their fault but the result of an ancient sin for which they and their children and their children's children will always be held accountable. Infernal Bloodline Tieflings are derived from human bloodlines and in the broadest possible sense they still look human. However, their infernal heritage has left a clear imprint on their appearance. 
Tieflings have large horns that take any of a variety of shapes. Some have curling horns like a ram, others have straight and tall horns like a gazelle's, and some spiral upward like an antelope's horns. They have thick tails, four to five feet long, which lash or coil around their legs when they get upset or nervous. Their canine teeth are sharply pointed and their eyes are solid colors, black, red, white, silver, or gold, with no visible scara or pupil. Their skin tones cover the full range of human coloration but also include various shades of red. Their hair, cascading down from behind their horns, is usually dark, from black or brown to dark red, blue, or purple. Self-reliant and suspicious. Tieflings subsist in small minorities found mostly in human cities or towns, often in the roughest quarters of those places where they grow up to be swindlers, thieves, or crime lords. Sometimes they live among other minority populations in enclaves where they are treated with more respect. Lacking a homeland, tieflings know that they have to make their own way in the world and that they have to be strong to survive. They are not quick to trust anyone who claims to be a friend, but when a tiefling's companions demonstrate that they trust him or her, the tiefling learns to extend the same trust to them. And once a tiefling gives someone loyalty, the tiefling is a firm friend or ally for life. Tiefling Names Tiefling names fall into three broad categories. Tieflings born into another culture typically have names reflective of that culture. Some have names derived from the infernal language passed down through generations that reflect their fiendish heritage. And some younger tieflings, striving to find a place in the world, adopt a name that signifies a virtue or other concept and then try to embody that concept. For some, the chosen name is a noble quest. For others, it's a grim destiny. Mutual mistrust. People tend to be suspicious of tieflings, assuming that too, and morality, not just their appearance. Shopkeepers keep a close eye on their goods when tieflings enter their stores. The town watch might follow a tiefling around for a while, and demagogues blame tieflings for strange happenings. The reality, though, is that a tiefling's bloodline doesn't affect his or her personality to any great degree. Years of dealing with mistrust does leave its mark on most tieflings, and they respond to it in different ways. Some choose to live up to the wicked stereotype, but others are virtuous. Most are simply very aware of how people respond to them. After dealing with this mistrust throughout youth, a tiefling often develops the ability to overcome prejudice through charm or intimidation. Tiefling Traits Tieflings share certain racial traits as a result of their infernal descent. Ability score increase. Your intelligence score increases by one and your charisma score increases by two. Age. Tieflings mature at the same rate as humans but live a few years longer. Alignment. Tieflings might not have an innate tendency toward evil, but many of them end up there. Evil or not, an independent nature inclines many tieflings toward a chaotic alignment. Size. Tieflings are about the same size and build as humans. Your size is medium. Speed. Your base walking speed is 30 feet. Darkvision. Thanks to your infernal heritage, you have superior vision in dark and dim conditions. You can see in dim light within 60 feet of you as if it were bright light and in darkness as if it were dim light. You can't discern color in darkness, only shades of gray. Hellish resistance. You have resistance to fire damage. Infernal legacy. You know the thaumaturgy cantrip. When you reach third level, you can cast the Hellish Rebuke spell as a second level spell once with this trait and regain the ability to do so when you finish a long rest. When you reach fifth level, you can cast the Darkness spell once with this trait and regain the ability to do so when you finish a long rest. Charisma is your spell casting ability for these spells. Languages. You can speak, read, and write common and infernal. Chapter 3. Classes. Adventurers are extraordinary people driven by a thirst for excitement into a life that others would never dare lead. They are heroes compelled to explore the dark places of the world and take on the challenges that lesser women and men can't stand against. Class is the primary definition of what your character can do. It's more than a profession, it's your character's calling. Class shapes the way you think about the world and interact with it and your relationship with other people and powers in the multiverse. A fighter, for example, might view the world in pragmatic terms of strategy and maneuvering and see herself as just a pawn in a much larger game. A cleric, by contrast, might see himself as a willing servant in a god's unfolding plan or a conflict brewing among various deities. While the fighter has contacts in a mercenary company or army, the cleric might know a number of priests, paladins, and devotees who share his faith. Your class gives you a variety of special features such as a fighter's mastery of weapons and armor and a wizard's spells. 
At low levels, your class gives you only two or three features, but as you advance in level you gain more and your existing features often improve. Each class entry in this chapter includes a table summarizing the benefits you gain at every level and a detailed explanation of each one. Adventurers sometimes advance in more than one class. A rogue might switch direction in life and swear the oath of a paladin. A barbarian might discover latent magical ability and dabble in the sorcerer class while continuing to advance as a barbarian. Elves are known to combine martial mastery with magical training and advance as fighters and wizards simultaneously. Optional rules for combining classes in this way, called multiclassing, appear in Chapter 6. Twelve classes listed in the classes table are found in almost every D&D world and define the spectrum of typical adventurers. Barbarian. A tall human tribesman strides through a blizzard draped in fur and hefting his axe. He laughs as he charges toward the frost giant who dared poach his people's elk herd. A half or snarls at the latest challenger to her authority over their savage tribe ready to break his neck with her bare hands as she did to the last six rivals. Frothing at the mouth, a dwarf slams his helmet into the face of his drow foe then turns to drive his armored elbow into the gut of another. These barbarians, different as they might be, are defined by their rage, unbridled, unquenchable, and unthinking fury. More than a mere emotion, their anger is the ferocity of a cornered predator, the unrelenting assault of a storm, the churning turmoil of the sea. For some, their rage springs from a communion with fierce animal spirits. Others draw from a roiling reservoir of anger at a world full of pain. For every barbarian, rage is a power that fuels not just a battle frenzy but also uncanny reflexes, resilience, and feats of strength. Primal Instinct People of towns and cities take pride in how their civilized ways set them apart from animals as if denying one's own nature was a mark of superiority. To a barbarian, though, civilization is no virtue but a sign of weakness. The strong embrace their animal nature, keen instincts, primal physicality, and ferocious rage. Barbarians are uncomfortable when hedged in by walls and crowds. They thrive in the wilds of their homelands, the tundra, jungle, or grasslands where their tribes live and hunt. Barbarians come alive in the chaos of combat. They can enter a berserk state where rage takes over, giving them superhuman strength and resilience. A barbarian can draw on this reservoir of fury only a few times without resting, but those few rages are usually sufficient to defeat whatever threats arise. A life of danger. Not every member of the tribes deemed barbarians by science of civilized society has the barbarian class. A true barbarian among these people is as uncommon as a skilled fighter in a town and he or she plays a similar role as a protector of the people and a leader in times of war. Life in the wild places of the world is fraught with peril, rival tribes, deadly weather, and terrifying monsters. Barbarians charge headlong into that danger so that their people don't have to. Their courage in the face of danger makes barbarians perfectly suited for adventuring. Wandering is often a way of life for their native tribes and the rootless life of the adventurer is little hardship for a barbarian. Some barbarians miss the close-knit family structures of the tribe, but eventually find them replaced by the bonds formed among the members of their adventuring parties. Creating a Barbarian When creating a barbarian character, think about where a character comes from and his or her place in the world. Talk with your DM about an appropriate origin for our year barbarian. Did you come from a distant land, making you a stranger in the area of the campaign? Or is the campaign set in a rough and tumble frontier where barbarians are common? What led you to take up the adventuring life? Were you lured to settled lands by the promise of riches? Did you join forces with soldiers of those lands to face a shared threat? Did monsters or an invading horde drive you out of your homeland, making you a rootless refugee? Perhaps you were a prisoner of war, brought in chains to civilized lands and only now able to win your freedom. Or you might have been cast out from your people because of a crime you committed, a taboo you violated, or a coup that removed you from a position of authority. Quick build. You can make a barbarian quickly by following these suggestions. First, put your highest ability score in strength, followed by constitution. Second, choose the outlander background. Class features. As a barbarian, you gain the following class features. Hit points. Hit dice, 1d12 per barbarian level. Hit points at first level. 12 plus your constitution modifier. Hit points at high levels. 1d12 or 7 plus your constitution modifier per barbarian level after first. Proficiencies. Armor. Light armor, medium armor, shields. Weapons. Simple weapons, martial weapons. Tools, none. Saving throws, strength, constitution. 
Skills, choose two from animal handling, athletics, intimidation, nature, perception, and survival. Equipment. You start with the following equipment in addition to the equipment granted by your background. A great axe or B, any martial melee weapon, A, two hand axes or B, any simple weapon. An explorer's pack and four javelins. Rage. In battle, you fight with primal ferocity. On your turn, you can enter a rage as a bonus action. While raging, you gain the following benefits if you aren't wearing heavy armor. You have advantage on strength checks and strength saving throws. When you make a melee weapon attack using strength, you gain a bonus to the damage roll that increases as you gain levels as a barbarian as shown in the rage damage column of the barbarian table. You have resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. If you are able to cast spells, you can't cast them or concentrate on them while raging. Your rage lasts for one minute. It ends early if you are knocked unconscious or if your turn ends and you haven't attacked a hostile creature since your last turn or taken damage since then. You can also end your rage on your turn as a bonus action. Once you have raged the number of times shown for your barbarian level in the rages column of the barbarian table, you must finish a long rest before you can rage again. Unarmored Defense While you are not wearing any armor, your armor class equals 10 plus your dexterity modifier plus your constitution modifier. You can use a shield and still gain this benefit. Reckless Attack Starting at second level, you can throw aside all concern for defense to attack with fierce desperation. When you make your first attack on your turn, you can decide to attack recklessly. Doing so gives you advantage on melee weapon attack rolls using strength during this turn, but attack rolls against you have advantage until your next turn. Danger Sense at second level, you gain an uncanny sense of when things nearby aren't as they should be, giving you an edge when you dodge away from danger. You have advantage on dexterity saving throws against effects that you can see, such as traps and spells. To gain this benefit, you can't be blinded, deafened, or incapacitated. Primal Path At third level, you choose a path that shapes the nature of your rage. Choose the path of the Berserker or the path of the Totem Warrior, both detailed at the end of the class description. Your choice grants you features at 3rd level and again at 6th, 10th, and 14th levels. Ability Score Improvement When you reach 4th level and again at 8th, 12th, 16th, he and 19th level, you can increase 1 ability score of your choice by 2 or you can increase 2 ability scores of your choice by 1. As normal, you can't increase an ability score above 20 using this feature. Extra Attack Beginning at 5th level, you can attack twice, stead. Of once, whenever you take the attack action on your turn. Fast movement. Starting at 5th level, your peed increases 3 by 10 feet while you aren't wearing heavy armor. Feral instinct. By 7th level, your instincts are so honed that you have advantage on initiative rolls. Additionally, if you were surprised at the beginning of combat and aren't incapacitated, you can act normally on your first turn, but only if you enter your rage before doing anything else on that turn. Brutal critical. Beginning at 9th level, you can roll one additional weapon damage die when determining the extra damage for a critical hit with a melee attack. This increases to two additional dice at 13th level and three additional dice at 17th level. Relentless Rage Starting at 11th level, your rage can keep you fighting despite grievous wounds. If you drop to zero hit points while you're raging and don't die outright, you can make a DC 10 constitution saving throw. If you succeed, you drop to one hit point instead. Each time you use this feature after the first, the DC increases by 5. When you finish a short or long rest, the DC resets to 10. Persistent Rage Beginning at 15th level, your rage is so fierce that it ends early only if you fall unconscious or if you choose to end it. Indomitable Might Beginning at 18th level, if your total for a strength check is less than your strength score, you can use that score in place of the total. Primal Champion At 20th level, you embody the power of the wilds. Your strength and constitution scores increase by 4. Your maximum for those scores is now 24. Primal Paths Rage burns in every barbarian's heart, a furnace that drives him or her toward greatness. Different barbarians attribute their rage to different sources, however. For some, it is an internal reservoir where pain, grief, and anger are forged into a fury hard as steel. Others see it as a spiritual blessing, a gift of a totem animal. Path of the Berserker for some barbarians, rage is a means to an end, that end being violence. The path of the berserker is a path of untrammeled fury, slick with blood. As you enter the berserker's rage, you thrill in the chaos of battle, heedless of your own health or well-being. Frenzy Starting when you choose this path at third level, you can go into a frenzy when you rage. 
If you do so, for the duration of your rage you can make a single melee weapon attack as a bonus action on each of your turns after this one. When your rage ends, you suffer one level of exhaustion as described in Appendix A. Mindless Rage Beginning at 6th level, you can't be charmed or frightened while raging. If you are charmed or frightened when you enter your rage, the effect is suspended for the duration of the rage. Intimidating Presence Beginning at 10th level, you can use your action to frighten someone with your menacing presence. When you do so, choose one creature that you can see within 30 feet of you. If the creature can see or hear you, it must succeed on a wisdom saving throw DC equal to 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your charisma modifier or be frightened of you until the end of your next turn. On subsequent turns, you can use your action to extend the duration of this effect on the frightened creature until the end of your next turn. This effect ends if the creature ends its turn out of line of sight or more than 60 feet away from you. If the creature succeeds on its saving throw, you can't use this feature on that creature again for 24 hours. Retaliation Starting at 14th level, when you take damage from a creature that is within 5 feet of you, you can use your reaction to make a melee weapon attack against that creature. Path of the Totem Warrior The Path of the Totem Warrior is a spiritual journey as the barbarian accepts a spirit animal as guide, protector, and inspiration. In battle, your totem spirit fills you with supernatural might, adding magical fuel to your barbarian rage. Most barbarian tribes consider a totem animal to be kin to a particular clan. In such cases, it is unusual for an individual to have more than one totem animal spirit, though exceptions exist. Spirit Seeker Yours is a path that seeks attunement with the natural world, giving you a kinship with beasts. At third level, when you adopt this path, you gain the ability to cast the beast sense and speak with animal spells, but only as rituals as described in Chapter 10, Spellcasting. Totem Spirit At third level, when you adopt this path, you choose a totem spirit and gain its feature. You must make or acquire a physical totem object, an amulet or similar adornment that incorporates fur or feathers, claws, teeth, or bones of the totem animal. At your option, you also gain minor physical attributes that are reminiscent of your totem spirit. For example, if you have a bear totem spirit, you might be unusually hairy and thick-skinned, or if your totem is the eagle, your eyes turn bright yellow. Your totem animal might be an animal related to those listed here, but more appropriate to your homeland. For example, you could choose a hawk or vulture in place of an eagle. Bear. While raging, you have resistance to all damage except psychic damage. The spirit of the bear makes you tough enough to stand up to any punishment. Eagle. While you're raging, other creatures have disadvantage on opportunity attack rolls against you and you can use the dash action as a bonus action on your turn. The spirit of the eagle makes you into a predator who can weave through the fray with ease. Wolf. While you're raging, your friends have advantage on melee attack rolls against any creature within five feet of you that is hostile to you. The spirit of the wolf makes you a leader of hunters. Aspect of the Beast. At 6th level, you gain a magical benefit based on the totem animal of your choice. You can choose the same animal you selected at 3rd level or a different one. Bear. You gain the might of a bear. Your carrying capacity, including maximum load and maximum lift, is doubled and you have advantage on strength checks made to push, pull, lift, or break objects. Eagle. You gain the eyesight of an eagle. You can see up to one mile away with no difficulty, able to discern even fine details as though looking at something no more than 100 feet away from you. Additionally, dim light doesn't impose disadvantage on your wisdom, perception, checks. Wolf. You gain the hunting sensibilities of a wolf. You can track other creatures while traveling at a fast pace, and you can move stealthily while traveling at a normal pace. See Chapter 8, Adventuring, for rules on travel pace. Spirit Walker. At 10th level, you can cast the Commune with Nature spell, but only as a ritual. When you do so, a spiritual version of one of the animals you chose for Totem Spirit or Aspect of the Beast appears to you to convey the information you seek. Totemic Attunement At 14th level, you gain a magical benefit based on a Totem Animal of your choice. You can choose the same animal you selected previously or a different one. Bear while you're raging, any creature within 5 feet of you that's hostile to you has disadvantage on attack rolls against targets other than you or another character with this feature. An enemy is immune to this effect if it can't see or hear you or if it can't be frightened. Eagle. While raging, you have a flying speed equal to your current walking speed. This benefit works only in short bursts. You fall if you end your turn in the air and nothing else is holding you aloft. Wolf. While you're raging, you can use a bonus action on your turn to knock a large or smaller creature prone when you hit it with melee weapon attack.
Bard. Humming as she traces her fingers over an ancient monument in a long-forgotten ruin, a half-elf in rugged leathers finds knowledge springing into her mind, conjured forth by the magic of her song. Knowledge of the people who constructed the monument and the mythic saga it depicts. A stern human warrior bangs his sword rhythmically against his scale mail, setting the tempo for his war chant and exhorting his companions to bravery and heroism. The magic of his song fortifies and emboldens them. Laughing as she tunes her cittern, a gnome weaves her subtle magic over the assembled nobles, ensuring that her companions' words will be well received. Whether scholar, scald, or scoundrel, a bard weaves magic through words and music to inspire allies, demoralize foes, manipulate minds, create illusions, and even heal wounds. Music A and Magic In the worlds of D&D, words and music are not just vibrations of air, but vocalizations with power all their own. The bard is a master of song, speech, and the magic they contain. Bards say that the multiverse was spoken into existence, that the words of the gods gave it shape, and that echoes of these primordial words of creation still resound throughout the cosmos. The music of bards is an attempt to snatch and harness those echoes, subtly woven into their spells and powers. The greatest strength of bards is their sheer versatility. Many bards prefer to stick to the sidelines in combat, using their magic to inspire their allies and hinder their foes from a distance. But bards are capable of defending themselves in melee if necessary, using their magic to bolster their swords and armor. Their spells lean toward charms and illusions rather than blatantly destructive spells. They have a wide-ranging knowledge of many subjects and a natural aptitude that lets them do almost anything well. Bards become masters of the talents they set their minds to perfecting, from musical performance to esoteric knowledge. Learning from experience. True bards are not common in the world. Not every minstrel singing in a tavern or jester cavorting in a royal court is a bard. Discovering the magic hidden in music requires hard study and some measure of natural talent that most troubadours and jongler lack. It can be hard to spot the difference between these performers and true bards, though. A bard's life is spent wandering across the land gathering lore, telling stories, and living on the gratitude of audiences, much like any other entertainer. But a depth of knowledge, a level of musical skill, and a touch of magic set bards apart from their fellows. Only rarely do bards settled in one place for long, and their natural desire to travel, to find new tales to tell, new skills to learn, and new discoveries beyond the horizon makes an adventuring career a natural calling. Every adventure is an opportunity to learn, practice a variety of skills, enter long-forgotten tombs, discover lost works of magic, decipher old tomes, travel to strange places, or encounter exotic creatures. Bards love to accompany heroes to witness their deeds firsthand. A bard who can tell an awe-inspiring story from personal experience earns renown among other bards. Indeed, after telling so many stories about heroes accomplishing mighty deeds, many bards take these themes to heart and assume heroic roles themselves. Creating a bard. Bards thrive on stories whether those stories are true or not. Your character's background and motivations are not as important as the stories that he or she tells about them. Perhaps you had a secure and mundane childhood. There's no good story to be told about that, so you might paint yourself as an orphan raised by a hag in a dismal swamp or your childhood might be worthy of a story. Some bards acquire their magical music through extraordinary means, including the inspiration of fae or other supernatural creatures. Did you serve an apprenticeship, studying under a master, following the more experienced bard until you were ready to strike out on your own? Or did you attend a college where you studied bardic lore and practiced your musical magic? Perhaps you were a young runaway or orphan, befriended by a wandering bard who became your mentor. Or you might have been a spoiled noble child tutored by a master. Perhaps you stumbled into the clutches of a hag, making a bargain for a musical gift in addition to your life and freedom, but at what cost? Quick build. You can make a bard quickly by following these suggestions. First, charisma should be your highest ability score, followed by dexterity. Second, choose the entertainer background. Third, choose the dancing lights and vicious mockery cantrips, along with the following first-level spells, charm person, detect magic, Healing Word, and Thunder Wave. Class Features. As a bard, you gain the following class features. Hit Points. Hit Dice, 1d8 per bard level. Hit Points at first level, 8 plus your constitution modifier. Hit Points at higher levels, 1d8 or 5 plus your constitution modifier per bard level after first. Proficiencies. Armor. Light Armor. Weapons, Simple Weapons, Hand Crossbows, Long Swords, Rapiers, Short Swords. Tools. Three musical instruments of your choice. Saving throws. 
Dexterity, Charisma. Skills. Choose any three. Equipment. You start with the following equipment in addition to the equipment granted by your background. A. A rapier. B. A longsword. Or C. Any simple weapon plus A. A diplomat's pack. Or B. An entertainer's pack. A. A lute. Or 6. Any other musical instrument. Leather armor and a dagger. Spell casting. You have learned to untangle and reshape the fabric of reality in harmony with your wishes and music. Your spells are part of your vast repertoire, magic that you can tune to different situations. See Chapter 10 for the general rules of spell casting and Chapter 11 for the bard spell list. Cantrips. You know two cantrips of your choice from the bard spell list. You learn additional bard cantrips of your choice at higher levels as shown in the cantrips known column of the bard table. Spell slots. The bard table shows how many spell slots you have to cast your bard spells of first level and higher. To cast one of these spells, you must expend a slot of the spell's level or higher. You regain all expended spell slots when you finish a long rest. For example, if you know the first level spell Cure Wounds and have a is level and a second level spell slot available, you can cast Cure Wounds using either slot. Spells known of its level and higher. You know four first level spells of your choice from the bard spell list. The spells known column of the bard table shows when you learn more bard spells of your choice. Each of these spells must be of a level for which you have spell slots, as shown on the table. For instance, when you reach third level in this class, you can learn one new spell of ist or second level. Additionally, when you gain a level in this class, you can choose one of the bard spells you know and replace it with another spell from the bard spell list, which also must be of a level for which you have spell slots. Spellcasting Ability Charisma is your spellcasting ability for your bard spells. Your magic comes from the heart and soul you pour into the performance of your music or oration. You use your charisma whenever a spell refers to your spellcasting ability. In addition, you use your charisma modifier when setting the saving throw DC for a bard spell you cast and when making an attack roll with one. Spell save DC equals 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your charisma modifier. Spell attack modifier equals your proficiency bonus plus your charisma modifier. Ritual casting. You can cast any bard spell you know as a ritual if that spell has the ritual tag. SBLLC SDNG focus. You can use a musical instrument, see chapter 5, equipment as a spell casting focus for your bard spells. Bardic inspiration. You can inspire others through stirring words or music. To do so, you use a bonus action on your turn to choose one creature other than yourself within 60 feet of you who can hear you. That creature gains one bardic inspiration die, AD6. Once within the next 10 minutes, the creature can roll the die and add the number rolled to one ability check, attack roll, or saving throw it makes. The creature can wait until after it rolls the d20 before deciding to use the bardic inspiration die, but must decide before the DM says whether the roll succeeds or fails. Once the bardic inspiration die is rolled, it is lost. A creature can have only one bardic inspiration die at a time. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your charisma modifier, a minimum of once. You regain any expended uses when you finish a long rest. Your bardic inspiration die changes when you reach certain levels in this class. The die becomes AD8 at 5th level, AD10 at 10th level, and AD12 at 15th level. Jack of all trades. Starting at 2nd level, you can add half your proficiency bonus rounded down to any ability check you make that doesn't already include your proficiency bonus. Song of Rest Beginning at 2nd level, you can use soothing music or oration to help revitalize your wounded allies during a short rest. If you or any friendly creatures who can hear your performance regain hit points at the end of the short rest by spending one or more hit dice, each of those creatures regains an extra 1d6 hit points. The extra hit points increase when you reach certain levels in this class, to 1d8 at 9th level, to 1d10 at 13th level, and to 1d12 at 17th level. Bard College At 3rd level, you delve into the advanced techniques of a bard college of your choice, the College of Lore or the College of Valor, both detailed at the end of the class description. Your choice grants you features at 3rd level and again at 6th and 14th level. Expertise At 3rd level, choose two of your skill proficiencies. Your proficiency bonus is doubled for any ability check you make that uses either of the chosen proficiencies. At 10th level, you can choose another two skill proficiencies to gain this benefit. Ability score improvement. When you reach 4th level and again at 8th, 12th, 16th, and 19th level, you can increase one ability score of your choice by two or you can increase two ability scores of your choice by one. 
As normal, you can increase an ability score above 20 using this feature. Font of Inspiration Beginning when you reach 5th level, you regain all of your expended uses of Bardic Inspiration when you finish a short or long rest. Counter Charm At 6th level, you gain the ability to use musical notes or words of power to disrupt mind-influencing effects. As an action, you can start a performance that lasts until the end of your next turn. During that time, you and any friendly creatures within 30 feet of you have advantage on saving throws against being frightened or charmed. A creature must be able to hear you to gain this benefit. The performance ends early if you are incapacitated or silenced or if you voluntarily end it, no action required. Magical Secrets By 10th level, you have plundered magical knowledge from a wide spectrum of disciplines. Choose two spells from any classes, including this one. A spell you choose must be of a level you can cast, as shown on the bard table, or a cantrip. The chosen spells count as bard spells for you and are included in the number in the spell's known column of the bard table. You learn two additional spells from any classes at 14th level and again at 18th level. Superior Inspiration At 20th level, when you roll initiative and have no uses of bardic inspiration left, you regain one use. Bard Colleges the way of a bard is gregarious. Bards seek each other out to swap songs and stories, boast of their accomplishments, and share their knowledge. Bards form loose associations, which they call colleges, to facilitate their gatherings and preserve their traditions. College of Lore Bards of the College of Lore know something about most things, collecting bits of knowledge from sources as diverse as scholarly tomes and peasant tales. Whether singing folk ballads in taverns or elaborate compositions in royal courts, these bards use their gifts to hold audiences spellbound. When the applause dies down, the audience members might find themselves questioning everything they held to be true, from their faith in the priesthood of the local temple to their loyalty to the king. The loyalty of these bards lies in the pursuit of beauty and truth, not in fealty to a monarch or following the tenets of a deity. A noble who keeps such a bard as a herald or advisor knows that the bard would rather be honest than politic. The college's members gather in libraries and sometimes in actual colleges, complete with classrooms and dormitories, to share their lore with one another. They also meet at festivals or affairs of state where they can expose corruption, unravel lies, and poke fun at self-important figures of authority. Bonus Proficiencies when you join the College of Lore at third level, you gain proficiency with three skills of your choice. Cutting words. Also at third level, you learn how to use your wit to distract, confuse, and otherwise sap the confidence and underscore competence of others. When a creature that you can see within 60 feet of you makes an attack roll, an ability, check, or a damage roll, you can use your reaction to expend one of your uses of bardic inspiration. Rolling a bardic inspiration die and subtracting the number rolled from the creature's roll. You can choose to use this feature after the creature makes its roll, but before the DM determines whether the attack roll or ability check succeeds or fails, or before the creature deals its damage. The creature is immune if it can't hear you or if it's immune to being charmed. Additional Magical Secrets At 6th level, you learn two spells of your choice from any class. A spell you choose must be of a level you can cast, as shown on the bard table, or a cantrip. The chosen spells count as bard spells for you, but don't count against the number of bard spells you know. Peerless Skill Starting at 14th level, when you make an ability check, you can expend one use of bardic inspiration. Roll a bardic inspiration die and add the number rolled to your ability check. You can choose to do so after you roll the die for the ability check, but before the DM tells you whether you succeed or fail. College of Valor Bards of the College of Valor are daring scalds whose tales keep alive the memory of the great heroes of the past and thereby inspire a new generation of heroes. These bards gather in mead halls or around great bonfires to sing the deeds of the mighty, both past and present. They travel the land to witness great events firsthand and to ensure that the memory of those events doesn't pass from the world. With their songs, they inspire others to reach the same heights of accomplishment as the heroes of old. Bonus Proficiencies when you join the College of Valor at third level, you gain proficiency with medium armor, shields, and martial weapons. Combat Inspiration Also at third level, you learn to inspire others in battle. A creature that has a bardic inspiration die from you can roll that die and add the number rolled to a weapon damage roll it just made. Alternatively, when an attack roll is made against the creature, it can use its reaction to roll the bardic inspiration die and add the number rolled to its AC against that attack after seeing the roll but before knowing whether it hits or misses. Extra Attack Starting at 6th level, you can attack twice instead of once whenever you take the attack action on your turn. 
Battle magic. At 14th level, you have mastered the art of weaving spell casting and weapon use into a single harmonious act. When you use your action to cast a bard spell, you can make one weapon attack as a bonus action. Cleric. Arms and eyes upraised toward the sun and a prayer on his lips, an elf begins to glow with an inner light that spills out to heal his battle-worn companions. Chanting a song of glory, a dwarf swings his axe in wide swaths to cut through the ranks of orcs arrayed against him, shouting praise to the gods with every foe's fall. Calling down a curse upon the forces of undeath, a human lifts her holy symbol as light pours from it to drive back the zombies crowding in on her companions. Clerics are intermediaries between the mortal world and the distant planes of the gods. As varied as the gods they serve, clerics strive to embody the handiwork of their deities. No ordinary priest, a cleric is imbued with divine magic. Healers and warriors. Divine magic, as the name suggests, is the power of the gods flowing from them into the world. Clerics are conduits for that power, manifesting it as miraculous effects. The gods don't grant this power to everyone who seeks it, but only to those chosen to fulfill a high calling. Harnessing divine magic doesn't rely on study or training. A cleric might learn formulaic prayers and ancient rites, but the ability to cast cleric spells relies on devotion and an intuitive sense of a deity's wishes. Clerics combine the helpful magic of healing and inspiring their allies with spells that harm and hinder foes. They can provoke awe and dread, lay curses of plague or poison, and even call down flames from heaven to consume their enemies. For those evildoers who will benefit most from a mace to the head, clerics depend on their combat training to let them wade into melee with the power of the gods on their side. Divine Agents Not every acolyte or officiant at a temple or shrine is a cleric. Some priests are called to a simple life of temple service, carrying out their gods' will through prayer and sacrifice, not by magic and strength of arms. In some cities, priesthood amounts to a political office viewed as a stepping stone to higher positions of authority and involving no communion with a god at all. True clerics are rare in most hierarchies. When a cleric takes up an adventuring life, it is usually because his or her god demands it. Pursuing the goals of the gods often involves braving dangers beyond the walls of civilization, smiting evil, or seeking holy relics in ancient tombs. Many clerics are also expected to protect their deities' worshippers, which can mean fighting rampaging orcs, negotiating peace between warring nations, or sealing a portal that would allow a demon prince to enter the world. Most adventuring clerics maintain some connection to established temples and orders of their faiths. A temple might ask for a cleric's aid, or a high priest might be in a position to demand it. Creating a Cleric as you create a cleric, the most important question to consider is which deity to serve and what principles you want your character to embody. Appendix B includes lists of many of the gods of the multiverse. Check with your DM to learn which deities are in your campaign. Once you've chosen a deity, consider your cleric's relationship to that god. Did you enter the service willingly? Or did the god choose you, impelling you into service with no regard for your wishes? How do the temple priests of your faith regard you as a champion or a troublemaker? What are your ultimate goals? Does PC your deity have a special task in mind for you? Or are you striving to prove yourself worthy of a great quest? Quick build. You can make a cleric quickly by following these suggestions. First, wisdom should be your highest ability score, followed by strength or constitution. Second, choose the acolyte background. Class features. As a cleric, you gain the following class features. Hit points. Hit dice, 1d8 per cleric level. Hit points at first level. 8 plus your constitution modifier. Hit points at higher levels, 1d8 or 5 plus your constitution modifier per cleric level after first. Proficiencies. Armor. Light armor, medium armor, shields. Weapons. Simple weapons. Tools. None. Saving throws, wisdom, charisma skills, choose two from history, insight, medicine, persuasion, and religion. Equipment. You start with the following equipment in addition to the equipment granted by your background. A. A mace or B. A warhammer if proficient. A. Scale mail. B. Leather armor. Or C. Chain mail if proficient. A. A light crossbow and 20 bolts or 5. Any simple weapon. A. A priest's pack or 5. An explorer's pack. A shield and a holy symbol. Spell casting. As a conduit for divine power, you can cast cleric spells. See Chapter 10 for the general rules of spell casting and Chapter 11 for the cleric spell list. Cantrips. At first level, you know three cantrips of your choice from the cleric spell list. 
You learn additional cleric cantrips of your choice at higher levels as shown in the cantrips known column of the cleric table. Preparing and casting spells the cleric table shows how many spell slots you have to cast your cleric spells of first level and higher. To cast one of these spells, you must expend a slot of the spell's level or higher. You regain all expended spell slots when you finish a long rest. You prepare the list of cleric spells that are available for you to cast, choosing from the cleric spell list. When you do so, choose a number of cleric spells equal to your wisdom modifier plus your cleric level, minimum of one spell. The spells must be of a level for which you have spell slots. For example, if you are a third level cleric, you have four first level and two second level spell slots. With a wisdom of 16, your list of prepared spells can include six spells of first or second level in any combination. If you prepare the first level spell Cure Wounds, you can cast it using a LST level or second level slot. Casting the spell doesn't remove it from your list of prepared spells. You can change your list of prepared spells when you finish a long rest. Preparing a new list of cleric spells requires time spent in prayer and meditation, at least one minute per spell level for each spell on your list. Spell Asting Ability Wisdom is your spell casting ability for your cleric spells. The power of your spells comes from your devotion to your deity. You use your wisdom whenever a cleric spell refers to your spell casting ability. In addition, you use your wisdom modifier when setting the saving throw DC for a cleric spell you cast and when making an attack roll with one. Spell save DC equals 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your wisdom modifier. Spell attack modifier equals your proficiency bonus plus your wisdom modifier. Ritual casting. You can cast a cleric spell as a ritual if that spell has the ritual tag and you have the spell prepared. Spell casting focus. You can use a holy symbol, see chapter 5, equipment as a spell casting focus for your cleric spells. Divine domain. Choose one domain related to your deity. Knowledge, life, light, nature, tempest, trickery, or war. Each domain is detailed at the end of the class description and each one provides examples of gods associated with it. Your choice grants you domain spells and other features when you choose it at first level. It also grants you additional ways to use channel divinity when you gain that feature at second level and additional benefits at sixth, eighth, and seventeenth levels. Domain spells. Each domain has a list of spells. It's domain spells that you gain at the cleric levels noted in the domain description. Once you gain a domain spell, you always have it prepared and it doesn't count against the number of spells you can prepare each day. If you have a domain spell that doesn't appear on the cleric spell list, the spell is nonetheless a cleric spell for you. Channel Divinity At second level, you gain the ability to channel divine energy directly from your deity using that energy to fuel magical effects. You start with two such effects, Turn Undead and an effect determined by your domain. Some underscore domains grant you additional effects as you advance in levels as noted in the domain description. When you use your channel divinity, you choose which effect to create. You must then finish a short or long rest to use your channel divinity again. Some channel divinity effects require saving throws. When you use such an effect from this class, the DC equals your cleric spell save DC. Beginning at 6th level, you can use your channel divinity twice between rests, and beginning at 18th level, you can use it three times between rests. When you finish a short or long rest, you regain your expended uses. Channel divinity. Turn undead. As an action, you present your holy symbol and speak a prayer censuring the undead. Each undead that can see or hear you within 30 feet of you must make a wisdom saving throw. If the creature fails its saving throw, it is turned for one minute or until it takes any damage. A turned creature must spend its turns trying to move as far away from you as it can, and it can't willingly move to a space within 30 feet of you. It also can't take reactions. For its action, it can use only the dash action or try to escape from an effect that prevents it from moving. If there's nowhere to move, the creature can use the dodge action. Ability score improvement. When you reach 4th level, and again at 8th, 12th, 16th and 19th level, you can increase one ability score of your choice by two, or you can increase two ability scores of your choice by one. As normal, you can not increase an ability score above 20 using this feature. Destroy Undead. Starting at 5th level, when an undead fails its saving throw against your turn undead feature, the creature is instantly destroyed if its challenge rating is at or below a certain threshold, as shown in the Destroy Undead table. Divine Intervention. Beginning at 10th level, you can call on your deity to intervene on your behalf when your need is great. Imploring your deity's aid requires you to use your action. Describe the assistance you seek and roll percentile dice. 
If you roll a number equal to or lower than your cleric level, your deity intervenes. The DM chooses the nature of the intervention. The effect of any cleric spell or cleric domain spell would be appropriate. If your deity intervenes, you can't use this feature again for seven days. Otherwise, you can use it again after you finish a long rest. At 20th level, your call for intervention succeeds automatically, no role required. Divine Domains in a pantheon, every deity has influence over different underscore aspects of mortal life and civilization called a deity's domain. All the domains over which a deity has influence are called the deity's portfolio. For example, underscore the portfolio of the Greek god Apollo includes the domains of knowledge, life, and light. As a cleric, you choose one aspect of your deity's portfolio to emphasize and you are granted powers related to that domain. Your choice might correspond to a particular sect dedicated to your deity. Apollo, for example, could be worshipped in one region as Phoebus Radiant Apollo, emphasizing his influence over the light domain, and in a different place as Apollo Asesius Healing, emphasizing his association with the life domain. Alternatively, your choice of domain could simply be a matter of personal preference, the aspect of the deity that appeals to you most. Each domain's description gives examples of deities who have influence over that domain. Gods are included from the worlds of the Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk, Dragonlance, and Eberron campaign settings as well as from the Celtic, Greek, Norse, and Egyptian pantheons of antiquity. Knowledge Domain The gods of knowledge, including Agma, Bacab, Jillian, Orion, and Thoth value learning and understanding above all. Some teach that knowledge is to be gathered and shared in libraries and universities or promote the practical knowledge of craft and invention. Some deities hoard knowledge and keep its secrets to themselves. And some promise their followers that they will gain tremendous power if they unlock the secrets of the multiverse. Followers of these gods study esoteric lore, collect old tomes, delve into the secret places of the earth, and learn alley they can. Some gods of knowledge promote the practical knowledge of craft and invention, including smith deities like Gond, Reorks, Onatar, Moradin, Hephaestus, and Goibniu. Blessings of Knowledge at first level, you learn two languages of your choice. You also become proficient in your choice of two of the following skills. Arcana, history, nature, or religion. Your proficiency bonus is doubled for any ability check you make that uses either of those skills. Channel divinity. Knowledge of the ages. Starting at second level, you can use your channel divinity to tap into a divine well of knowledge. As an action, you choose one skill or tool. For 10 minutes, you have proficiency with the chosen skill or tool. Channel Divinity Read Thoughts At 6th level, you can use your channel divinity to read a creature's thoughts. You can then use your access to the creature's mind to command it. As an action, choose one creature that you can see within 60 feet of you. That creature must make a wisdom saving throw. If the creature succeeds on the saving throw, you can't use this feature on it again until you finish a long rest. If the creature fails its save, you can read its surface thoughts, those foremost in its mind, reflecting its current emotions and what it is actively thinking about when it is within 60 feet of you. This effect lasts for one minute. During that time, you can use your action to end this effect and cast the suggestion spell on the creature without expending a spell slot. The target automatically fails its saving throw against the spell. Potent Spellcasting Starting at 8th level, you add your wisdom modifier to the damage you deal with any cleric cantrip. Visions of the Past Starting at 17th level, you can call up visions of the past that relate to an object you hold or your immediate surroundings. You spend at least one minute in meditation and prayer, then receive dreamlike, shadowy glimpses of recent events. You can meditate in this way for a number of minutes equal to your wisdom score and must maintain concentration during that time, as if you were casting a spell. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. Object Reading Holding an object as you meditate, you can see visions of the object's previous owner. After meditating for one minute, you learn how the owner acquired and lost the object, as well as the most recent significant event involving the object and that owner. If the object was owned by another creature in the recent past, within a number of days equal to your wisdom score, you can spend one additional minute for each owner to learn the same information about that creature. Area Reading as you meditate, you see visions of recent events in your immediate vicinity, a room, street, tunnel, clearing, or the like, up to a 50-foot cube, going back a number of days equal to your wisdom score. For each minute you meditate, you learn about one significant event, beginning with the most recent. Significant events typically involve powerful emotions, such as battles and betrayals, marriages and murders, births and funerals. 
However, they might also include more mundane events that are nevertheless important in your current situation. Life Domain The life domain focuses on the vibrant positive energy, one of the fundamental forces of the universe that sustains all life. The gods of life promote vitality and health through healing the sick and wounded, caring for those in need, and driving away the forces of death and undeath. Almost any non-evil deity can claim influence over this domain, particularly agricultural deities such as Chantia, Erawai, and Demeter, sun gods such as Lathander, Pelayer, and Rehorikdi, gods of healing or endurance, such as Iamater, Miss Hakel, Apollo, and Diansect, and gods of home and community such as Hestia, Hather, and Boldre. Life Domain Spells Cleric Level First, Bless, Cure Wounds Third, Lesser Restoration, Spiritual Weapon Fifth, Beacon of Hope, Revivify Seventh, Death Ward, Guardian of Faith Ninth, Mass Cure Wounds, Raise Dead Bonus Proficiency When you choose this domain at first level, you gain proficiency with Heavy Armor Disciple of Life Also starting at first level, your healing spells are more effective Whenever you use a spell of first level or higher to restore hit points to a creature, the creature regains additional hit points equal to 2 plus the spell's level. Channel Divinity Preserve Life Starting at second level, you can use your channel divinity to heal the badly injured. As an action, you present your holy symbol and evoke healing energy that can restore a number of hit points equal to 5 times your cleric level. Choose any creatures within 30 feet of you and divide those hit points among them. This feature can restore a creature to no more than half of its hit point maximum. You can't use this feature on an undead or a construct. Blessed Healer Beginning at 6th level, the healing spells you cast on others heal you as well. When you cast a spell of 1st level or higher that restores hit points to a creature other than you, you regain hit points equal to 2 plus the spell's level. Divine Strike At 8th level, you gain the ability to infuse your weapon strikes with divine energy. Once on each of your turns, when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can cause the attack to deal an extra 1d8 radiant damage to the target. When you reach 14th level, the extra damage increases to 2d8. Supreme Healing Starting at 17th level, when you would normally roll one or more dice to restore hit points with a spell, you instead use the highest number possible for each die. For example, instead of restoring 2d6 hit points to a creature, you restore 12. Light Domain Gods of Light, including Helm, Lathander, Foltus, Branchala, the Silver Flame, Bellinus, Apollo, and Rehorikdi promote the ideals of rebirth and renewal, truth, vigilance, and beauty, often using the symbol of the sun. Some of these gods are portrayed as the sun itself or as a charioteer who guides the sun across the sky. Others are tireless sentinels whose eyes pierce every shadow and see through every deception. Some are deities of beauty and artistry who teach that art is a vehicle for the soul's improvement. Clerics of a god of light are enlightened souls infused with radiance and the power of their god's discerning vision, charged with chasing away lies and burning away darkness. Light Domain Spells Cleric Level 1st, Burning Hands, Fairy Fire 3rd, Flaming Sphere, Scorching Ray 5th, Daylight, Fireball 7th, Guardian of Faith, Wall of Fire 9th, Flame Strike, Scrying Bonus Cantrip When you choose this domain at 1st level, you gain the Light Cantrip if you don't already know it. Warding Flare. Also at first level, you can interpose divine light between yourself and an attacking enemy. When you are attacked by a creature within 30 feet of you that you can see, you can use your reaction to impose disadvantage on the attack roll, causing light to flare before the attacker before it hits or misses. An attacker that can't be blinded is immune to this feature. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier, a minimum of once. You regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Channel Divinity, Radiance of the Dawn Starting at second level, you can use your channel divinity to harness sunlight, banishing darkness, and dealing radiant damage to your foes. As an action, you present your holy symbol and any magical darkness within 30 feet of you is dispelled. Additionally, each hostile creature within 30 feet of you must make a constitution saving throw. A creature takes radiant damage equal to 2d10 plus your cleric level on a failed saving throw and half as much damage on a successful one. A creature that has total cover from you is not affected. Improved Flare Starting at 6th level, you can also use your Warding Flare feature when a creature that you can see within 30 feet of you attacks a creature other than you. Potent Spellcasting Starting at 8th level, you add your Wisdom modifier to the damage you deal with any Cleric Cantrip. Corona of Light 
Starting at 17th level, you can use your action to activate an aura of sunlight that lasts for one minute or until you dismiss it using another action. You emit bright light in a 60-foot radius and dim light 30 feet beyond that. Your enemies in the bright light have disadvantage on saving throws against any spell that deals fire or radiant damage. Nature Domain Gods of nature are as varied as the natural world itself, from inscrutable gods of the deep forests such as Sylvanus, Abad High, Chislev, Balanu, and Pan, to friendly deities associated with particular springs and groves such as Eldith. Druids revere nature as a whole and might serve one of these deities, practicing mysterious rites and reciting all but forgotten prayers in their own secret tongue. But many of these gods have clerics as well, champions who take a more active role in advancing the interests of a particular nature god. These clerics might hunt the evil monstrosities that despoil the woodlands, bless the harvest of the faithful, or wither the crops of those who anger their gods. Nature Domain Spells Cleric Level First, Animal Friendship, Speak with Animals Third, Bark Skin, Spike Growth Fifth, Plant Growth, Wind Wall Seventh, Dominate Beast, Grasping Vine Ninth Insect Plague, Tree Stride. Acolyte of Nature. At first level, you learn one druid cantrip of your choice. You also gain proficiency in one of the following skills of your choice, animal handling, nature, or survival. Bonus Proficiency. Also at first level, you gain proficiency with heavy armor. Channel Divinity. Charm Animals and Plants. Starting at second level, you can use your channel divinity to charm animals and plants. As an action, you present your holy symbol and invoke the name of your deity. Each beast or plant creature that can see you within 30 feet of you must make a wisdom saving throw. If the creature fails its saving throw, it is charmed by you for one minute or until it takes damage. While it is charmed by you, it is friendly to you and other creatures you designate. Dampen Elements Starting at 6th level, when you or a creature within 30 feet of you takes acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder damage, you can use your reaction to grant resistance to the creature against that instance of the damage. Divine Strike At 8th level, you gain the ability to infuse your weapon strikes with divine energy. Once on each of your turns when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can cause the attack to deal an extra 1d8 cold, fire, or lightning damage, your choice, to the target. When you reach 14th level, the extra damage increases to 2d8. Master of Nature At 17th level, you gain the ability to command animals and plant creatures. While creatures are charmed by your charm animals and plants feature, you can take a bonus action on your turn to verbally command what each of those creatures will do on its next turn. Tempest Domain Gods whose portfolios include the Tempest Domain, including Talos, Umberly, Kord, Zeboim, the Devourer, Zeus and Thor govern storms, sea, and sky. They include gods of lightning and thunder, gods of earthquakes, some fire gods, and certain gods of violence, physical strength, and courage. In some pantheons, a god of this domain rules over other deities and is known for swift justice delivered by thunderbolts. In the pantheons of seafaring people, gods of this domain are ocean deities and the patrons of sailors. Tempest gods send their clerics to inspire fear in the common folk, either to keep those folk on the path of righteousness or to encourage them to offer sacrifices of propitiation to ward off divine wrath. Tempest Domain Spells Cleric Level First, Fog Cloud, Thunder Rave. Third, Gust of Wind, Shatter. Fifth, Call Lightning, Sleet Storm. Seventh, Control Water, Ice Storm. Ninth, Destructive Wave, Insect Plague. Bonus Proficiencies at first level, you gain proficiency with martial weapons and heavy armor. Wrath of the Storm. Also at first level, you can thunderously rebuke attackers. When a creature within five feet of you that you can see hits you with an attack, you can use your reaction to cause the creature to make a dexterity saving throw. The creature takes 2d8 lightning or thunder damage, your choice, on a failed saving throw and half as much damage on a successful one. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier, a minimum of once. You regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Channel Divinity, Destructive Wrath Starting at second level, you can use your channel divinity to wield the power of the storm with unchecked ferocity. When you roll lightning or thunder damage, you can use your channel divinity to deal maximum damage, instead of rolling. Thunderbolt Strike At sixth level, when you deal lightning damage to a large or smaller creature, you can also push it up to ten feet away from you. Divine Strike at 8th level, you gain the ability to infuse your weapon strikes with divine energy. Once on each of your turns, when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can cause the attack to deal an extra 1d8 thunder damage to the target. 
When you reach 14th level, the extra damage increases to 2d8. Storeborn. At 17th level, you have a flying speed equal to your current walking speed whenever you are not underground or indoors. Trickery Domain. Gods of trickery, such as Timora, Bashaba, Aladamara, the Traveler, Garl Glitter Gold, and Loki, are mischief makers and instigators who stand as a constant challenge to the accepted order among both gods and mortals. They're patrons of thieves, scoundrels, gamblers, rebels, and liberators. Their clerics are a disruptive force in the world, puncturing pride, mocking tyrants, stealing from the rich, freeing captives, and flouting hollow traditions. They prefer subterfuge, pranks, deception, and theft rather than direct confrontation. Trickery Domain Spells Cleric Level First, Charm Person, Disguise Self Third, Mirror Image, Pass Without Trace Fifth, Blink, Dispel Magic Seventh, Dimension Door, Polymorph Ninth, Dominate Person, Modify Memory Blessing of the Trickster Starting when you choose this domain at first level, you can use your action to touch a willing creature other than yourself to give it advantage on dexterity, stealth, checks. This blessing lasts for one hour or until you use this feature again. Channel Divinity, Invoke Duplicity Starting at second level, you can use your channel divinity to create an illusory duplicate of yourself. As an action, you create a perfect illusion of yourself that lasts for one minute or until you lose your concentration as if you were concentrating on a spell. The illusion appears in an unoccupied space that you can see within 30 feet of you. As a bonus action on your turn, you can move the illusion up to 30 feet to a space you can see, but it must remain within 120 feet of you. For the duration, you can cast spells as though you were in the illusion space, but you must use your own senses. Additionally, when both you and your illusion are within 5 feet of a creature that can see the illusion, you have advantage on attack rolls against that creature, given how distracting the illusion is to the target. Channel Divinity, Cloak of Shadows Starting at 6th level, you can use your channel divinity to vanish. As an action, you become invisible until the end of your next turn. You become visible if you attack or cast a spell. Divine Strike At 8th level, you gain the ability to infuse your weapon strikes with poison, a gift from your deity. Once on each of your turns, when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can cause the attack to deal an extra 1d8 poison damage to the target. When you reach 14th level, the extra damage increases to 2d8. Improved Duplicity At 17th level, you can create up to 4 duplicates of yourself instead of 1 when you use Invoke Duplicity. As a bonus action on your turn, you can move any number of them up to 30 feet to a maximum range of 120 feet. War Domain War has many manifestations. It can make heroes of underscore ordinary people. It can be desperate and horrific with acts of cruelty and cowardice eclipsing instances of excellence and courage. In either case, the gods of war watch over warriors and reward them for their great deeds. The clerics of such gods excel in battle, inspiring others to fight the good fight or offering acts of violence as prayers. Gods of war include champions of honor and chivalry such as Torm, Hieronius, and Kirijalith, as well as gods of destruction and pillage such as Arithnal, the Fury, Grumsh, and Ares, and gods of conquest and domination such as Bane, Hexter, and Maglabiot. Other war gods such as Tempest, Nike, and Nuada take a more neutral stance, promoting war in all its manifestations and supporting warriors in any circumstance. War Domain Spells Cleric Level First, Divine Favor, Shield of Faith. Third, Magic Weapon, Spiritual Weapon. Fifth, Crusader's Mantle, Spirit Guardians. Seventh, Freedom of Movement, Stone Skin. Ninth, Flame Strike, Hold Monster. Bonus Proficiencies. At first level, you gain proficiency with martial weapons and heavy armor. War Priest. From first level, your god delivers bolts of inspiration to you while you are engaged in battle. When you use the attack action, you can make one weapon attack as a bonus action. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your Wisdom modifier, a minimum of once. You regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Channel Divinity Guided Strike Starting at second level, you can use your Channel Divinity to strike with supernatural accuracy. When you make an attack roll, you can use your Channel Divinity to gain a plus 10 bonus to the roll. You make this choice after you see the roll, but before the DM says whether the attack hits or misses. Channel Divinity We're God's Blessing at 6th level, when a creature within 30 feet of you makes an attack roll, you can use your reaction to grant that creature a plus 10 bonus to the roll using your channel divinity. You make this choice after you see the roll, but before the DM says whether the attack hits or misses. Divine Strike 
At 8th level, you gain the ability to infuse your weapon strikes with divine energy. Once on each of your turns, when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can cause the attack to deal an extra 1d8 damage of the same type dealt by the weapon to the target. When you reach 14th level, the extra damage increases to 2d8. Avatar of Battle At 17th level, you gain resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non magical weapons. Druid Holding high a gnarled staff wreathed with holly, an elf summons the fury of the storm and calls down explosive bolts of lightning to smite the torch-carrying orcs who threaten her forest. Crouching out of sight on a high tree branch in the form of a leopard, a human peers out of the jungle at the strange construction of a temple of evil elemental air, keeping a close eye on the cultists' activities. Swinging a blade formed of pure fire, a half-elf charges into a mass of skeletal soldiers, sundering the unnatural magic that gives the foul creatures the mocking semblance of life. Whether calling on the elemental forces of nature or emulating the creatures of the animal world, druids are an embodiment of nature's resilience, cunning, and fury. They claim no mastery over nature. Instead, they see themselves as extensions of nature's indomitable will. Power of Nature Druids revere nature above all, gaining their spells and other magical powers either from the force of nature itself or from a nature deity. Many druids pursue a mystic spirituality of transcendent union with nature rather than devotion to a divine entity, while others serve gods of wild nature, animals, or elemental forces. The ancient druidic traditions are sometimes called the old faith in contrast to the worship of gods in temples and shrines. Druid spells are oriented toward nature and animals, the power of tooth and claw, of sun and moon, of fire and storm. Druids also gain the ability to take on animal forms and some druids make a particular study of this practice, even to the point where they prefer animal form to their natural form. Preserve the balance. For druids, nature exists in a precarious balance. The four elements that make up a world, air, earth, fire, and water, must remain in equilibrium. If one element were to gain power over the others, the world could be destroyed, drawn into one of the elemental planes and broken apart into its component elements. Thus, druids oppose cults of elemental evil and others who promote one element to the exclusion of others. Druids are also concerned with the delicate ecological balance that sustains plant and animal life and the need for civilized folk to live in harmony with nature, not in opposition to it. Druids accept that which is cruel in nature, and they hate that which is unnatural, including aberrations such as beholders and mind flayers and undead such as zombies and vampires. Druids sometimes lead raids against such creatures, especially when the monsters encroach on the druid's territory. Druids are often found guarding sacred sites or watching over regions of unspoiled nature. But when a significant danger arises, threatening nature's balance or the lands they protect, druids take on a more active role in combating the threat as adventurers. Creating a druid When making a druid, consider why your character has underscore such a close bond with nature. Perhaps your character underscore lives in a society where the old faith still thrives or was raised by a druid after being abandoned in the depths of a forest. Perhaps your character had a dramatic encounter with the spirits of nature, coming face to face with a giant eagle or dire wolf and surviving the experience. Maybe your character was born during an epic storm or a volcanic eruption, which was interpreted as a sign that becoming a druid was part of your character's destiny. Have you always been an adventurer as part of your druidic calling, or did you first spend time as a caretaker of a sacred grove or spring? Perhaps your homeland was befouled by evil and you took up an adventuring life in hopes of finding a new home or purpose. Quick build. You can make a druid quickly by following these suggestions. First, wisdom should be your highest ability score, followed by constitution. Second, choose the hermit background. Class features. As a druid, you gain the following class features. Hit points. Hit dice, 1d8 per druid level. Hit points at first level, 8 plus your constitution modifier. Hit points at higher levels, 1d8 or 5, plus your constitution modifier per druid level after first. Proficiencies. Armor. Light armor, medium armor, shields, druids will not wear armor or use shields made of metal underscore. Weapons, clubs, daggers, darts, javelins, maces, quarterstaffs, scimitars, sickles, slings, spears. Tools. Herbalism kit. Saving throws. Intelligence. Wisdom. Skills. Choose two from arcana, animal handling. Insight, Medicine, Nature, Perception, Religion, and Survival. Equipment. You start with the following equipment in addition to the equipment granted by your background. 
a. A wooden shield or b. Any simple weapon plus a. A scimitar or b. Any simple melee weapon, leather armor and explorer's pack. And a druidic focus. Druidic. You know druidic, the secret language of druids. You can speak the language and use it to leave hidden messages. You and others who know this language automatically spot such a message. Others spot the message's presence with a successful DC 15 wisdom perception. Check but can't decipher it without magic. Spellcasting. Drawing on the divine essence of nature itself, you can cast spells to shape that essence to your will. See chapter 10 for the general rules of spell casting and chapter 11 for the druid spell list. Cantrips. At first level, you know two cantrips of your choice from the druid spell list. You learn additional druid cantrips of your choice at higher levels as shown in the cantrips known column of the druid table. Preparing and casting spells. The druid table shows how many spell slots you have to cast your druid spells of first level and higher. To cast one of these druid spells, you must expend a slot of the spell's level or higher. You regain all expended spell slots when you finish a long rest. You prepare the list of druid spells that are available for you to cast, choosing from the druid spell list. When you do so, choose a number of druid spells equal to your wisdom modifier plus your druid level minimum of one spell. The spells must be of a level for which you have spell slots. For example, if you are a third level druid, you have four first level and two second level spell slots. With a wisdom of 16, your list of prepared spells can include six spells of first or second level in any combination. If you prepare the first level spell Cure Wounds, you can cast it using a first level or second level slot. Casting the spell doesn't remove it from your list of prepared spells. You can also change your list of prepared spells when you finish a long rest. Preparing a new list of druid spells requires time spent in prayer and meditation, at least one minute per spell level for each spell on your list. Sacred Plants and Wood A druid holds certain plants to be sacred, particularly alder, ash, birch, elder, hazel, holly, juniper, mistletoe, oak, rowan, willow, and yew. Druids often use such plants as part of a spellcasting focus, incorporating lengths of oak or yew or sprigs of mistletoe. Similarly, a druid uses such woods to make other objects, such as weapons and shields. Yew is associated with death and rebirth, so weapon handles for scimitars or sickles might be fashioned from it. Ash is associated with life and oak with strength. These woods make excellent hafts or whole weapons, such as clubs or quarterstaffs, as well as shields. Alder is associated with air, and it might be used for thrown weapons, such as darts or javelins. Druids from regions that lack the plants described here have chosen other plants to take on similar uses. For instance, a druid of a desert region might value the yucca tree and cactus plants. Spell Asting Ability Wisdom is your spell casting ability for your druid spells, since your magic draws upon your devotion and attunement to nature. You use your wisdom whenever a spell refers to your spell casting ability. In addition, you use your Wisdom modifier when setting the Saving Throw DC for a Druid spell you cast and when making an attack roll with one. Space Save DC equals 8 plus your Proficiency bonus plus your Wisdom modifier. Spell Attack modifier equals your Proficiency bonus plus your Wisdom modifier. Ritual Casting You can cast a Druid spell as a ritual if that spell has the Ritual tag and you have the spell prepared. Spell Casting Focus You can use a druidic focus, see chapter 5, equipment as a spellcasting focus for your druid spells. Wild Shape Starting at second level, you can use your action to magically assume the shape of a beast that you have seen before. You can use this feature twice. You regain expended uses when you finish a short or long rest. Your druid level determines the beasts you can transform into as shown in the beast shapes table. At second level, for example, you can transform into any beast that has a challenge rating of 1 to 4 or lower that doesn't have a flying or swimming speed. You can stay in a beast shape for a number of hours equal to half your druid level rounded down. You then revert to your normal form unless you expend another use of this feature. You can revert to your normal form earlier by using a bonus action on your turn. You automatically revert if you fall unconscious, drop to zero hit points, or die. While you are transformed, the following rules apply. Your game statistics are replaced by the statistics of the beast, but you retain your alignment, personality, and intelligence, wisdom, and charisma scores. You also retain all of your skill and saving throw proficiencies in addition to gaining those of the creature. If the creature has the same proficiency as you and the bonus in its stat block is higher than yours, use the creature's bonus instead of yours. If the creature has any legendary or lair actions, you can't use them. 
When you transform, you assume the beast's hit points and hit dice. When you revert to your normal form, you return to the number of hit points you had before you transformed. However, if you revert as a result of dropping to O hit points, any excess damage carries over to your normal form. For example, if you take 10 damage in animal form and have only one hit point left, you revert and take 9 damage. As long as for the excess damage doesn't reduce your normal form to zero hit points, you aren't knocked unconscious. You can't cast spells and your ability to speak or take any action that requires hands is limited to the capabilities of your beast form. Transforming doesn't I break your concentration on a spell you've already cast, however, or prevent you from taking actions that are part of a spell, such as Call Lightning, that you've already cast. You retain the benefit of any features from your class, race, or other source and can use them if the new form is physically capable of doing so. However, you can't use any of your special senses, such as Dark Vision, unless your new form also has that sense. You choose whether your equipment falls to the ground in your space, merges into your new form, or is worn by it. Worn equipment functions as normal, but the DM decides whether it is practical for the new form to wear a piece of equipment based on the creature's shape and size. Your equipment doesn't change size or shape to match the new form, and any equipment that the new form can't wear must either fall to the ground or merge with it. Equipment that merges with the form has no effect until you leave the form. Druid Circle at second level, you choose to identify with a circle of druids. The circle of the land or the circle of the moon, both detailed at the end of the class description. Your choice grants you features at second level and again at sixth, tenth, and fourteenth level. Ability score improvement. When you reach fourth level and again at eighth, twelfth, sixteenth, and nineteenth level, you can increase one ability score of your choice by two or you can increase two ability scores of your choice by one. As normal, you can't increase an ability score above 20 using this feature. Timeless Body Starting at 18th level, the primal magic that you wield causes you to age more slowly. For every 10 years that pass, your body ages only one year. Beast Spells Beginning at 18th level, you can cast many of your druid spells in any shape you assume using Wild Shape. You can perform the somatic and verbal components of a druid spell while in a beast shape, but you aren't able to provide material components. Archdruid. At 20th level, you can use your wild shape an unlimited number of times. Additionally, you can ignore the verbal and somatic components of your druid spells as well as any material components that lack a cost and aren't consumed by a spell. You gain this benefit in both your normal shape and your beast shape from wild shape. Druid Circles. Though their organization is invisible to most outsiders, druids are part of a society that spans the land, ignoring political borders. All druids are nominally members of this druidic society, though some individuals are so isolated that they have never seen any high-ranking members of the society or participated in druidic gatherings. Druids recognize each other as brothers and sisters. Like creatures of the wilderness, however, druids sometimes compete with or even prey on each other. At a local scale, druids are organized into circles that share certain perspectives on nature, balance, and the way of the druid. Circle of the Land the Circle of the Land is made up of mystics and sages who safeguard ancient knowledge and rites through a vast oral tradition. These druids meet within sacred circles of trees or standing stones to whisper primal secrets in druidic. The Circle's wisest members preside as the chief priests of communities that hold to the old faith and serve as advisors to the rulers of those folk. As a member of the Circle, your magic is influenced by the land where you were initiated into the Circle's mysterious rites. Bonus Cantrip when you choose this circle at second level, you learn one additional druid cantrip of your choice. Natural Recovery Starting at second level, you can regain some of your magical energy by sitting in meditation and communing with nature. During a short rest, you choose expended spell slots to recover. The spell slots can have a combined level that is equal to or less than half your druid level, rounded up and none of the slots can be sixth level or higher. You can't use this feature again until you finish a long rest. For example, when you are a 4th level druid, you can recover up to 2 levels worth of spell slots. You can recover either a 2nd level slot or 2 1st level slots. Circle Spells Your mystical connection to the land infuses you with the ability to cast certain spells. At 3rd, 5th, 7th, and 9th level you gain access to circle spells connected to the land where you became a druid. Choose that land arctic, coast, desert, forest, grassland, mountain, swamp, or Underdark and consult the associated list of spells. Once you gain access to a circle spell, you always have it prepared and it doesn't count against the number of spells you can prepare each day. 
If you gain access to a spell that doesn't appear on the druid spell list, the spell is nonetheless a druid spell for you. Land Stride. Starting at 6th level, moving through non-agical difficult terrain costs you no extra movement. You can also pass through non-agical plants without being slowed by them and without taking damage from them if they have thorns, spines, or a similar hazard. In addition, you have advantage on saving throws against plants that are magically created or manipulated to impede movement, such those created by the Entangle spell. Nature's Ward When you reach 10th level, you can't be charmed or frightened by elementals or fey, and you are immune to poison and disease. Nature's Sanctuary When you reach 14th level, creatures of the natural world sense your connection to nature and become hesitant to attack you. When a beast or plant creature attacks you, that creature must make a wisdom saving throw against your druid spell save DC. On a failed save, the creature must choose a different target or the attack automatically misses. On a successful save, the creature is immune to this effect for 24 hours. The creature is aware of this effect before it makes its attack against you. Circle of the Moon Druids of the Circle of the Moon are fierce guardians of the wilds. Their order gathers under the full moon to share news and trade warnings. They haunt the deepest parts of the wilderness where they might go for weeks on end before crossing paths with another humanoid creature, let alone another druid. Changeable as the moon, a druid of the circle might prowl as a great cat one night, soar over the treetops as an eagle the next day, and crash through the undergrowth in bare form to drive off a trespassing monster. The wild is in the druid's blood. Combat Wild Shape when you choose this circle at second level, you gain the ability to use Wild Shape on your turn as a bonus action rather than as an action. Additionally, while you are transformed by Wild Shape, you can use a bonus action to expend one spell slot to regain 1d8 hit points per level of the spell slot expended. Circle Forms The rights of your circle grant you the ability to transform into more dangerous animal forms. Starting at second level, you can use your wild shape to transform into a beast with a challenge rating as high as 1. You ignore the max CR column of the beast shapes table but must abide by the other limitations there. Starting at sixth level, you can transform into a beast with a challenge rating as high as your druid level divided by 3, rounded down. Primal Strike Starting at sixth level, your attacks in beast form count as magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance and immunity to non-agical attacks and damage. Elemental Wild Shape At 10th level, you can expend two uses of Wild Shape at the same time to transform into an Air Elemental, an Earth Elemental, a Fire Elemental, or a Water Elemental. Thousand Forms By 14th level, you have learned to use magic to alter your physical form in more subtle ways. You can cast the Alter Self spell at will. Druids and the Gods Some Druids venerate the forces of nature themselves, but most Druids are devoted to one of the many nature deities worshipped in the multiverse. The lists of gods in Appendix B include many such deities. The worship of these deities is often considered a more ancient tradition than the faiths of clerics and urbanized peoples. In fact, in the world of Greyhawk, the Druidic faith is called the Old Faith and it claims many adherents among farmers, foresters, fishers, and others who live closely with nature. This tradition includes the worship of nature as a primal force beyond personification, but also encompasses the worship of Biui, the Earth Mother, as well as devotees of Abadhai, Ihiana, and Ulla. In the worlds of Greyhawk and the Forgotten Realms, druidic circles are not usually connected to the faith of a single nature deity. Any given circle in the Forgotten Realms, for example, might include druids who revere Sylvanus, Miliki, Eldith, Chantia, or even the harsh gods of Fury. Talos, Mailer, Oral, and Umberly. These nature gods are often called the first circle, the first among the druids, and most druids count them all, even the violent ones, as worthy of veneration. The druids of Eberron hold animistic beliefs completely unconnected to the Sovereign Host, the Dark Six, or any of the other religions of the world. They believe that every living thing and every natural phenomenon, sun, moon, wind, fire, and the world itself, has a spirit. Their spells, then, are a means to communicate with and command these spirits. Different druidic sects, though, hold different philosophies about the proper relationship of these spirits to each other and to the forces of civilization. The Ashbound, for example, believe that arcane magic is an abomination against nature, the children of winter venerate the forces of death, and the gatekeepers preserve ancient traditions meant to protect the world from the incursion of aberrations. Fighter a human in clanging plate armor holds her shield before her as she runs toward the masked goblins. 
An elf behind her, clad in studded leather armor, peppers the goblins with arrows loosed from his exquisite bow. The half-orc nearby shouts orders, helping the two combatants coordinate their assault to the best advantage. A dwarf in chain mail interposes his shield between the ogre's club and his companion, knocking the deadly blow aside. His companion, a half-elf in scale armor, swings two scimitars in a blinding whirl as she circles the ogre, looking for a blind spot in its defenses. A gladiator fights for sport in an arena, a master with his trident and net, skilled at toppling foes and moving them around for the crowd's delight and his own tactical advantage. His opponent's sword flares with blue light an instant before she sends lightning flashing forth to smite him. All of these heroes are fighters, perhaps the most diverse class of characters in the worlds of Dungeons and Dragons. Questing knights, conquering overlords, royal champions, elite foot soldiers, hardened mercenaries, and bandit kings as fighters, they all share an unparalleled mastery with weapons and armor and a thorough knowledge of the skills of combat. And they are well acquainted with death, both meeting it out and staring it defiantly in the face. Well-rounded specialists. Fighters learn the basics of all combat styles. Every fighter can swing an axe, fence with a rapier, wield a longsword or a great sword, use a bow, and even trap foes in a net with some degree of skill. Likewise, a fighter is adept with shields and every form of armor. Beyond the basic degree of familiarity, each fighter specializes in a certain style of combat. Some concentrate on archery, some on fighting with two weapons at once, and some on augmenting their martial skills with magic. This combination of broad general ability and extensive specialization makes fighters superior combatants on battlefields and in dungeons alike. Trained for danger. Not every member of the City Watch, the Village Militia, or the Queen's Army is a fighter. Most of these troops are relatively untrained soldiers with only the most basic combat knowledge. Veteran soldiers, military officers, trained bodyguards, dedicated knights, and similar figures are fighters. Some fighters feel drawn to use their training as adventurers. The dungeon delving, monster slaying, and other dangerous work common among adventurers is second nature for a fighter, not all that different from the life he or she left behind. There are greater risks, perhaps, but also much greater rewards. Few fighters in the City Watch have the opportunity to discover a magic flame tongue sword, for example. Creating a fighter. As you build your fighter, think about two related elements of your character's background. Where did you get your combat training and what set you apart from the mundane warriors around you? Were you particularly ruthless? Did you get extra help from a mentor, perhaps because of your exceptional dedication? What drove you to this training in the first place? A threat to your homeland, a thirst for revenge, or a need to prove yourself might all have been factors. You might have enjoyed formal training in a noble's army or in a local militia. Perhaps you trained in a war underscore academy, learning strategy, tactics, and military history. Or you might be self-taught, unpolished, but well-tested. Did you take up the sword as a way to escape the limits underscore underscore of life on a farm? Or are you following a proud family tradition? Where did you acquire your weapons and armor? They might have been military issue or family underscore heirlooms, or perhaps you scrimped and saved for years to buy them. Your armaments are now among your most important possessions, the only things that stand between you and death's embrace. Quick build. You can make a fighter quickly by following these suggestions. First, make strength or dexterity your highest ability score, depending on whether you want to focus on melee weapons or on archery or finesse weapons. Your next highest score should be constitution or intelligence if you plan to adopt the Eldritch Knight Martial archetype. Second, choose the soldier background. Class features. As a fighter, you gain the following class features. Hit points. Hit dice, 1d10 per fighter level. Hit points at first level, 10 plus your constitution modifier. Hit points at higher levels, 1d10 or 6, plus your constitution modifier per fighter level after first. Proficiencies. Armor, all armor, shields. Weapons, simple weapons, martial weapons. Tools, none. Saving throws, strength, constitution. Skills, choose two skills from acrobatics, animal handling, athletics, history, insight, intimidation, perception, and survival. Equipment. You start with the following equipment, in addition to the equipment granted by your background. A. Chain mail or 5. Leather armor, longbow, and 20 arrows. A. A martial weapon and a shield or 6. Two martial weapons. A. A light crossbow and 20 bolts or B. Two hand axes. A. A dungeoneer's pack or B. An explorer's pack. Fighting style. You adopt a particular style of fighting as your specialty. Choose one of the following options. 
You can't take a fighting style option more than once, even if you later get to choose again. Archery. You gain a plus two bonus to attack rolls you make with ranged weapons. Defense. While you are wearing armor, you gain a plus one bonus to AC. Dueling. When you are wielding a melee weapon in one hand and no other weapons, you gain a plus two bonus to damage rolls with that weapon. Great weapon fighting. When you roll a one or two on a damage die for an attack you make with a melee weapon that you are wielding with two hands, you can re-roll the die and must use the new roll even if the new roll is a one or a two. The weapon must have the two-handed or versatile property for you to gain this benefit. Protection. When a creature you can see attacks a target other than you that is within five feet of you, you can use your reaction to impose disadvantage on the attack roll. You must be wielding a shield. Two-weapon fighting. When you engage in two-weapon fighting, you can add your ability modifier to the damage of the second attack. Second Wind. You have a limited well of stamina that you can draw on to protect yourself from harm. On your turn, you can use a bonus action to regain hit points equal to 1d10 plus your fighter level. Once you use this feature, you must finish a short or long rest before you can use it again. Starting at second level, you can push yourself beyond your normal limits for a moment. On your turn, you can take one additional action. Once you use this feature, you must finish a short or long rest before you can use it again. Starting at 17th level, you can use it twice before a rest, but only once on the same turn. Martial Archetype At third level, you choose an archetype that you strive to emulate in your combat styles and techniques. Choose Champion, Battle Master, or Eldritch Knight, all detailed at the end of the class description. The archetype you choose grants you features at third level and again at 7th, 10th, 15th, and 18th level. Ability score improvement. When you reach 4th level and again at 6th, 8th, 12th, 14th, 16th, and 19th level, you can increase one ability score of your choice by 2 or you can increase two ability scores of your choice by 1. As normal, you can increase an ability score above 20 using this feature. Extra attack. Beginning at 5th level, you can attack twice instead of once whenever you take the attack action on your turn. The number of attacks increases to 3 when you reach 11th level in this class and to 4 when you reach 20th level in this class. Indomitable. Beginning at 9th level, you can re-roll a saving throw that you fail. If you do so, you must use the new roll and you can't use this feature again until you finish a long rest. You can use this feature twice between long rests starting at 13th level and three times between long rests starting at 17th level. Martial Archetypes Different fighters choose different approaches to perfecting their fighting prowess. The martial archetype you choose to emulate reflects your approach. Champion. The archetypal champion focuses on the development of raw physical power honed to deadly perfection. Those who model themselves on this archetype combine rigorous training with physical excellence to deal devastating blows. Improved critical. Beginning when you choose this archetype at third level, your weapon attack score a critical hit on a roll of 19 or 20. Remarkable Athlete Starting at 7th level, you can add half your proficiency bonus round up to any strength, dexterity, or constitution check you make that doesn't already use your proficiency bonus. In addition, when you make a running long jump, the distance you can cover increases by a number of feet equal to your strength modifier. Additional Fighting Style At 10th level, you can choose a second option from the Fighting Style class feature. Superior Critical Starting at 15th level, your weapon attacks score a critical hit on a roll of 18 to 20. Survivor. At 18th level, you attain the pinnacle of resilience in battle. At the start of each of your turns, you regain hit points equal to 5 plus your constitution modifier if you have no more than half of your hit points left. You don't gain this benefit if you have zero hit points. Battle Master. Those who emulate the archetypal Battle Master employ martial techniques passed down through generations. To a battle master, combat is an academic field, sometimes including subjects beyond battle such as weaponsmithing and calligraphy. Not every fighter absorbs the lessons of history, theory, and artistry that are reflected in the battle master archetype, but those who do are well-rounded fighters of great skill and knowledge. Combat Superiority When you choose this archetype at third level, you learn maneuvers that are fueled by special dice called superiority dice. Maneuvers you learn three maneuvers of your choice, which are detailed under Maneuvers below. Many maneuvers enhance an attack in some way. You can use only one maneuver per attack. You learn two additional maneuvers of your choice at 7th, 10th, and 15th level. Each time you learn new maneuvers, you can also replace one maneuver you know with a different one. Superiority Dice You have four superiority dice, which are D8S. 
A superiority die is expended when you use it. You regain all of your expended superiority dice when you finish a short or long rest. You gain another superiority die at 7th level and one more at 15th level. Saving throws. Some of your maneuvers require your target to make a saving throw to resist the maneuver's effects. The saving throw DC is calculated as follows. Maneuver save DC equals 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your strength or dexterity modifier, your choice. Student of War. At third level, you gain proficiency with one type of artisan's tools of your choice. Know your enemy. Starting at seventh level, if you spend at least one minute observing or interacting with another creature outside combat, you can learn certain information about its capabilities compared to your own. The DM tells you if the creature is your equal, superior, or inferior in regard to two of the following characteristics of your choice. Strength score, dexterity score, constitution score, armor class, current hit points, total class levels. If any, fighter class levels, if any. Improved combat superiority. At 10th level, your superiority dice turn into D10S. At 18th level, they turn into D12S. Relentless. Starting at 15th level, when you roll initiative and have no superiority dice remaining, you regain one superiority die. Maneuvers. The maneuvers are presented in alphabetical order. Commander Strike. When you take the attack action on your turn, you can forego one of your attacks and use a bonus action to direct one of your companions to strike. When you do so, choose a friendly creature who can see or hear you and expend one superiority die. That creature can immediately use its reaction to make one weapon attack, adding the superiority die to the attack's damage roll. Disarming attack. When you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can expend one superiority die to attempt to disarm the target, forcing it to drop one item of your choice that it's holding. You add the superiority die to the attack's damage roll and the target must make a strength saving throw. On a failed save, it drops the object you choose. The object lands at its feet. Distracting Strike When you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can expend one superiority die to distract the creature, giving your allies an opening. You add the superiority die to the attack's damage roll. The next attack roll against the target by an attacker other than you has advantage if the attack is made before the start of your next turn. Evasive Footwork when you move, you can expend one superiority die, rolling the die and adding the number rolled to your AC until you stop moving. Fainting attack. You can expend one superiority die and use a bonus action on your turn to faint, choosing one creature within five feet of you as your target. You have advantage on your next attack roll against that creature this turn. If that attack hits, add the superiority die to the attack's damage roll. Goading attack. When you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can expend one superiority die to attempt to goad the target into attacking you. You add the superiority die to the attack's damage roll and the target must make a wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, the target has disadvantage on all attack rolls against targets other than you until the end of your next turn. Lunging attack. When you make a melee weapon attack on your turn, you can expend one superiority die to increase your reach for that attack by five feet. If you hit, you add the superiority die to the attack's damage roll. Maneuvering attack. When you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can expend one superiority die to maneuver one of your comrades into a more advantageous position. You add the superiority die to the attack's damage roll and you choose a friendly creature who can see or hear you. That creature can use its reaction to move up to half its speed without provoking opportunity attacks from the target of your attack. Menacing attack. When you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can expend one superiority die to attempt to frighten the target. You add the superiority die to the attack's damage roll and the target must make a wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, it is frightened of you until the end of your next turn. Parry. When another creature damages you with a melee attack, you can use your reaction and expend one superiority die to reduce the damage by the number you roll on your superiority die plus your dexterity modifier. Precision attack. When you make a weapon attack roll against a creature, you can expend one superiority die to add it to the roll. You can use this maneuver before or after making the attack roll, but before any effects of the attack are applied. Pushing attack. When you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can expend one superiority die to attempt to drive the target back. You add the superiority die to the attack's damage roll, and if the target is large or smaller, it must make a strength saving throw. On a failed save, you push the target up to 15 feet away from you. Rally. On your turn, you can use a bonus action and expend one superiority die to bolster the resolve of one of your companions. 
When you do so, choose a friendly creature who can see or hear you. That creature gains temporary hit points equal to the superiority die roll plus your charisma modifier. Repost. When a creature misses you with a melee attack, you can use your reaction and expend one superiority die to make a melee weapon attack against the creature. If you hit, you add the superiority die to the attack's damage roll. Sweeping attack. When you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack, you can expend one superiority die to attempt to damage another creature with the same attack. Choose another creature within five feet of the original target and within your reach. If the original attack roll would hit the second creature, it takes damage equal to the number you roll on your superiority die. The damage is of the same type dealt by the original attack. Trip attack. When you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can expend one superiority die to attempt to knock the target down. You add the superiority die to the attack's damage roll and if the target is large or smaller, it must make a strength saving throw. On a failed save, you knock the target prone. Eldritch Knight. The archetypal Eldritch Knight combines the martial mastery common to all fighters with a careful study of magic. Eldritch Knights use magical techniques similar to those practiced by wizards. They focus their study on two of the eight schools of magic, abjuration and evocation. Abjuration spells grant an Eldritch Knight additional protection in battle and evocation spells deal damage to many foes at once, extending the fighter's reach in combat. These knights learn a comparatively small number of spells, committing them to memory instead of keeping them in a spellbook. Spellcasting When you reach third level, you augment your martial prowess with the ability to cast spells. See Chapter 10 for the general rules of spellcasting and Chapter 11 for the wizard spell list. Cantrips You learn two cantrips of your choice from the wizard spell list. You learn an additional wizard cantrip of your choice at 10th level. Spell Slots the Eldritch Knight spell casting table shows how many spell slots you have to cast your wizard spells of first level and higher. To cast one of these spells, you must expend a slot of the spell's level or higher. You regain all expended spell slots when you finish a long rest. For example, if you know the first level spell shield and have a first level and a second level spell slot available, you can cast shield using either slot. Spells known of first level and higher. You know three first-level wizard spells of your choice, two of which you must choose from the abjuration and evocation spells on the wizard spell list. The spell's known column of the Eldritch Knight spell casting table shows when you learn more wizard spells of first level or higher. Each of these spells must be an abjuration or evocation spell of your choice and must be of a level for which you have spell slots. For instance, when you reach seventh level in this class, you can learn one new spell of first or second level. The spells you learn at eighth, 14th, and 20th level can come from any school of magic. Whenever you gain a level in this class, you can replace one of the wizard spells you know with another spell of your choice from the wizard spell list. The new spell must be of a level for which you have spell slots, and it must be an abjuration or evocation spell unless you're replacing the spell you gained at 3rd, 8th, 14th, or 20th level from any school of magic. Spell a casting ability. Intelligence is your spellcasting ability for your wizard spells since you learn your spells through study and memorization. You use your intelligence whenever a spell refers to your spellcasting ability. In addition, you use your intelligence modifier when setting the saving throw DC for a wizard spell you cast and when making an attack roll with one. Spell save DC equals 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your intelligence modifier. Spell attack modifier equals your proficiency bonus plus your intelligence modifier. Weapon Bond At third level, you learn a ritual that creates a magical bond between yourself and one weapon. You perform the ritual over the course of one hour, which can be done during a short rest. The weapon must be within your reach throughout the ritual, at the conclusion of which you touch the weapon and forge the bond. Once you have bonded a weapon to yourself, you can't be disarmed of that weapon unless you are incapacitated. If it is on the same plane of existence, you can summon that weapon as a bonus action on your turn, causing it to teleport instantly to your hand. You can have up to two bonded weapons, but can summon only one at a time with your bonus action. If you attempt to bond with a third weapon, you must break the bond with one of the other two. Or magic. Beginning at 7th level, when you use your action to cast a cantrip, you can make one weapon attack as a bonus action. Eldritch Strike. At 10th level, you learn how to make your weapon strikes undercut a creature's resistance to your spells. When you hit a creature with a weapon attack, that creature has disadvantage on the next saving throw it makes against a spell you cast before the end of your next turn. Arcane Charge At 15th level, you gain the ability to teleport up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space you can see when you use your action search. 
You can teleport before or after the additional action. Improved War Magic Starting at 18th level, when you use your action to cast a spell, you can make one weapon attack as a bonus action. Monk. Her fists a blur as they deflect an incoming hail of arrows. A half-elf springs over a barricade and throws herself into the massed ranks of hobgoblins on the other side. She whirls among them, knocking their blows aside and sending them reeling until at last she stands alone. Taking a deep breath, a human covered in tattoos settles into a battle stance. As the first charging orcs reach him, he exhales and a blast of fire roars from his mouth, engulfing his foes. Moving with the silence of the night, a black-clad halfling steps into a shadow beneath an arch and emerges from another inky shadow on a balcony a stone's throw away. She slides her blade free of its cloth-wrapped scabbard and peers through the open window at the tyrant prince, so vulnerable in the grip of sleep. Whatever their discipline, monks are united in their ability to magically harness the energy that flows in their bodies. Whether channeled as a striking display of combat prowess or a subtler focus of defensive ability and speed, this energy infuses all that a monk does. The magic of ki. Monks make careful study of a magical energy that most monastic traditions call ki. This energy is an element of the magic that suffuses the multiverse, specifically the element that flows through living bodies. Monks harness this power within themselves to create magical effects and exceed their body's physical capabilities and some of their special attacks can hinder the flow of ki in their opponents. Using this energy, monks channel uncanny speed and strength into their unarmed strikes. As they gain experience, their martial training and their mastery of ki gives them more power over their bodies and the bodies of their foes. Training and Asceticism Small walled cloisters dot the landscapes of the worlds of D&D, tiny refuges from the flow of ordinary life, where time seems to stand still. The monks who live there seek personal perfection through contemplation and rigorous training. Many entered the monastery as children, sent to live there when their parents died, when food couldn't be found to support them, or in return for some kindness that the monks had performed for their families. Some monks live entirely apart from the surrounding population, secluded from anything that might impede their spiritual progress. Others are sworn to isolation, emerging only to serve as spies or assassins at the command of their leader, a noble patron, or some other mortal or divine power. The majority of monks don't shun their neighbors, making frequent visits to nearby towns or villages and exchanging their service for food and other goods. As versatile warriors, monks often end up protecting their neighbors from monsters or tyrants. For a monk, becoming an adventurer means leaving a structured, communal lifestyle to become a wanderer. This can be a harsh transition, and monks don't undertake it lightly. Those who leave their cloisters take their work seriously, approaching their adventures as personal tests of their physical and spiritual growth. As a rule, monks care little for material wealth and are driven by a desire to accomplish a greater mission than merely slaying monsters and plundering their treasure. Creating a Monk as you make your monk character, think about your connection to the monastery where you learned your skills and spent your formative years. Were you an orphan or a child left on the monastery's threshold? Did your parents promise you to the monastery in gratitude for a service performed by the monks? Did you enter this secluded life to hide from a crime you committed? Or did you choose the monastic life for yourself? Consider why you left. Did the head of your monastery choose you for a particularly important mission beyond the cloister? Perhaps you were cast out because of some violation of the Com Immunities rules. Did you dread leaving, or W are you happy to go? Is there something you hope to accomplish outside the monastery? Are you eager to return to your home? As a result of the structured life of a monastic Com Immunity and the discipline required to harness key, monks are almost always lawful in alignment. Quick build. You can make a monk quickly by following these suggestions. First, make dexterity your highest ability score, followed by wisdom. Second, choose the hermit background. Class features. ASA monk, you gain the following class features. Hit points hit dice. 1d8 per monk level hit points at first level. 8 plus your constitution modifier. Hit points at higher levels. 1d8 or 5 plus your constitution modifier per monk level after first. Proficiencies. Armor. None weapons. Simple weapons. Short swords tools. Choose one type of artisan's tools or one musical instrument. Saving throws, strength, dexterity skills, choose two from acrobatics, athletics, history, insight, religion, and stealth. Equipment you start with the following equipment, in addition to the equipment granted by your background. A. A short sword or B. Any simple weapon. A. A dungeoneer's pack or B. An explorer's pack. Ten darts. Unarmored defense. 
Beginning at first level, while you are wearing no armor and not wielding a shield, your AC equals 10 plus your dexterity modifier plus your wisdom modifier. Martial Arts At first level, your practice of martial arts gives you mastery of combat styles that use unarmed strikes and monk weapons, which are short swords and any simple melee weapons that don't have the two-handed or heavy property. You gain the following benefits while you are unarmed or wielding only monk weapons and you aren't wearing arm or or wielding a shield. You can use dexterity instead of strength for the attack and damage rolls of your unarmed strikes and monk weapons. You can roll a d4 in place of the normal damage of your unarmed strike or monk weapon. This die changes as you gain monk levels as shown in the martial arts column of the monk table. When you use the attack action with an unarmed strike or a monk weapon on your turn, you can make one unarmed strike as a bonus action. For example, if you take the attack action and attack with a quarterstaff, you can also make an unarmed strike as a bonus action, assuming you haven't already taken a bonus action this turn. Certain monasteries use specialized forms of the monk weapons. For example, you might use a club that is two lengths of wood connected by a short chain called a nunchaku or a sickle with a shorter, straighter blade called a kama. Whatever name you use for a monk weapon, you can use the game statistics provided for the weapon in Chapter 5. Ki Starting at second level, your training allows you to harness the mystic energy of Ki. Your access to this energy is represented by a number of key points. Your monk level determines the number of points you have as shown in the key points column of the monk table. You can spend these points to fuel various key features. You start knowing three such features, flurry of blows, patient defense, and step of the wind. You learn more key features as you gain levels in this class. When you spend a key point, it is unavailable until you finish a short or long rest, at the end of which you draw all of your expended key back into yourself. You must spend at least 30 minutes of the rest meditating to regain your key points. Some of your key features require your target to make a saving throw to resist the feature's effects. The saving throw DC is calculated as follows. Key save DC equals 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your wisdom modifier. Flurry of Blows Immediately after you take the attack action on your turn, you can spend one key point to make two unarmed strikes as a bonus action. Patient Defense You can spend one key point to take the dodge action as a bonus action on your turn. Step of the Wind You can spend one key point to take the disengage or dash action as a bonus action on your turn and your jump distance is doubled for the turn. Unarmored Movement Starting at second level, your speed increases by 10 feet while you are not wearing an armor or wielding a shield. This bonus increases when you reach certain monk levels as shown in the monk's table. At ninth level, you gain the ability to move along vertical surfaces and across liquids on your turn without falling during the move. Monastic Tradition When you reach third level, you commit yourself to a monastic tradition, the way of the open hand, the way of shadow, or the way of the four elements, all detailed at the end of the class description. Your tradition grants you features at 3rd level and again at 6th, 11th, and 17th level. Deflect missiles starting at 3rd level, you can use your reaction to deflect or catch the missile when you are hit by a ranged weapon attack. When you do so, the damage you take from the attack is reduced by 1d10 plus your dexterity modifier plus your monk level. If you reduce the damage to 0, you can catch the missile if it is small enough for you to hold in one hand and you have at least one hand free. If you catch a missile in this way, you can spend one key point to make a ranged attack with the weapon or piece of ammunition you just caught as part of the same reaction. You make this attack with proficiency regardless of your weapon proficiencies and the missile counts as a monk weapon for the attack. Ability Score Improvement When you reach 4th level and again at 8th, 12th, 16th, and 19th level, you can increase one ability score of your choice by 2 or you can increase two ability scores of your choice by 1. As normal, you can't increase an ability score above 20 using this feature. Slow Fall Beginning at 4th level, you can use your reaction when you fall to reduce any falling damage you take by an amount equal to 5 times your monk level. Extra Attack Beginning at 5th level, you can attack twice, instead of once, whenever you take the attack action on your turn. Stunning Strike Starting at 5th level, you can interfere with the flow of key in an opponent's body. When you hit another creature with a melee weapon attack, you can spend one key point to attempt a stunning strike. The target must succeed on a constitution saving throw or be stunned until the end of your next turn. K.I. Empowered Strikes Starting at 6th level, your unarmed strikes count as magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance and immunity to non-magical attacks and damage. Evasion 
At 7th level, your instinctive agility lets you dodge out of the way of certain area effects such as a blue dragon's lightning breath or a fireball spell. When you are subjected to an effect that allows you to make a dexterity saving throw to take only half damage, you instead take no damage if you succeed on the saving throw and only half damage if you fail. Stillness of Mind Starting at 7th level, you can use your action to end one effect on yourself that is causing you to be charmed or frightened. Purity of Body At 10th level, your mastery of the key flowing through you makes you immune to disease and poison. Tongue of the Sun and Moon Starting at 13th level, you learn to touch the key of other minds so that you understand all spoken languages. Moreover, any creature that can understand a language can understand what you say. Diamond Soul Beginning at 14th level, your mastery of key grants you proficiency in all saving throws. Additionally, whenever you make a saving throw and fail, you can spend one key point to re-roll it and take the second result. Timeless Body at 15th level, your key sustains you so that you suffer none of the frailty of old age and you can't be aged magically. You can still die of old age, however. In addition, you no longer need food or water. Empty Body Beginning at 18th level, you can use your action to spend four key points to become invisible for one minute. During that time, you also have resistance to all damage but force damage. Additionally, you can spend eight key points to cast the Astral Projection spell without needing material components. When you do so, you can't take any other creatures with you. Perfect Self At 20th level, when you roll for initiative and have no key points remaining, you regain four key points. Monastic Traditions Three traditions of monastic pursuit are common in the monasteries scattered across the multiverse. Most monasteries practice one tradition exclusively, but a few honor the three traditions and instruct each monk according to his or her aptitude and interest. All three traditions rely on the same basic techniques, diverging as the student grows more adept. Thus, a monk need choose a tradition only upon reaching third level. Way of the Open Hand Monks of the Way of the Open Hand are the ultimate masters of martial arts combat, whether armed or unarmed. They learn techniques to push and trip their opponents, manipulate key to heal damage to their bodies, and practice advanced meditation that can protect them from harm. Open Hand Technique Starting when you choose this tradition at third level, you can manipulate your enemy's key when you harness your own. Whenever you hit a creature with one of the attacks granted by your flurry of blows, you can impose one of the following effects on that target. It must succeed on a dexterity saving throw or be knocked prone. It must make a strength saving throw. If it fails, you can push it up to 15 feet away from you. It can't take reactions until the end of your next turn. Wholeness of body. At sixth level, you gain the ability to heal yourself. As an action, you can regain hit points equal to three times. Your monk level. You must finish a long rest before you can use this feature again. Tranquility. Beginning at 11th level, you can enter a special meditation that surrounds you with an aura of peace. At the end of a long rest, you gain the effect of a sanctuary spell that lasts until the start of your next long rest. The spell can end early as normal. The saving throw DC for the spell equals 8 plus your wisdom modifier plus your proficiency bonus. Quivering Palm at 17th level, you gain the ability to set up lethal vibrations in someone's body. When you hit a creature with an unarmed strike, you can spend three key points to start these imperceptible vibrations, which last for a number of days equal to your monk level. The vibrations are harmless unless you use your action to end them. To do so, you and the target must be on the same plane of existence. When you use this action, the creature must make a constitution saving throw. If it fails, it is reduced to zero hit points. If it succeeds, it takes 10d10 necrotic damage. You can have only one creature under the effect of this feature at a time. You can choose to end the vibrations harmlessly without using an action. Way of Shadow Monks of the Way of Shadow follow a tradition that values stealth and subterfuge. These monks might be called ninjas or shadow dancers and they serve as spies and assassins. Sometimes the members of a ninja monastery are family members, forming a clan sworn to secrecy about their arts and missions. Other monasteries are more like thieves' guilds, hiring out their services to nobles, rich merchants, or anyone else who can pay their fees. Regardless of their methods, the heads of these monasteries expect the unquestioning obedience of their students. Shadow Arts Starting when you choose this tradition at third level, you can use your key to duplicate the effects of certain spells. As an action, you can spend two key points to cast Darkness, Darkvision, Pass Without Trace, or Silence without providing material components. Additionally, you gain the Minor Illusion Cantrip if you don't already know it. Shadow Step At 6th level, you gain the ability to step from one shadow into another. 
When you are in dim light or darkness, as a bonus action, you can teleport up to 60 feet to an unoccupied space you can see that is also in dim light or darkness. You then have advantage on the first melee attack you make before the end of the turn. Cloak of Shadows By 11th level, you have learned to become one with the shadows. When you are in an area of dim light or darkness, you can use your action to become invisible. You remain invisible until you make an attack, cast a spell, or are in an area of bright light. Opportunist At 17th level, you can exploit a creature's momentary distraction when it is hit by an attack. Whenever a creature within 5 feet of you is hit by an attack made by a creature other than you, you can use your reaction to make a melee attack against that creature. Way of the four elements you follow a monastic tradition that teaches you to harness the elements. When you focus your key, you can align yourself with the forces of creation and bend the four elements to your will, using them as an extension of your body. Some members of this tradition dedicate themselves to a single element, but others weave the elements together. Many monks of this tradition tattoo their bodies with representations of their key powers, Kam M only imagined as coiling dragons, but also as phoenixes, fish, plants, mountains, and cresting waves. Disciple of the Elements When you choose this tradition at third level, you learn magical disciplines that harness the power of the four elements. A discipline requires you to spend key points each time you use it. You know the elemental attunement discipline and one other elemental discipline of your choice, which are detailed in the elemental disciplines section below. You learn one additional elemental discipline of your choice at 6th, 11th, and 17th level. Whenever you learn a new elemental discipline, you can also replace one elemental discipline that you already know with a different discipline. Casting Elemental Spells Some elemental disciplines allow you to cast spells. See Chapter 10 for the general rules of spell casting. To cast one of these spells, you use its casting time and other rules, but you don't need to provide material components for it. Once you reach 5th level in this class, you can spend additional key points to increase the level of an elemental discipline spell that you cast, provided that the spell has an enhanced effect at a higher level, as Burning Hands does. The spell's level increases by 1 for each additional key point you spend. For example, if you are a 5th level monk and use Sweeping Cinder Strike to cast Burning Hands, you can spend 3 key points to cast it as a 2nd level spell, the discipline's base cost of 2 key points plus 1. The maximum number of key points you can spend to cast a spell in this way, including its base key point cost and any additional key points you spend to increase its level, is determined by your monk level as shown in the Spells and Key Points table. Elemental Disciplines The Elemental Disciplines are presented in alphabetical order. If a discipline requires a level, you must be that level in this class to learn the discipline. Breath of Winter, 17th level required. You can spend 6 key points to cast Cone of Cold. Clench of the North Wind, 6th level required. You can spend 3 key points to cast Hold Person. Elemental Attunement. You can use your action to briefly control elemental forces nearby, causing one of the following effects of your choice. Create a harmless, instantaneous sensory effect related to air, earth, fire, or water, such as a shower of sparks, a puff of wind, a spray of light mist, or a gentle rumbling of stone. Instantaneously light or snuff out a candle, a torch, or a small campfire. Chill or warm up to one pound of non-living material for up to one hour. Cause earth, fire, water, or mist that can fit within a one-foot cube to shape itself into a crude form you designate for one minute. Eternal Mountain Defense, 11th level required. You can spend 5 key points to cast Stone Skin, targeting yourself. Fangs of the Fire Snake When you use the attack action on your turn, you can spend 1 key point to cause tendrils of flame to stretch out from your fists and feet. Your reach with your unarmed strikes increases by 10 feet for that action as WL as the rest of the turn. A hit with such an attack deals fire damage instead of bludgeoning damage, and if you spend 1 key point when the attack hits, it also deals an extra 1d10 fire damage. Fist of Four Thunders. You can spend two key points to cast Thunder Wave. Fist of Unbroken Air. You can create a blast of compressed air that strikes like a mighty fist. As an action, you can spend two key points and choose a creature within 30 feet of you. That creature must make a strength saving throw. On a failed save, the creature takes 3d10 bludgeoning damage plus an extra 1d10 bludgeoning damage for each additional key point you spend and you can push the creature up to 20 feet away from you and knock it prone. On a successful save, the creature takes half as much damage, and you don't push it or knock it prone. Flames of the Phoenix, 11th level required. You can spend 4 key points to cast Fireball. Gong of the Summit, 6th level required. You can spend 3 key points to cast Shatter. 
Miss Stance 11th level required. You can spend 4 key points to cast Gaseous Form, targeting yourself. Ride the Wind 11th level required. You can spend 4 key points to cast Fly, targeting yourself. River of Hungry Flame 17th level required. You can spend 5 key points to cast Wall of Fire. Rush of the Gale Spirits. You can spend 2 key points to cast Gust of Wind. Shape the Flowing River. As an action, you can spend one key point to choose an area of ice or water no larger than 30 feet on a side within 120 feet OFU. You can change water to ice within the area and vice versa, and you can reshape ice in the area in any manner you choose. You can raise or lower the ice's elevation, create or fill in a trench, erect or flatten a wall, or form a pillar. The extent of any such changes can't exceed half the area's largest dimension. For example, if you affect a 30-foot square, you can create a pillar up to 15 feet high, raise or lower the square's elevation by up to 15 feet, dig a trench up to 15 feet deep, and so on. You can't shape the ice to trap or injure a creature in the area. Sweeping Cinder Strike You can spend two key points to cast Burning Hands. Water Whip You can spend two key points as a bonus action to create a whip of water that shoves and pulls a creature to unbalance it. A creature that you can see that is within 30 feet of you must make a dexterity saving throw. On a failed save, the creature takes 3d10 bludgeoning damage plus an extra 1d10 bludgeoning damage for each additional key point you spend, and you can either knock it prone or pull it up to 25 feet closer to you. On a successful save, the creature takes half as much damage, and you don't pull it or knock it prone. Wave of Rolling Earth, 17th level required. You can spend 6 key points to cast Wall of Stone. Monastic Orders The worlds of D&D contain a multitude of monasteries and monastic traditions. In lands with an Asian cultural flavor, such as Sho Lung far to the east of the Forgotten Realms, these monasteries are associated with philosophical traditions and martial arts practice. The Iron Hand School, the Five Star School, the Northern Fist School, and the Southern Star School of Sho Lung teach different approaches to the physical, mental, and spiritual disciplines of the monk. Some of these monasteries have spread to the western lands of Faerun, particularly in places with large show immigrant communities, such as Thesk and Westgate. Other monastic traditions are associated with deities who teach the value of physical excellence and mental discipline. In the Forgotten Realms, the Order of the Dark Moon is made up of monks dedicated to Shar, goddess of loss, who maintain secret communities in remote hills, back allies, and subterranean hideaways. Monasteries of Ilmater, God of Endurance, are named after flowers and their orders carry the names of great heroes of the faith. The disciples of St. Salers the Twice Martyred reside in the Monastery of the Yellow Rose near Damara. The Monasteries of Eberon combine the study of martial arts with a life of scholarship. Most are devoted to the deities of the Sovereign Host. In the world of Dragonlance, most monks are devoted to Magir, God of Meditation and Thought. In Greyhawk, many monasteries are dedicated to Zanye, the goddess of twilight and the superiority of mind over matter, or to Zwickin, god of mental and physical mastery. The evil monks of the Scarlet Brotherhood in the world of Greyhawk derive their fanatic zeal not from devotion to a god but from dedication to the principles of their nation and their race. The belief that the Sewell strand of humanity are meant to rule the world. Paladin Clad in plate armor that gleams in the sunlight despite the dust and grime of long travel, a human lays down her sword and shield and places her hands on a mortally wounded man. Divine radiance shines from her hands, the man's wounds knit closed and his eyes open wide with amazement. A dwarf crouches behind an outcrop, his black cloak making him nearly invisible in the night, and watches an orc war band celebrating its recent victory. Silently, he stalks into their midst and whispers an oath, and two oars are dead before they even realize he is there. Silver hair shining in a shaft of light that seem s to illuminate only him, an elf laughs with exultation. His spear flashes like his eyes as he jabs again and again at a twisted giant, until at last his light overcomes its hideous darkness. Whatever their origin and their mission, paladins are united by their oaths to stand against the forces of evil. Whether sworn before a god's altar and the witness of a priest, in a sacred glade before nature spirits and fey beings, or in a moment of desperation and grief with the dead as the only witness, a paladin's oath is a powerful bond. It is a source of power that turns a devout warrior into a blessed champion. The cause of righteousness. A paladin swears to uphold justice and righteousness, to stand with the good things of the world against the encroaching darkness, and to hunt the forces of evil wherever they lurk. 
Different paladins focus on various aspects of the cause of righteousness, but all are bound by the oaths that grant them power to do their sacred work. Although many paladins are devoted to gods of good, a paladin's power comes as much from a commitment to justice itself as it does from a god. Paladins train for years to learn the skills of combat, mastering a variety of weapons and armor. Even so, their martial skills are secondary to the magical power they wield, power to heal the sick and injured, to smite the wicked and the undead, and to protect the innocent and those who join them in the fight for justice. Beyond the mundane life Almost by definition, the life of a paladin is an adventuring life. Unless a lasting injury has taken him or her away from adventuring for a time, every paladin lives on the front lines of the cosmic struggle against evil. Fighters are rare enough among the ranks of the militias and armies of the world, but even fewer people can claim the true calling of a paladin. When they do receive the call, these warriors turn from their former occupations and take up arms to fight evil. Sometimes their oaths lead them into the service of the crown as leaders of elite groups of knights, but even then their loyalty is first to the cause of righteousness, not to crown and country. Adventuring paladins take their work seriously. A delve into an ancient ruin or dusty crypt can be a quest driven by a higher purpose than the acquisition of treasure. Evil lurks in dungeons and primeval forests, and even the smallest victory against it can tilt the cosmic balance away from oblivion. Creating a Paladin The most important aspect of a Paladin character is the nature of his or her holy quest. Although the class features related to your oath don't appear until you reach third level, plan ahead for that choice by reading the oath descriptions at the end of the class. Are you a devoted servant of good, loyal to the gods of justice and honor, a holy knight in shining armor venturing forth to smite evil? Are you a glorious champion of the light, cherishing everything beautiful that stands against the shadow, a knight whose oath descends from traditions older than many of the gods? Or are you an embittered loner sworn to take vengeance on those who have done great evil, sent as an angel of death by the gods or driven by your need for revenge? Appendix B lists many deities worshipped by paladins throughout the multiverse, such as Torm, Tyr, Hieronius, Paladine, Kirijalith, Dol Ara, the Silver Flame, Bahamut, Athena, Rehorikdi, and Heimdall. How did you experience your call to serve as a paladin? Did you hear a whisper from an unseen god or angel while you were at prayer? Did another paladin sense the potential within you and decide to train you as a squire? Or did some terrible event, the destruction of your home, perhaps drive you to your quests? Perhaps you stumbled into a sacred grove or a hidden elven enclave and found yourself called to protect all such refuges of goodness and beauty. Or you might have known from your earliest memories that the paladin's life was your calling, almost as if you had been sent into the world with that purpose stamped on your soul. As guardians against the forces of wickedness, paladins are rarely of any evil alignment. Most of them walk the paths of charity and justice. Consider how your alignment colors the way you pursue your holy quest and the manner in which you conduct yourself before gods and mortals. Your oath and alignment might be in harmony or your oath might represent standards of behavior that you have not yet attained. Quick build you can make a paladin quickly by following these suggestions. First, strength should be your highest ability score, followed by charisma. Second, choose the noble background. Class features. As a paladin, you gain the following class features. Hit points. Hit dice, 1d10 per paladin level. Hit points at first level, 10 plus your constitution modifier. Hit points at higher levels, 1d10 or 6 plus your constitution modifier per paladin level after first. Proficiencies. Armor, all armor, shields. Weapons, simple weapons, martial weapons. Tools, none. Saving throws, wisdom, charisma. Skills, choose two from athletics, insight, intimidation, medicine, persuasion, and religion. Equipment. You start with the following equipment, in addition to the equipment granted by your background. A. A martial weapon and a shield or B. Two martial weapons. A. Five javelins or B. Any simple melee weapon. A. A priest's pack or B. An explorer's pack. Chainmail and a holy symbol. Divine sense. The presence of strong evil registers on your senses like a noxious odor and powerful good rings like heavenly music in your ears. As an action, you can open your awareness to detect such forces. Until the end of your next turn, you know the location of any celestial, fiend, or undead within 60 feet of you that is not behind total cover. You know the type, celestial, fiend, or undead, of any being whose presence you sense, but not its identity, the vampire Count Strad von Zarevich, for instance. Within the same radius, you also detect the presence of any place or object that has been consecrated or desecrated, as with the Hallow Spell. 
you can use this feature a number of times equal to 1 plus your charisma modifier. When you finish a long rest, you regain all expended uses. Lay on hands your blessed touch can heal wounds. You have a pool of healing power that replenishes when you take a long rest. With that pool, you can restore a total number of hit points equal to your paladin level X5. As an action, you can touch a creature and draw power from the pool to restore a number of hit points to that creature up to the maximum amount remaining in your pool. Alternatively, you can expend 5 hit points from your pool of healing to cure the target of one disease or neutralize one poison affecting it. You can cure multiple diseases and neutralize multiple poisons with a single use of lay on hands, expending hit points separately for each one. This feature has no effect on undead and constructs. Fighting Style At second level, you adopt a style of fighting as your specialty. Choose one of the following options. You can't take a fighting style option more than once, even if you later get to choose again. Defense. While you are wearing armor, you gain a plus one bonus to AC, dueling. When you are wielding a melee weapon in one hand and no other weapons, you gain a plus two bonus to damage rolls with that weapon. Great weapon fighting. When you roll a one or two on a damage die for an attack you make with a melee weapon that you are wielding with two hands, you can re-roll the die and must use the new roll. The weapon must have the two-handed or versatile property for you to gain this benefit. Protection. When a creature you can see attacks a target other than you that is within five feet of you, you can use your reaction to impose disadvantage on the attack roll. You must be wielding a shield. Spell casting. By second level, you have learned to draw on divine magic through meditation and prayer to cast spells as a cleric does. See chapter 10 for the general rules of spell casting and chapter 11 for the paladin spell list. Preparing and casting spells. The paladin table shows how many spell slots you have to cast your spells. To cast one of your paladin spells of first level or higher, you must expend a slot of the spell's level or higher. You regain all expended spell slots when you finish a long rest. You prepare the list of paladin spells that are available for you to cast, choosing from the paladin spell list. When you do so, choose a number of paladin spells equal to your charisma modifier plus half your paladin level, rounded down, minimum of one spell. The spells must be of a level for which you have spell slots. For example, if you are a 5th level paladin, you have 4 first level and 2 second level spell slots. With a charisma of 14, your list of prepared spells can include 4 spells of 1st or 2nd level in any combination. If you prepare the 1st level spell Cure Wounds, you can cast it using a 1st level or a 2nd level slot. Casting the spell doesn't remove it from your list of prepared spells. You can change your list of prepared spells when you finish a long rest. Preparing a new list of paladin spells requires time spent in prayer and meditation, at least one minute per spell level for each spell on your list. Spell Asting Ability Charisma is your spell casting ability for your paladin spells, since their power derives from the strength of your convictions. You use your charisma whenever a spell refers to your spell casting ability. In addition, you use your charisma modifier when setting the saving throw DC for a paladin spell you cast and when making an attack roll with one. Spell save DC equals 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your charisma modifier spell attack modifier equals your proficiency bonus plus your charisma modifier spell casting focus. You can use a holy symbol found in chapter 5 as a spell casting focus for your paladin spells. Divine Smite. Starting at second level, when you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack, you can expend one paladin spell slot to deal radiant damage to the target in addition to the weapon's damage. The extra damage is 2d8 for a first level spell slot, plus 1d8 for each spell level higher than first, to a maximum of 5d8. The damage increases by 1d8 if the target is an undead or a fiend. Divine Health By third level, the divine magic flowing through you makes you immune to disease. Sacred Oath When you reach third level, you swear the oath that binds you as a paladin forever. Up to this time you have been in a preparatory stage, committed to the path but not yet sworn to it. Now you choose the Oath of Devotion, the Oath of the Ancients, or the Oath of Vengeance, all detailed at the end of the class description. Your choice grants you features at 3rd level and again at 7th, 15th, and 20th level. Those features include Oath Spells and the Channel Divinity feature. Oath Spells Each oath has a list of associated spells. You gain access to these spells at the levels specified in the Oath description. Once you gain access to an Oath Spell, you always have it prepared. Oath spells don't count against the number of spells you can prepare each day. If you gain an oath spell that doesn't appear on the paladin spell list, the spell is nonetheless a paladin spell for you. Channel Divinity 
Your oath allows you to channel divine energy to fuel magical effects. Each channel divinity option provided by your oath explains how to use it. When you use your channel divinity, you choose which option to use. You must then finish a short or long rest to use your channel divinity again. SOM E channel divinity effects require saving throws. When you use such an effect from this class, the DC equals your paladin spell save DC. Ability score improvement. When you reach 4th level and again at 8th, 12th, 16th, and 19th level, you can increase one ability score of your choice by two or you can increase two ability scores of your choice by one. As normal, you can increase an ability score above 20 using this feature. Extra attack. Beginning at 5th level, you can attack twice instead of once whenever you take the attack action on your turn. Aura of Protection Starting at 6th level, whenever you or a friendly creature within 10 feet of you must make a saving throw, the creature gains a bonus to the saving throw equal to your charisma modifier with a minimum bonus of plus 1. You must be conscious to grant this bonus. At 18th level, the range of this aura increases to 30 feet. Aura of Courage Starting at 10th level, you and friendly creatures within 10 feet of you can't be frightened while you are conscious. At 18th level, the range of this aura increases to 30 feet. Improved Divine Smite By 11th level, you are so suffused with righteous might that all your melee weapon strikes carry divine power with them. Whenever you hit a creature with a melee weapon, the creature takes an extra 1d8 radiant damage. If you also use your Divine Smite with an attack, you add this damage to the extra damage of your Divine Smite. Cleansing Touch Beginning at 14th level, you can use your action to end one spell on yourself or on one willing creature that you touch. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your charisma modifier, a minimum of once. You regain expended uses when you finish a long rest. Sacred Oath S. B. Becoming a Paladin involves taking vows that commit the Paladin to the cause of righteousness, an active path of fighting wickedness. The final oath taken when he or she reaches third level is the culmination of all the Paladin's training. SOME characters with this class don't consider themselves true paladins until they have reached third level and made this oath. For others, the actual swearing of the oath is a formality, an official stamp on what has always been true in the paladin's heart. Oath of Devotion The Oath of Devotion binds a paladin to the loftiest ideals of justice, virtue, and order. Sometimes called cavaliers, white knights, or holy warriors, these paladins meet the ideal of the knight in shining armor, acting with honor in pursuit of justice and the greater good. They hold themselves to the highest standards of conduct, and some, for better or worse, hold the rest of the world to the same standards. Many who swear this oath are devoted to gods of law and good and use their god's tenets as the measure of their devotion. They hold angels, the perfect servants of good, as their ideals and incorporate images of angelic wings into their helmets or coats of arms. Tenets of Devotion Though the exact words and structures of the Oath of Devotion vary, paladins of this oath share these tenets. Honesty Don't lie or cheat. Let your word be your promise. Courage Never fear to act, though caution is wise. Compassion Aid others, protect the weak, and punish those who threaten them. Show mercy to your foes, but temper it with wisdom. Honor. Treat others with fairness and let your honorable deeds be an example to them. Do as much good as possible while causing the least amount of harm. Duty. Be responsible for your actions and their consequences, protect those entrusted to your care, and obey those who have just authority over you. Oath Spells. You gain Oath Spells at the Paladin Levels listed. Oath of Devotion Spells. Paladin Level. Spells. Third, Protection from Evil and Good, Sanctuary. Fifth, Lesser Restoration, Zone of Truth. Ninth, Beacon of Hope, Dispel Magic. Thirteenth, Freedom of Movement, Guardian of Faith. Seventeenth, Commune, Flame Strike. Channel Divinity. When you take this oath at third level, you gain the following two channel divinity options. Sacred Weapon. As an action, you can imbue one weapon that you are holding with positive energy using your channel divinity. For one minute, you add your charisma modifier to attack rolls made with that weapon with a minimum bonus of plus one. The weapon also emits bright light in a 20-foot radius and dim light 20 feet beyond that. If the weapon is not already magical, it becomes magical for the duration. You can end this effect on your turn as part of any other action. If you are no longer holding or carrying this weapon, or if you fall unconscious, this effect ends. Turn the unholy. As an action, you present your holy symbol and speak a prayer censuring fiends and undead using your channel divinity. Each fiend or undead that can see or hear you within 30 feet of you must make a wisdom saving throw. If the creature fails its saving throw, it is turned for one minute or until it takes damage. 
A turned creature must spend its turns trying to move as far away from you as it can, and it can't willingly move to a space within 30 feet of you. It also can't take reactions. For its action, it can use only the dash action or try to escape from an effect that prevents it from moving. If there's nowhere to move, the creature can use the dodge action. Aura of Devotion Starting at 7th level, you and friendly creatures within 10 feet of you can't be charged while you are conscious. At 18th level, the range of this aura increases to 30 feet. Purity of Spirit Beginning at 15th level, you are always under the effects of a protection from evil and good spell. Holy Nimbus At 20th level, as an action, you can emanate an aura of sunlight. For one minute, bright light shines from you in a 30-foot radius and dim light shines 30 feet beyond that. Whenever an enemy creature starts its turn in the bright light, the creature takes 10 radiant damage. In addition, for the duration, you have advantage on saving throws against spells cast by fiends or undead. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. Breaking your oath, a paladin tries to hold to the highest standards of conduct, but even the most virtuous paladin is fallible. Sometimes the right path proves too demanding, sometimes a situation calls for the lesser of two evils, and sometimes the heat of emotion causes a paladin to transgress his or her oath. A paladin who has broken a vow typically seeks absolution from a cleric who shares his or her faith or from another paladin of the same order. The paladin might spend an all-night vigil in prayer as a sign of penitence or undertake a fast or similar act of self-denial. After a rite of confession and forgiveness, the paladin starts fresh. If a paladin willfully violates his or her oath and shows no sign of repentance, the consequences can be more serious. At the DM's discretion, an impenitent paladin might be forced to abandon this class and adopt another, or perhaps to take the Oathbreaker Paladin option that appears in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Oath of the Ancients The Oath of the Ancients is as old as the race of elves and the rituals of the druids. Sometimes called Fey Knights, Green Knights, or Horned Knights, paladins who swear this oath cast their lot with the side of the light in the cosmic struggle against darkness because they love the beautiful and life-giving things of the world. Not necessarily because they believe in principles of honor, courage, and justice. They adorn their armor and clothing with images of growing things, leaves, antlers, or flowers to reflect their commitment to preserving life and light in the world. Tenets of the Ancients The tenets of the Oath of the Ancients have been preserved for uncounted centuries. This oath emphasizes the principles of good above any concerns of law or chaos. Its four central principles are simple. Kindle the light. Through your acts of mercy, kindness, and forgiveness, kindle the light of hope in the world, beating back despair. Shelter the light. Where there is good, beauty, love, and laughter in the world, stand against the wickedness that would swallow it. Where life flourishes, stand against the forces that would render it barren. P. Reserve your own light. Delight in song and laughter, in beauty and art. If you allow the light to die in your own heart, you can't preserve it in the world. Be the light. Be a glorious beacon for all who live in despair. Let the light of your joy and courage shine forth in all your deeds. Oath Spells You gain Oath Spells at the Paladin levels listed. Oath of the Ancient Spells Paladin Level Spells Third, Ensnaring Strike, Speak with Animals Fifth, Moonbeam, Misty Step Ninth, Plant Growth, Protection from Energy Thirteenth, Ice Storm, Stone Skin Seventeenth, Commune with Nature, Tree Stride Channel Divinity when you take this oath at third level, you gain the following two channel divinity options. Nature's Wrath. You can use your channel divinity to invoke primeval forces to ensnare a foe. As an action, you can cause spectral vines to spring up and reach for a creature within 10 feet of you that you can see. The creature must succeed on a strength or dexterity saving throw, its choice, or be restrained. While restrained by the vines, the creature repeats the saving throw at the end of each of its turns. On a success, it frees itself and the vines vanish. Turn the Faithless. You can use your channel divinity to utter ancient words that are painful for fey and fiends to hear. As an action, you present your holy symbol and each fey or fiend within 30 feet of you that can hear you must make a wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, the creature is turned for one minute or until it takes damage. A turned creature must spend its turns trying to move as far away from you as it can and it can't willingly move to a space within 30 feet of you. It also can't take reactions. For its action, it can use only the dash action or try to escape from an effect that prevents it from moving. If there's nowhere to move, the creature can use the dodge action. If the creature's true form is concealed by an illusion, shape-shifting, or other effect, that form is revealed while it is turned. Aura of Warding 
Beginning at seventh level, ancient magic lies so heavily upon you that it forms an eldritch ward. You and friendly creatures within ten feet of you have resistance to damage from spells. At eighteenth level, the range of this aura increases to thirty feet. Undying Sentinel starting at 15th level, when you are reduced to 0 hit points and are not killed outright, you can choose to drop to 1 hit point instead. Once you use this ability, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. Additionally, you suffer none of the drawbacks of old age, and you can't be aged magically. Elder Champion at 20th level, you can assume the form of an ancient force of nature, taking on an appearance you choose. For example, your skin might turn green or take on a bark-like texture, your hair might become leafy or moss-like, or you might sprout antlers or a lion-like mane. Using your action, you undergo a transformation. For one minute, you gain the following benefits. At the start of each of your turns, you regain 10 hit points. Whenever you cast a paladin spell that has a casting time of one action, you can cast it using a bonus action instead. Enemy creatures within 10 feet of you have disadvantage on saving throws against your paladin spells and channel divinity options. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. Oath of Vengeance The Oath of Vengeance is a solemn commitment to punish those who have committed a grievous sin. When evil forces slaughter helpless villagers, when an entire people turns against the will of the gods, when a thieves' guild grow as too violent and powerful, when a dragon rampages through the countryside at times like these. Paladins arise and swear an oath of vengeance to set right that which has gone wrong. To these paladins, sometimes called avengers or dark knights, their own purity is not as important as delivering justice. Tenets of vengeance The tenets of the oath of vengeance vary by paladin, but all the tenets revolve around punishing wrongdoers by any means necessary. Paladins who uphold these tenets are willing to sacrifice even their own righteousness to mete out justice upon those who do evil, so the paladins are often neutral or lawful neutral in alignment. The core principles of the tenets are brutally simple. Fight the greater evil. Faced with a choice of fighting my sworn foes or combating a lesser evil, I choose the greater evil. No mercy for the wicked. Ordinary foes might win my mercy, but my sworn enemies do not. By any means necessary. My qualms can't get in the way of exterminating my foes. Restitution. If my foes wreak ruin on the world, it is because I failed to stop them. I must help those harmed by their misdeeds. Oath spells. You gain oath spells at the paladin levels listed. Oath of vengeance spells. Paladin level spells. Third, Bane, Hunter's Mark. Fifth, Hold Person, Misty Step. Ninth, Haste, Protection from Energy. Thirteenth, Banishment, Dimension Door. Seventeenth, Hold Monster, Scrying. Channel Divinity. When you take this oath at third level, you gain the following two channel divinity options. Abjure Enemy. As an action, you present your holy symbol and speak a prayer of denunciation using your channel divinity. Choose one creature within 60 feet of you that you can see. That creature must make a wisdom saving throw unless it is immune to being frightened. Fiends and undead have disadvantage on the saving throw. On a failed save, the creature is frightened for one minute or until it takes any damage. While frightened, the creature's speed is zero and it can't benefit from any bonus to its speed. On a successful save, the creature's speed is halved for one minute or until the creature takes any damage. Vow of Enmity As a bonus action, you can utter a vow of enmity against a creature you can see within 10 feet of you using your channel divinity. You gain advantage on attack rolls against the creature for one minute or until it drops to zero hit points or falls unconscious. Relentless Avenger by 7th level, your supernatural focus helps you close off a foe's retreat. When you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, you can move up to half your speed immediately after the attack and as part of the same reaction. This movement doesn't provoke opportunity attacks. Soul of Vengeance starting at 15th level, the authority with which you speak your vow of enmity gives you greater power over your foe. When a creature under the effect of your vow of enmity makes an attack, you can use your reaction to make a melee weapon attack against that creature if it is within range. Avenging Angel At 20th level, you can assume the form of an angelic avenger. Using your action, you undergo a transformation. For one hour, you gain the following benefits. Wings sprout from your back and grant you a flying speed of 60 feet. You emanate an aura of menace in a 30-foot radius. The first time any enemy creature enters the aura or starts its turn there during a battle, the creature must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or become frightened of you for one minute or until it takes any damage. Attack rolls against the frightened creature have advantage. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. Ranger 
Rough and wild looking, a human stalks alone through the shadows of trees, hunting the oars he knows are planning a raid on a nearby farm. Clutching a short sword in each hand, he becomes a whirlwind of steel, cutting down one enemy after another. After tumbling away from a cone of freezing air, an elf finds her feet and draws back her bow to loose an arrow at the white dragon. Shrugging off the wave of fear that emanates from the dragon like the cold of its breath, she sends one arrow after another to find the gaps between the dragon's thick scales. Holding his hand high, a half-elf whistles to the hawk that circles high above him, calling the bird back to his side. Whispering instructions in Elvish, he points to the owl bear he's been tracking and sends the hawk to distract the creature while he readies his bow. Far from the bustle of cities and towns, past the hedges that shelter the most distant farms from the terrors of the wild, amid the dense packed trees of trackless forests and across wide and empty plains, rangers keep their unending watch. Deadly Hunters Warriors of the wilderness, rangers specialize in hunting the monsters that threaten the edges of civilization, humanoid raiders, rampaging beasts and monstrosities, terrible giants, and deadly dragons. They learn to track their quarry as a predator does, moving stealthily through the wilds and hiding themselves in brush and rubble. Rangers focus their combat training on techniques that are particularly useful against their specific favored foes. Thanks to their familiarity with the wilds, rangers acquire the ability to cast spells that harness nature's power, much as a druid does. Their spells, like their combat abilities, emphasize speed, stealth, and the hunt. A ranger's talents and abilities are honed with deadly focus on the grim task of protecting the borderlands. Independent Adventurers Though a ranger might make a living as a hunter, a guide, or a tracker, a ranger's true calling is to defend the outskirts of civilization from the ravages of monsters and humanoid hordes that press in from the wild. In some places, rangers gather in secretive orders or join forces with druidic circles. Many rangers, though, are independent almost to a fault, knowing that when a dragon or a band of orcs attacks, a ranger might be the first and possibly the last line of defense. This fierce independence makes rangers well-suited to adventuring since they are accustomed to life far from the comforts of a dry bed and a hot bath. Faced with city-bred adventurers who grouse and whine about the hardships of the wild, rangers respond with some mixture of amusement, frustration, and compassion. But they quickly learn that other adventurers who can carry their own weight in a fight against civilization's foes are worth any extra burden. Coddled city folk might not know how to feed themselves or find fresh water in the wild, but they make up for it in other ways. Creating a ranger. As you create your ranger character, consider the nature of the training that gave you your particular capabilities. Did you train with a single mentor, wandering the wilds together until you mastered the ranger's ways? Did you leave your apprenticeship, or was your mentor slain perhaps by the same kind of monster that became your favorite enemy? Or perhaps you learned your skills as part of a band of rangers affiliated with a druidic circle trained in mystic paths as well as wilderness lore. You might be self-taught, a recluse who learned combat skills, tracking, and even a magical connection to nature through the necessity of surviving in the wilds. What's the source of your particular hatred of a certain kind of enemy? Did a monster kill someone you loved or destroy your home village? Or did you see too much of the destruction these monsters cause and commit yourself to reigning in their depredations? Is your adventuring career a continuation of your work in protecting the borderlands or a significant change? What made you join up with a band of adventurers? Do you find it challenging to teach new allies the ways of the wild or do you welcome the relief from solitude that they offer? Quick build. You can make a ranger quickly by following these suggestions. First, make dexterity your highest ability score, followed by wisdom. Some rangers who focus on two-weapon fighting make strength higher than dexterity. Second, choose the Outlander background. Class features. As a ranger, you gain the following class features. Hit points. Hit dice. 1d10 per ranger level hit points at first level, 10 plus your constitution modifier. Hit points at higher levels, 1d10 or 6 plus your constitution modifier per ranger level after first. Proficiencies armor. Light armor, medium armor, shields. Weapons. Simple weapons, martial weapons. Tools. None. Saving throws, strength, dexterity skills, choose three from animal handling, athletics, insight, investigation, nature, perception, stealth, and survival equipment. You start with the following equipment in addition to the equipment granted by your background. A. Scale mail or B. Leather armor. A. Two short swords or B. Two simple melee weapons. A. A dungeoneer's pack or B. An explorer's pack. A longbow and a quiver of 20 arrows. Favorite enemy. Beginning at first level, you have significant experience studying, tracking, 
hunting, and even talking to a certain type of enemy. Choose a type of favored enemy, aberrations, beasts, celestials, constructs, dragons, elementals, fey, fiends, giants, monstrosities, oozes, plants, or undead. Alternatively, you can select two races of humanoid, such as gnolls and orcs, as favored enemies. You have advantage on wisdom survival checks to track your favored enemies as well as on intelligence checks to recall information about them. When you gain this feature, you also learn one language of your choice that is spoken by your favored enemies if they speak one at all. You choose one additional favored enemy as well as an associated language at 6th and 14th level. As you gain levels, your choices should reflect the types of monsters you have encountered on your adventures. Natural Explorer you are particularly familiar with one type of natural environment and are adept at traveling and surviving in such regions. Choose one type of favored terrain, arctic, coast, desert, forest, grassland, mountain, swamp, or the underdark. When you make an intelligence or wisdom check related to your favored terrain, your proficiency bonus is doubled if you are using a skill that you're proficient in. While traveling for an hour or more in your favored terrain, you gain the following benefits. Difficult terrain doesn't slow your group's travel. Your group can't become lost except by magical means. Even when you are engaged in another activity while traveling, such as foraging, navigating, or tracking, you remain alert to danger. If you are traveling alone, you can move stealthily at a normal pace. When you forage, you find twice as much food as you normally would. While tracking other creatures, you also learn their exact number, their sizes, and how long ago they passed through the area. You choose additional favored terrain types at 6th and 10th level. Fighting style at 2nd level, you adopt a particular style of fighting as your specialty. Choose one of the following options. You can't take a fighting style option more than once, even if you later get to choose again. Archery. You gain a plus 2 bonus to attack rolls you make with ranged weapons. Defense. While you are wearing armor, you gain a plus one bonus to AC, dueling. When you are wielding a melee weapon in one hand and no other weapons, you gain a plus two bonus to damage rolls with that weapon. Two, weapon fighting. When you engage in two weapon fighting, you can add your ability modifier to the damage of the second attack. Spell casting. By the time you reach second level, you have learned to use the magical essence of nature to cast spells, much as a druid does. See Chapter 10 for the General Rules of Spell Casting and Chapter 11 for the Ranger Spell List. Spell Slots The Ranger Table shows how many spell slots you have to cast your spells of first level and higher. To cast one of these spells, you must expend a slot of the spell's level or higher. You regain all expended spell slots when you finish a long rest. For example, if you know the first level spell Animal Friendship and have a first level and a second level spell slot available, you can cast Animal Friendship using either slot. Spells known of 1's T level and higher. You know two first level spells of your choice from the ranger spell list. The spells known column of the ranger table shows when you learn more ranger spells of your choice. Each of these spells must be of a level for which you have spell slots. For instance, when you reach 5th level in this class, you can learn one new spell of 1st or 2nd level. Additionally, when you gain a level in this class, you can choose one of the ranger spells you know and replace it with another spell from the ranger spell list, which also must be of a level for which you have spell slots. Spell Asting Ability Wisdom is your spell casting ability for your ranger spells, since your magic draws on your attunement to nature. You use your wisdom whenever a spell refers to your spell casting ability. In addition, you use your wisdom modifier when setting the saving throw DC for a ranger spell you cast and when making an attack roll with one. Spell save DC equals 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your wisdom modifier spell attack modifier equals your proficiency bonus plus your wisdom modifier ranger archetype. At third level, you choose an archetype that you strive to emulate, hunter or beast master, both detailed at the end of the class description. Your choice grants you features at third level and again at seventh, eleventh, and fifteenth level. Primeval Awareness Beginning at third level, you can use your action and expend one ranger spell slot to focus your awareness on the region around you. For one minute per level of the spell slot you expend, you can sense whether the following types of creatures are present within one mile of you or within up to six miles if you are in your favored terrain aberrations, celestials, dragons, elementals, fey, fiends, and undead. This feature doesn't reveal the creature's location or number. Ability Score Improvement when you reach 4th level, and again at 8th, 12th, 16th, and 19th level, you can increase one ability score of your choice by 2, or you can increase two ability scores of your choice by 1. As normal, you can't increase an ability score above 20 using this feature. 
Extra Attack Beginning at 5th level, you can attack twice, instead of once, whenever you take the attack action on your turn. Land Stride Starting at 8th level, moving through non-magical difficult terrain costs you no extra movement. You can also pass through non-magical plants without being slowed by them and without taking damage from them if they have thorns, spines, or a similar hazard. In addition, you have advantage on saving throws against plants that are magically created or manipulated to impede movement, such those created by the Entangle spell. Hide in plain sight. Starting at 10th level, you can spend one minute creating camouflage for yourself. You must have access to fresh mud, dirt, plants, sit, and other naturally occurring materials with which to create your camouflage. Once you are camouflaged in this way, you can try to hide by pressing yourself up against a solid surface such as a tree or wall that is at least as tall and wide as you are. You gain a plus 10 bonus to dexterity, stealth, checks as long as you remain there without moving or taking actions. Once you move or take an action or a reaction, you must camouflage yourself again to gain this benefit. Vanish. Starting at 14th level, you can use the hide action as a bonus action on your turn. Also, you can't be tracked by non-magical means unless you choose to leave a trail. Feral Senses At 18th level, you gain preternatural senses that help you fight creatures you can't see. When you attack a creature you can't see, your inability to see it doesn't impose disadvantage on your attack rolls against it. You are also aware of the location of any invisible creature within 30 feet of you, provided that the creature isn't hidden from you and you aren't blinded or deafened. Foe Slayer At 20th level, you become an unparalleled hunter of your enemies. Once on each of your turns, you can add your wisdom modifier to the attack roll or the damage roll of an attack you make against one of your favored enemies. You can choose to use this feature before or after the roll, but before any effects of the roll are applied. Ranger archetypes the ideal of the ranger has two classic expressions, the hunter and the beast master. Hunter. Emulating the hunter archetype means accepting your place as a bulwark between civilization and the terrors of the wilderness. As you walk the hunter's path, you learn specialized techniques for fighting the threats you face, from rampaging ogres and hordes of orcs to towering giants and terrifying dragons. Hunter's prey. At third level, you gain one of the following features of your choice. Colossus Slayer. Your tenacity can wear down the most potent foes. When you hit a creature with a weapon attack, the creature takes an extra 1d8 damage if it's below its hit point maximum. You can deal this extra damage only once per turn. Giant Killer When a large or larger creature within 5 feet of you hits or misses you with an attack, you can use your reaction to attack that creature immediately after its attack, provided that you can see the creature. Hordebreaker once on each of your turns when you make a weapon attack, you can make another attack with the same weapon against a different creature that is within 5 feet of the original target and within range of your weapon. Defensive tactics at 7th level, you gain one of the following features of your choice. Escape the Horde. Opportunity attacks against you are made with disadvantage. Multi-attack defense. When a creature hits you with an attack, you gain a plus 4 bonus to AC against all subsequent attacks made by that creature for the rest of the turn. Steel Will. You have advantage on saving throws against being frightened. Multi-attack. At 11th level, you gain one of the following features of your choice. Volley. You can use your action to make a ranged attack against any number of creatures within 10 feet of a point you can see within your W.E. Pond's range. You must have ammunition for each target as normal and you make a separate attack roll for each target. Whirlwind Attack. You can use your action to make a melee attack against any number of creatures within 5 feet of you with a separate attack roll for each target. Superior Hunter's Defense At 15th level, you gain one of the following features of your choice. Evasion You can nimbly dodge out of the way of certain area effects, such as a red dragon's fiery breath or a lightning bolt spell. When you are subjected to an effect that allows you to make a dexterity saving throw to take only half damage, you instead take no damage if you succeed on the saving throw and only half damage if you fail. Stand against the tide. When a hostile creature misses you with a melee attack, you can use your reaction to force that creature to repeat the same attack against another creature other than itself of your choice. Uncanny Dodge When an attacker that you can see hits you with an attack, you can use your reaction to have the attack's damage against you. Beast Master. The Beast Master archetype embodies a friendship between the civilized races and the beasts of the world. United in focus, beast and ranger work as one to fight the monstrous foes that threaten civilization and the wilderness alike. Emulating the Beast Master archetype means committing yourself to this ideal, working in partnership with an animal as its companion and friend. 
Ranger's Companion. At third level, you gain a beast companion that accompanies you on your adventures and is trained to fight alongside you. Choose a beast that is no larger than medium and that has a challenge rating of one quarter or lower. Appendix D presents statistics for the hawk, mastiff, and panther as examples. Add your proficiency bonus to the beast's AC, attack rolls, and damage rolls as well as to any saving throws and skills it is proficient in. Its hit point maximum equals its normal maximum or four times your ranger level, whichever is higher. The beast obeys your commands as best as it can. It takes its turn on your initiative, though it doesn't take an action unless you command it to. On your turn, you can verbally calm M and the beast were to move, no action required by you. You can use your action to verbally command it to take the attack, dash, disengage, dodge, or help action. Once you have the extra attack feature, you can make one weapon attack yourself when you calm M and the beast to take the attack action. While traveling through your favored terrain with only the beast, you can move stealthily at a normal pace. If the beast dies, you can obtain another one by spending 8 hours magically bonding with another beast that isn't hostile to you, either the same type of beast as before or a different one. Exceptional Training Beginning at 7th level, on any of your turns when your beast companion doesn't attack, you can use a bonus action to command the beast to take the dash, disengage, dodge, or help action on its turn. Bestial Fury Starting at 11th level, your beast companion can make two attacks when you calm him and it to use the attack action. Share Spells Beginning at 15th level, when you cast a spell targeting yourself, you can also affect your beast companion with the spell if the beast is within 30 feet of you. Rogue. Signaling for her companions to wait, a halfling creeps forward through the dungeon hall. She presses an ear to the door, then pulls out a set of tools and picks the lock in the blink of an eye. Then she disappears into the shadows as her fighter friend moves forward to kick the door open. A human lurks in the shadows of an alley while his accomplice prepares for her part in the ambush. When their target, a notorious slave, passes the alleyway, the accomplice cries out, the slaver comes to investigate, and the assassin's blade cuts his throat before he can make a sound. Suppressing a giggle, a gnome wiggles her fingers and magically lifts the key ring from the guard's belt. In a moment, the keys are in her hand, the cell door is open, and she and her companions are free to make their escape. Rogues rely on skill, stealth, and their foe's vulnerabilities to get the upper hand in any situation. They have a knack for finding the solution to just about any problem, demonstrating a resourcefulness and versatility that is the cornerstone of any successful adventuring party. Skill and Precision Rogues devote as much effort to mastering the use of a variety of skills as they do to perfecting their combat abilities, giving them a broad expertise that few other characters can match. Many rogues focus on stealth and deception while others refine the skills that help them in a dungeon environment, such as climbing, finding and disarming traps, and opening locks. When it comes to combat, rogues prioritize cunning over brute strength. A rogue would rather make one precise strike, placing it exactly where the attack will hurt the target most, than wear an opponent down with a barrage of attacks. Rogues have an almost supernatural knack for avoiding danger, and a few learn magical tricks to supplement their other abilities. A shady living every town and city has its share of rogues. Most of them live up to the worst stereotypes of the class, making a living as burglars, assassins, cut purses, and con artists. Often, these scoundrels are organized into thieves' guilds or crime families. Plenty of rogues operate independently, but even they sometimes recruit apprentices to help them in their scams and heists. A few rogues make an honest living as locksmiths, investigators, or exterminators, which can be a dangerous job in a world where dire rats and war rats haunt the sewers. As adventurers, rogues fall on both sides of the law. Some are hardened criminals who decide to seek their fortune in treasure hoards, while others take up a life of adventure to escape from the law. Some have learned and perfected their skills with the explicit purpose of infiltrating ancient ruins and hidden crypts in search of treasure. Creating a rogue. As you create your rogue character, consider the character's relationship to the law. Do you have a criminal past or present? Are you on the run from the law or from an angry thieves' guild master? Or did you leave your guild in search of bigger risks and bigger rewards? Is it greed that drives you in your adventures or some other desire or ideal? What was the trigger that led you away from your previous life? Did a great con or heist gone terribly wrong cause you to reevaluate your career? Maybe you were lucky and a successful robbery gave you the coin you needed to escape the squalor of your life. Did Wanderlust finally call you away from your home? Perhaps you suddenly found yourself cut off from your family or your mentor and you had to find a new means of support. 
Or maybe you made a new friend, another member of your adventuring party who showed you new possibilities for earning a living and employing your particular talents. Quick build. You can make a rogue quickly by following these suggestions. First, dexterity should be your highest ability score. Make intelligence your next highest if you want to excel at investigation or plan to take up the arcane trickster archetype. Choose charisma instead if you plan to emphasize deception and social interaction. Second, choose the charlotte in background. Class features. As a rogue, you have the following class features. H-I-T-P-O-N-T-S hit dice. 1d8 per rogue level hit points at first level. 8 plus your constitution modifier hit points at higher levels. 1d8 or 5 plus your constitution modifier per rogue level after first. Proficiencies. Armor. Light armor. Weapons. Simple weapons. Hand crossbows. Long swords. Rapiers. Short swords. Tools. Thieves tools. Saving throws, dexterity, intelligence, skills, choose four from acrobatics, athletics, deception, insight, intimidation, investigation, perception, performance, persuasion, sleight of hand, and stealth. Equipment. You start with the following equipment in addition to the equipment granted by your background. A, a rapier, or B, a short sword. A, a short bow and quiver of 20 arrows, or B, a short sword. A. A burglar's pack, B. A dungeoneer's pack, or C. An explorer's pack. Leather armor, two daggers, and thieves' tools. Expertise. At first level, choose two of your skill proficiencies or one of your skill proficiencies and your proficiency with thieves' tools. Your proficiency bonus is doubled for any ability check you make that uses either of the chosen proficiencies. At sixth level, you can choose two more of your proficiencies in skills or with thieves' tools to gain this benefit. Sneak attack. Beginning at first level, you know how to strike subtly and exploit a foe's distraction. Once per turn, you can deal an extra 1d6 damage to one creature you hit with an attack if you have advantage on the attack roll. The attack must use a finesse or a ranged weapon. You don't need advantage on the attack roll if another enemy of the target is within 5 feet of it, that enemy isn't incapacitated, and you don't have disadvantage on the attack roll. The amount of the extra damage increases as you gain levels in this class, as shown in the sneak attack column of the rogue table. Thieves Cant During your rogue training you learned Thieves Cant, a secret mix of dialect, jargon, and code that allows you to hide messages in seemingly normal conversation. Only another creature that knows Thieves Cant understands such messages. It takes four times longer to convey such a message than it does to speak the same idea plainly. In addition, you understand a set of secret signs and symbols used to convey short, simple messages such as whether an area is dangerous or the territory of a thieves' guild, whether loot is nearby, or whether the people in an area are easy marks or will provide a safe house for thieves on the run. Cunning Action Starting at second level, your quick thinking and agility allow you to move and act quickly. You can take a bonus action on each of your turns in combat. This action can be used only to take the dash, disengage, or hide action. Roguish Archetype At third level, you choose an archetype that you emulate in the exercise of your rogue abilities, thief, assassin, or arcane trickster, all detailed at the end of the class description. Your archetype choice grants you features at third level and then again at ninth, thirteenth, and seventeenth level. Ability Score Improvement When you reach fourth level and again at eighth, 10th, 12th, 16th, and 19th level, you can increase one ability score of your choice by two, or you can increase two ability scores of your choice by one. As normal, you can increase an ability score above 20 using this feature. Uncanny Dodge Starting at 5th level, when an attacker that you can see hits you with an attack, you can use your reaction to have the attack's damage against you. Evasion Beginning at 7th level, you can nimbly dodge out of the way of certain area effects, such as a red dragon's fiery breath or an ice storm spell. When you are subjected to an effect that allows you to make a dexterity saving throw to take only half damage, you instead take no damage if you succeed on the saving throw and only half damage if you fail. Reliable Talent By 11th level, you have refined your chosen skills until they approach perfection. Whenever you make an ability check that lets you add your proficiency bonus, you can treat a d20 roll of 9 or lower as a 10. B-L-I-N-D-S-E-N-S-E -S -E -S -E starting at 14th level, if you are able to hear, you are aware of the location of any hidden or invisible creature within 10 feet of you. Slippery Mind By 15th level, you have acquired greater mental strength. You gain proficiency in wisdom saving throws. Elusive Beginning at 18th level, you are so evasive that attackers rarely gain the upper hand against you. 
No attack roll has advantage against you while you aren't incapacitated. Stroke of luck. At 20th level, you have an uncanny knack for succeeding when you need to. If your attack misses a target within range, you can turn the miss into a hit. Alternatively, if you fail an ability check, you can treat the D20 roll as a 20. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. Roguish Archetypes Rogues have many features in common, including their emphasis on perfecting their skills, their precise and deadly approach to combat, and their increasingly quick reflexes. But different rogues steer those talents in varying directions embodied by the rogue archetypes. Your choice of archetype is a reflection of your focus, not necessarily an indication of your chosen profession, but a description of your preferred techniques. Thief. You hone your skills in the larcenous arts. Burglars, bandits, cut purses, and other criminals typically follow this archetype, but so do rogues who prefer to think of themselves as professional treasure seekers, explorers, delvers, and investigators. In addition to improving your agility and stealth, you learn skills useful for delving into ancient ruins, reading unfamiliar languages, and using magic items you normally couldn't employ. Fast Hands Starting at third level, you can use the bonus action granted by your cunning action to make a dexterity, sleight of hand, check, use your thieves' tools to disarm a trap or open a lock, or take the use an object action. Second Story Work when you choose this archetype at third level, you gain the ability to climb faster than normal. Climbing no longer costs you extra movement. In addition, when you make a running jump, the distance you cover increases by a number of feet equal to your dexterity modifier. Supreme Sneak Starting at ninth level, you have advantage on a dexterity, stealth, check if you move no more than half your speed on the same turn. Use Magic Device by 13th level, you have learned enough about the workings of magic that you can improvise the use of items even when they are not intended for you. You ignore all class, race, and level requirements on the use of magic items. Thief's Reflexes When you reach 17th level, you have become adept at laying in bushes and quickly escaping danger. You can take two turns during the first round of any combat. You take your first turn at your normal initiative and your second turn at your initiative minus 10. You can't use this feature when you are surprised. Assassin. You focus your training on the grim art of death. Those who adhere to this archetype are diverse, hired killers, spies, bounty hunters, and even specially anointed priests trained to exterminate the enemies of their deity. Stealth, poison, and disguise help you eliminate your foes with deadly efficiency. Bonus proficiencies. When you choose this archetype at third level, you gain proficiency with the disguise kit and the poisoner's kit. Assassinate. Starting at third level, you are at your deadliest when you get the drop on your enemies. You have advantage on attack rolls against any creature that hasn't taken a turn in the combat yet. In addition, any hit you score against a creature that is surprised is a critical hit. Infiltration Expertise Starting at ninth level, you can unfailingly create false identities for yourself. You must spend 7 days and 25 GP to establish the history, profession, and affiliations for an identity. You can't establish an identity that belongs to someone else. For example, you might acquire appropriate clothing, letters of introduction, an official-looking certification to establish yourself as a member of a trading house from a remote city so you can insinuate yourself into the company of other wealthy merchants. Thereafter, if you adopt the new identity as a disguise, other creatures believe you to be that person until given an obvious reason not to. Imposter at 13th level, you gain the ability to unerringly mimic another person's speech, writing, and behavior. You must spend at least three hours studying these three components of the person's behavior, listening to speech, examining handwriting, and observing mannerisms. Your ruse is indiscernible to the casual observer. If a wary creature suspects something is amiss, you have advantage on any charisma, deception, check you make to avoid detection. Death Strike Starting at 17th level, you become a master of instant death. When you attack and hit a creature that is surprised, it must make a constitution saving throw, DC 8 plus your dexterity modifier plus your proficiency bonus. On a failed save, double the damage of your attack against the creature. Arcane Trickster Some rogues enhance their fine-honed skills of stealth and agility with magic, learning tricks of enchantment and illusion. These rogues include pickpockets and burglars, but also pranksters, mischief makers, and a significant number of adventurers. Spellcasting when you reach third level, you gain the ability to cast spells. See chapter 10 for the general rules of spell casting and chapter 11 for the wizard spell list. Cantrips. You learn three cantrips, mage hand and two other cantrips of your choice from the wizard spell list. 
you learn another wizard cantrip of your choice at 10th level. Spell slots. The Arcane Trickster spell casting table shows how many spell slots you have to cast your spells of first level and higher. To cast one of these spells, you must expend a slot of the spell's level or higher. You regain all expended spell slots when you finish a long rest. For example, if you know the first level spell Charm Person and have a first level and a second level spell slot available, you can cast Charm Person using either slot. Spells known of first level and higher. You know three first level wizard spells of your choice, two of which you must choose from the enchantment and illusion spells on the wizard spell list. The spell's known column of the Arcane Trickster spell casting table showers when you learn more wizard spells of first level or higher. Each of these spells must be an enchantment or illusion spell of your choice and must be of a level for which you have spell slots. For instance, when you reach 7th level in this class, you can learn one new spell of 1st or 2nd level. The spells you learn at 8th, 14th, and 20th level can come from any school of magic. Whenever you gain a level in this class, you can replace one of the wizard spells you know with another spell of your choice from the wizard spell list. The new spell must be of a level for which you have spell slots, and it must be an enchantment or illusion spell unless you're replacing the spell you gained at 8th, 14th, or 20th level. Spell Asting Ability Intelligence is your spell casting ability for your wizard spells since you learn your spells through dedicated study and memorization. You use your intelligence whenever a spell refers to your spell casting ability. In addition, you use your intelligence modifier when setting the saving throw DC for a wizard spell you cast and when making an attack roll with one. Spell save DC equals 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your intelligence modifier spell attack modifier equals your proficiency bonus plus your intelligence modifier. Mage Hand Ledger Domain Starting at 3rd level, when you cast Mage Hand, you can make the Spectral Hand invisible and you can perform the following additional tasks with it. You can stow one object the hand is holding in a container worn or carried by another creature. You can retrieve an object in a container worn or carried by another creature. You can use Thieves' Tools to pick locks and disarm traps at range. You can perform one of these tasks without being noticed by a creature if you succeed on a Dexterity, Sleight of Hand, check contested by the creature's wisdom, perception, check. In addition, you can use the bonus action granted by your cunning action to control the hand. Magical Ambush Starting at 9th level, if you are hidden from a creature when you cast a spell on it, the creature has disadvantage on any saving throw it makes against the spell this turn. Versatile Trickster At 13th level, you gain the ability to distract targets with your mage hand. As a bonus action on your turn, you can designate a creature within 5 feet of the spectral hand created by the spell. Doing so gives you advantage on attack rolls against that creature until the end of the turn. S Spell Thief At 17th level, you gain the ability to magically steal the knowledge of how to cast a spell from another spellcaster. Immediately after a creature casts a spell that targets you or includes you in its area of effect, you can use your reaction to force the creature to make a saving throw with its spellcasting ability modifier. The DC equals your spell save DC. On a failed save, you negate the spell's effect against you and you steal the knowledge of the spell if it is at least first level and of a level you can cast, it doesn't need to be a wizard spell. For the next 8 hours, you know the spell and can cast it using your spell slots. The creature can't cast that spell until the 8 hours have passed. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. Sorcerer Golden eyes flashing, a human stretches out her hand and unleashes the dragon fire that burns in her veins. As an inferno rages around her foes, leathery wings spread from her back and she takes to the air. Long hair whipped by a conjured wind, a half-elf spreads his arms wide and throws his head back. Lifting him momentarily off the ground, a wave of magic surges up in him, through him, and out from him in a mighty blast OF lightning. Crouching behind a stalagmite, a halfling points a finger at a charging troglodyte. A blast of fire springs from her finger to strike the creature. She ducks back behind the rock formation with a grin, unaware that her wild magic has turned her skin bright blue. Sorcerers carry a magical birthright conferred upon them by an exotic bloodline, some otherworldly influence, or exposure to unknown cosmic forces. One can t study sorcery as one learns a language, any more than one can learn to live a legendary life. No one chooses sorcery, the power chooses the sorcerer. Magic is a part of every sorcerer, suffusing body, mind, and spirit with a latent power that waits to be tapped. S.O.M.E. sorcerers wield magic that springs from an ancient bloodline infused with the magic of dragons. 
Others carry a raw, uncontrolled magic within them, a chaotic storm that manifests in unexpected ways. The appearance of sorceress powers is wildly unpredictable. SOME Draconic bloodlines produce exactly one sorcerer in every generation, but in other lines of descent every individual is a sorcerer. Most OF the time, the talents OF sorcery appear as apparent flukes. Some sorcerers can't name the origin of their power while others trace it to strange events in their own lives. The touch of a demon, the blessing of a dryad at a baby's birth, or a taste of the water from a mysterious spring might spark the gift of sorcery. SO2 might the gift of a deity of magic, exposure to the elemental forces of the inner planes or the maddening chaos of limbo or a glimpse into the inner workings of reality. Sorcerers have no use for the spellbooks and ancient tome of magic lore that wizards rely on, nor do they rely on a patron to grant their spells as warlocks do. By learning to harness and channel their own inborn magic, they can discover new and staggering ways to unleash that power. Unexplained Powers Sorcerers are rare in the world and it's unusual to find a sorcerer who is not involved in the adventuring life in some way. People with magical power seething in their veins soon discover that the power doesn't like to stay quiet. A sorcerer's magic wants to be wielded and it has a tendency to spill out in unpredictable ways if it isn't called on. Sorcerers often have obscure or quixotic motivations driving them to adventure. Some seek a greater understanding of the magical force that infuses them or the answer to the mystery of its origin. Others hope to find a way to get rid of it or to unleash its full potential. Whatever their goals, sorcerers are every bit as useful to an adventuring party as wizards, making up for a comparative lack of breadth in their magical knowledge with enormous flexibility in using the spells they know. Creating a Sorcerer The most important question to consider when creating your sorcerer is the origin of your power. As a starting character, you'll choose an origin that ties to a draconic bloodline or the influence of wild magic, but the exact source of your power is up to you to decide. Is it a family curse passed down to you from distant ancestors? Or did some extraordinary event leave you blessed with inherent magic but perhaps scarred as well? How do you feel about the magical power coursing through you? Do you embrace it, try to master it, or revel in its unpredictable nature? Is it a blessing or a curse? Did you seek it out or did it find you? Did you have the option to refuse it and do you wish you had? What do you intend to do with it? Perhaps you feel like you've been given this power for some lofty purpose. Or you might decide that the power gives you the right to do what you want, to take what you want from those who lack such power. Perhaps your power links you to a powerful individual in the world, the fey creature that blessed you at birth, the dragon who put a drop of its blood into your veins, the lich who created you as an experiment, or the deity who chose you to carry this power. Quick build. You can make a sorcerer quickly by following these suggestions. First, charisma should be your highest ability score, followed by constitution. Second, choose the hermit background. Third, choose the light, prestidigitation, ray of frost, and shocking grasp cantrips, along with the first level spells shield and magic missile. Class features. As a sorcerer, you gain the following class features. Hit points. Hit dice, 1d6 per sorcerer level. Hit points at first level, 6 plus your constitution modifier. Hit points at higher levels, 1d6 or 4 plus your constitution M modifier per sorcerer level after first. Proficiencies. Armor, none. Weapons, daggers, darts, slings, quarterstaffs, light crossbows. Tools, none. Saving throws, constitution, charisma. Skills, choose two from arcana, deception, insight, intimidation, persuasion, and religion. Equipment. You start with the following equipment, in addition to the equipment granted by your background. A. A light crossbow and 20 bolts or B. Any simple weapon. A. A component pouch or B. An arcane focus. A. A dungeoneer's pack or B. An explorer's pack. Two daggers S-P-E-L-L-C-A-S-T-I-N-G An event in your past or in the life of a parent or ancestor left an indelible mark on you, infusing you with arcane magic. This font of magic, whatever its origin, fuels your spells. See Chapter 10 for the general rules of spell casting and Chapter 11 for the sorcerer spell list. Cantrips. At first level, you know four cantrips of your choice from the sorcerer spell list. You learn additional sorcerer cantrips of your choice at higher levels as shown in the cantrips known column of the sorcerer table. Spell slots. The sorcerer table shows how many spell slots you have to cast your spells of first level and higher. To cast one of these sorcerer spells, you must expend a slot of the spell's level or higher. You regain all expended spell slots when you finish a long rest.
For example, if you know the first level spell Burning Hands and have a first level and a second level spell slot available, you can cast Burning Hands using either slot. Spells known of 1's T level and higher. You know two first level spells of your choice from the Sorcerer spell list. The spells known column of the Sorcerer table shows when you learn more Sorcerer spells of your choice. Each of these spells must be of a level for which you have spell slots. For instance, when you reach third level in this class, you can learn one new spell of first or second level. Additionally, when you gain a level in this class, you can choose one of the sorcerer spells you know and replace it with another spell from the sorcerer spell list, which also must be of a level for which you have spell slots. Spellcasting ability. Charisma is your spellcasting ability for your sorcerer spells, since the power of your magic relies on your ability to project your will into the world. You use your charisma whenever a spell refers to your spellcasting ability. In addition, you use your charisma modifier when setting the saving throw DC for a sorcerer spell you cast and when making an attack roll with one. Spell save DC equals 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your charisma modifier spell attack modifier equals your proficiency bonus plus your charisma modifier. Spellcasting focus. You can use an arcane focus found in chapter 5 as a spellcasting focus for your sorcerer spells. Sorceress Origin Choose a Sorceress Origin which describes the source of your innate magical power, draconic bloodline or wild magic, both detailed at the end of the class description. Your choice grants you features when you choose it at 1st level and again at 6th, 14th, and 18th level. Font of Magic At 2nd level, you tap into a deep wellspring of magic within yourself. This wellspring is represented by sorcery points, which allow you to create a variety of magical effects. Sorcery Points you have two sorcery points and you gain more as you reach higher levels as shown in the sorcery points column of the sorcerer table. You can never have more sorcery points than shown on the table for your level. You regain all spent sorcery points when you finish a long rest. Flexible casting. You can use your sorcery points to gain additional spell slots or sacrifice spell slots to gain additional sorcery points. You learn other ways to use your sorcery points as you reach higher levels. Creating spell slots. You can transform unexpended sorcery points into one spell slot as a bonus action on your turn. The Creating Spell Slots table shows the cost of creating a spell slot of a given level. You can create spell slots no higher in level than 5th Creating Spell Slots. Spell Slot Level Sorcery Point Cost 1st, 2 2nd, 3 3rd, 5 4th, 6 5th, 7 Converting a spell slot to sorcery points as a bonus action on your turn, you can expend one spell slot and gain a number of sorcery points equal to the slot's level. Meta Magic. At third level, you gain the ability to twist your spells to suit your needs. You gain two of the following M Meta Magic options of your choice. You gain another one at 10th and 17th level. You can use only one Meta Magic option on a spell when you cast it, unless otherwise noted. Careful Spell. When you cast a spell that forces other creatures to make a saving throw, you can protect some E of those creatures from the spell's full force. To do so, you spend one sorcery point and choose a number of those creatures up to your charisma modifier minimum of one creature. A chosen creature automatically succeeds on its saving throw against the spell. Distance Spell When you cast a spell that has a range of 5 feet or greater, you can spend one sorcery point to double the range of the spell. When you cast a spell that has a range of touch, you can spend one sorcery point to make the range of the spell 30 feet. Empowered Spell When you roll damage for a spell, you can spend one sorcery point to re-roll a number of the damage dice up to your charisma modifier minimum of one. You must use the new rolls. You can use Empowered Spell even if you have already used a different meta magic option during the casting of the spell. Extended Spell when you cast a spell that has a duration of one minute or longer, you can spend one sorcery point to double its duration to a maximum duration of 24 hours. Heighten Spell When you cast a spell that forces a creature to make a saving throw to resist its effects, you can spend three sorcery points to give one target of the spell disadvantage on its first saving throw made against the spell. Quicken Spell when you cast a spell that has a casting time of one action, you can spend two sorcery points to change the casting time to one bonus action for this casting. Subtle Spell When you cast a spell, you can spend one sorcery point to cast it without any somatic or verbal components. Twin Spell When you cast a spell that targets only one creature and doesn't have a range of self, you can spend a number of sorcery points equal to the spell's level to target a second creature in range with the same spell, one sorcery point if the spell is a cantrip. Ability Score Improvement 
When you reach 4th level and again at 8th, 12th, 16th, and 19th level, you can increase one ability score of your choice by two, or you can increase two ability scores of your choice by one. As normal, you can increase an ability score above 20 using this feature. Sorceress Restoration At 20th level, you regain four expended sorcery points whenever you finish a short rest. Sorceress Origins Different sorcerers claim different origins for their innate magic. Although many variations exist, most of these origins fall into two categories, a draconic bloodline and wild magic. Draconic bloodline. Your innate magic comes from draconic magic that was mingled with your blood or that of your ancestors. Most often, sorcerers with this origin trace their descent back to a mighty sorcerer of ancient times who made a bargain with a dragon or who might even have claimed a dragon parent. Some of these bloodlines are well established in the world, but most are obscure. Any given sorcerer could be the first of a new bloodline as a result of a pact or some other exceptional circumstance. Dragon Ancestor At first level, you choose one type of dragon as your ancestor. The damage type associated with each dragon is used by features you gain later. Draconic Ancestry Dragon Damage Type Black Acid Blue Lightning Brass Fire Bronze Lightning Copper Acid Gold Fire Green Poison red fire, silver, cold, white, cold. You can speak, read, and write draconic. Additionally, whenever you make a charisma check when interacting with dragons, your proficiency bonus is doubled if it applies to the check. Draconic resilience. As magic flows through your body, it causes physical traits of your dragon ancestors to emerge. At first level, your hit point maximum increases by one and increases by one again whenever you gain a level in this class. Additionally, parts of your skin are covered by a thin sheen of dragon-like scales. When you aren't wearing armor, your AC equals 13 plus your dexterity modifier. Elemental Affinity Starting at 6th level, when you cast a spell that deals damage of the type associated with your draconic ancestry, add your charisma modifier to that damage. At the same time, you can spend one sorcery point to gain resistance to that damage type for one hour. Dragon Wings at 14th level, you gain the ability to sprout a pair of dragon wings from your back, gaining a flying speed equal to your current speed. You can create these wings as a bonus action on your turn. They last until you dismiss them as a bonus action on your turn. You can't manifest your wings while wearing armor unless the armor is made to accommodate them and clothing not made to accommodate your wings might be destroyed when you manifest them. Draconic Presence Beginning at 18th level, you can channel the dread presence of your dragon ancestor, causing those around you to become awestruck or frightened. As an action, you can spend 5 sorcery points to draw on this power and exude an aura of awe or fear, your choice, to a distance of 60 feet. For 1 minute or until you lose your concentration as if you were casting a concentration spell, each hostile creature that starts its turn in this aura must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or be charmed if you chose awe or frightened if you chose fear until the aura ends. A creature that succeeds on this saving throw is immune to your aura for 24 hours. Wild Magic Your innate magic comes from the wild forces of chaos that underlie the order of creation. You might have endured exposure to some form of raw magic, perhaps through a planar portal leading to limbo, the elemental planes, or the mysterious far realm. Perhaps you were blessed by a powerful fake creature or marked by a demon. Or your magic could be a fluke of your birth with no apparent cause or reason. However it came to be, this chaotic magic churns within you waiting for any outlet. Wild Magic Surge Starting when you choose this origin at first level, your spellcasting can unleash surges of untamed magic. Immediately after you cast a sorcerer spell of first level or higher, the DM can have you roll a d20. If you roll a 1, roll on the Wild Magic Surge table to create a random magical effect. Tides of Chaos Starting at first level, you can manipulate the forces of chance and chaos to gain advantage on one attack roll, ability check, or saving throw. Once you do so, you must finish a long rest before you can use this feature again. Any time before you regain the use of this feature, the DM can have you roll on the wild magic surge table immediately after you cast a sorcerer spell of first level or higher. You then regain the use of this feature. Then luck starting at sixth level, you have the ability to twist fate using your wild magic. When another creature you can see makes an attack roll, an ability check, or a saving throw, you can use your reaction and spend two sorcery points to roll 1d4 and apply the number rolled as a bonus or penalty, your choice, to the creature's roll. You can do so after the creature rolls but before any effects of the roll occur. Controlled Chaos 
At 14th level, you gain a modicum of control over the surges of your wild magic. Whenever you roll on the wild magic surge table, you can roll twice and use either number. Spell Bombardment. Beginning at 18th level, the harmful energy of your spells intensifies. When you roll damage for a spell and roll the highest number possible on any of the dice, choose one of those dice, roll it again, and add that roll to the damage. You can use the feature only once per turn. Warlock. With a pseudo-dragon curled on his shoulder, a young elf in golden robes smiles warmly, weaving a magical charm into his honeyed words and bending the palace sentinel to his will. As flames spring to life in her hands, a wizened human whispers the secret name of her demonic patron, infusing her spell with fiendish magic. Shifting his gaze between a battered tome and the odd alignment of the stars overhead, a wild-eyed tiefling chants the mystic ritual that will open a doorway to a distant world. Warlocks are seekers of the knowledge that lies hidden in the fabric of the multiverse. Through packs made with mysterious beings of supernatural power, warlocks unlock magical effects both subtle and spectacular. Drawing on the ancient knowledge of beings such as fey nobles, demons, devils, hags, and alien entities of the far realm, warlocks piece together arcane secrets to bolster their own power. Sworn and beholden. A warlock is defined by a pact with an otherworldly being. Sometimes the relationship between warlock and patron is like that of a cleric and a deity, though the beings that serve as patrons for warlocks are not gods. A warlock might lead a cult dedicated to a demon prince, an archdevil, or an utterly alien entity, beings not typically served by clerics. More often, though, the arrangement is similar to that between a master and an apprentice. The warlock learns and grows in power at the cost of occasional services performed on the patron's behalf. The magic bestowed on a warlock ranges from minor but lasting alterations to the warlock's being, such as the ability to see in darkness or to read any language to access to powerful spells. Unlike bookish wizards, warlocks supplement their magic with some facility at hand-to-hand -hand combat. They are comfortable in light armor and know how to use simple weapons. Delvers into secrets. Warlocks are driven by an insatiable need for knowledge and power which compels them into their packs and shapes their lives. This thirst drives warlocks into their packs and shapes their later careers as well. Stories of warlocks binding themselves to fiends are widely known, but many warlocks serve patrons that are not fiendish. Sometimes a traveler in the wilds comes to a strangely beautiful tower, meets its fey lord or lady, and stumbles into a pact without being fully aware of it. And sometimes, while poring over tomes of forbidden lore, a brilliant but crazed student's mind is open to realities beyond the material world and to the alien beings that dwell in the outer void. Once a pact is made, a warlock's thirst for knowledge and power can't be slaked with mere study and research. No one makes a pact with such a mighty patron if he or she doesn't intend to use the power thus gained. Rather, the vast majority of warlocks spend their days in active pursuit of their goals, which typically means some kind of adventuring. Furthermore, the demands of their patrons drive warlocks toward adventure. Creating a warlock. As you make your warlock character, spend some time thinking about your patron and the obligations that your pact imposes upon you. What led you to make the pact and how did you make contact with your patron? Were you seduced into summoning a devil or did you seek out the ritual that would allow you to make contact with an alien elder god? Did you search for your patron or did your patron find and choose you? Do you chafe under the obligations of your pact or serve joyfully in anticipation of the rewards promised to you? Work with your DM to determine how big a part your pact will play in your character's adventuring career. Your patron's demands might drive you into adventures or they might consist entirely of small favors you can do between adventures. What kind of relationship do you have with your patron? Is it friendly, antagonistic, uneasy, or romantic? How important does your patron consider you to be? What part do you play in your patron's plans? Do you know other servants of your patron? How does your patron communicate with you? If you have a familiar, it might occasionally speak with your patron's voice. Some warlocks find messages from their patrons etched on trees, mingled among tea leaves, or adrift in the clouds messages that only the warlock can see. Other warlocks converse with their patrons in dreams or waking visions or deal only with intermediaries. Quick build. You can make a warlock quickly by following these suggestions. First, Charisma should be your highest ability score, followed by Constitution. Second, choose the Charlotte in background. Third, choose the Eldritch Blast and Chill Touch cantrips, along with the first level spells Ray of Sickness and Witch Bolt. Class Features As a Warlock, you gain the following class features. Hit Points Hit Dice, 1d8 per Warlock level. Hit Points at first level, 
8 plus your constitution modifier. Hit points at higher levels, 1d8 or 5 plus your constitution modifier per warlock level after first. Proficiencies. Armor, light armor. Weapons, simple weapons. Tools, none. Saving throws, wisdom, charisma. Skills, choose two skills from arcana, deception, history, intimidation, investigation, nature, and religion. Equipment. You start with the following equipment in addition to the equipment granted by your background. A. A light crossbow and 20 bolts or B. Any simple weapon. A. A component pouch or B. An arcane focus. A. A scholar's pack or B. A dungeoneer's pack. Leather armor, any simple weapon, and two daggers otherworldly patron. At first level, you have struck a bargain with an otherworldly being of your choice, the Archfey, the Fiend, or the Great Old One, each of which is detailed at the end of the class description. Your choice grants you features at 1st level and again at 6th, 10th, and 14th level. Packed Magic Your arcane research and the magic bestowed on you by your patron have given you facility with spells. See Chapter 10 for the general rules of spell casting and Chapter 11 for the Warlock spell list. Cantrips You know two cantrips of your choice from the Warlock spell list. You learn additional Warlock cantrips of your choice at higher levels as shown in the cantrips known column of the Warlock table. Spell Slots The Warlock table shows how many spell slots you have. The table also shows what the level of those slots is. All of your spell slots are the same level. To cast one of your Warlock spells of first level or higher, you must expend a spell slot. You regain all expended spell slots when you finish a short or long rest. For example, when you are fifth level, you have two third level spell slots. To cast the first level spell Thunder Wave, you must spend one of those slots and you cast it as a third level spell. Spells known of 1's T level and higher. At first level, you know two first level spells of your choice from the Warlock spell list. The spells known column of the Warlock table shows when you learn more Warlock spells of your choice of first level and higher. A spell you choose must be of a level no higher than what's shown in the table's slot level column for your level. When you reach sixth level, for example, you learn a new Warlock spell, which can be first, second, or third level. Additionally, when you gain a level in this class, you can choose one of the Warlock spells you know and replace it with another spell from the Warlock spell list, which also must be of a level for which you have spell slots. Spell Asting Ability Charisma is your spell casting ability for your Warlock spells, so you use your Charisma whenever a spell refers to your spell casting ability. In addition, you use your Charisma modifier when setting the saving throw DC for a Warlock spell you cast and when making an attack roll with one. Spell save DC equals 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your charisma modifier. Spell attack modifier equals your proficiency bonus plus your charisma modifier. Spell casting focus. You can use an arcane focus found in chapter 5 as a spell casting focus for your warlock spells. Eldritch invocations. In your study of occult lore, you have unearthed eldritch invocations, fragments of forbidden knowledge that imbue you with an abiding magical ability. At second level, you gain two Eldritch Invocations of your choice. Your Invocation options are detailed at the end of the class description. When you gain certain Warlock levels, you gain additional Invocations of your choice, as shown in the Invocations Known column of the Warlock table. Additionally, when you gain a level in this class, you can choose one of the Invocations you know and replace it with another Invocation that you could learn at that level. Pact Boon At third level, your otherworldly patron bestow a gift upon you for your loyal service you gain one of the following features of your choice. Pact of the Chain. You learn the Find a Familiar spell and can cast it as a ritual. The spell doesn't count against your number of spells known. When you cast the spell, you can choose one of the normal forms for your familiar or one of the following special forms, Imp, Pseudo-Dragon, Quasit, or Sprite. Additionally, when you take the attack action, you can forego one of your own attacks to allow your familiar to make one attack of its own. Pact of the Blade. You can use your action to create a packed weapon in your empty hand. You can choose the form that this melee weapon takes each time you create it. See Chapter 5 for weapon options. You are proficient with it while you wield it. This weapon counts as magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance and immunity to non agical attacks and damage. Your packed weapon disappears if it is more than 5 feet away from you for 1 minute or more. It also disappears if you use this feature again if you dismiss the weapon, no action required or if you die. You can transform one magic weapon into your packed weapon by performing a special ritual while you hold the weapon. You perform the ritual over the course of one hour, which can be done during a short rest. 
You can then dismiss the weapon, shunting it into an extra-dimensional space, and it appears whenever you create your packed weapon thereafter. You can affect an artifact or a sentient weapon in this way. The weapon ceases being your packed weapon if you die, if you perform the one-hour ritual on a different weapon, or if you use a one-hour ritual to break your bond to it. The weapon appears at your feet if it is in the extra-dimensional space when the bond breaks. Pact of the Tome Your patron gives you a grimoire called a Book of Shadows. When you gain this feature, choose three cantrips from any class's spell list. While the book is on your person, you can cast those cantrips at will. They don't count against your number of cantrips known. If you lose your Book of Shadows, you can perform a one-hour ceremony to receive a replacement from your patron. This ceremony can be performed during a short or long rest, and it destroys the previous book. The book turns to ash when you die. Ability Score Improvement When you reach 4th level, and again at 8th, 12th, 16th, and 19th level, you can increase one ability score of your choice by 2, or you can increase two ability scores of your choice by 1. As normal, you can't increase an ability score above 20 using this feature. Mystic Arcanum At 11th level, your patron bestows upon you a magical secret called an Arcanum. Choose one 6th level spell from the Warlock spell list as this Arcanum. You can cast your Arcanum spell once without expending a spell slot. You must finish a long rest before you can do so again. At higher levels, you gain more Warlock spells of your choice that can be cast in this way. 1 7th level spell at 13th level, 1 8th level spell at 15th level, and 1 9th level spell at 17th level. You regain all uses of your Mystic Arcanum when you finish a long rest. Eldritch Master At 20th level, you can draw on your inner reserve of mystical power while entreating your patron to regain expended spell slots. You can spend one minute entreating your patron for aid to regain all your expended spell slots from your packed magic feature. Once you regain spell slots with this feature, you must finish a long rest before you can do so again. Your Packed Boon Each Packed Boon option produces a special creature or an object that reflects your patron's nature. Packed of the Chain Your familiar is more cunning than a typical familiar. Its default form can be a reflection of your patron with sprites and pseudo-dragons tied to the arch fey and imps and quassets tied to the fiend. Because the Great Old One's nature is inscrutable, any familiar form is suitable for it. Pact of the Blade If your patron is the Arch Fey, your weapon might be a slender blade wrapped in leafy vines. If you serve the Fiend, your weapon could be an axe made of black metal and adorned with decorative flames. If your patron is the Great Old One, your weapon might be an ancient-looking spear with a gemstone embedded in its head, carved to look like a terrible, unblinking eye. Pact of the Tome Your Book of Shadows might be a fine, gilt-edged tome with spells of enchantment and illusion gifted to you by the lordly Arch Fey. It could be a weighty tome bound in demon hides studded with iron, holding spells of conjuration and a wealth of forbidden lore about the sinister regions of the cosmos, a gift of the fiend. Or it could be the tattered diary of a lunatic driven mad by contact with the great old one, holding scraps of spells that only your own burgeoning insanity allows you to understand and cast. Otherworldly Patrons The beings that serve as patrons for warlocks are mighty inhabitants of other planes of existence, not gods, but almost godlike in their power. Various patrons give their warlocks access to different powers and invocations and expect significant favors in return. Some patrons collect warlocks, doling out mystic knowledge relatively freely or boasting of their ability to bind mortals to their will. Other patrons bestow their power only grudgingly and might make a pact with only one warlock. Warlocks who serve the same patron might view each other as allies, siblings, or rivals. The Archfey your patron is a lord or lady of the Fey, a creature of legend who holds secrets that were forgotten before the mortal races were born. This being's motivations are often inscrutable and sometimes whimsical and might involve a striving for greater magical power or the settling of age-old grudges. Beings of this sort include the Prince of Frost, the Queen of Air and Darkness, Ruler of the Gloaming Court, Titania of the Sum M. Urquhart, her consort Oberon, the Green Lord, Hersum, the Prince of Fools, and Ancient Hags. Expanded Spell List The Arch Fey lets you choose from an expanded list of spells when you learn a Warlock spell. The following spells are added to the Warlock spell list for you. Arch Fey Expanded Spells Spell Level Spells First Fairy Fire, Sleep Second Calm Emotions, Phantasmal Force Third Blink, Plant Growth Fourth Dominate Beast, Greater Invisibility. Fifth Dominate Person, Seeming. Fey Presence Starting at First Level, your patron bestows upon you the ability to project the beguiling and fearsome presence of the Fey. 
As an action, you can cause each creature in a 10-foot cube originating from you to make a wisdom saving throw against your warlock spell save DC. The creatures that fail their saving throws are all charmed or frightened by you, your choice, until the end of your next turn. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. Misty Escape Starting at 6th level, you can vanish in a puff of mist in response to harm. When you take damage, you can use your reaction to turn invisible and teleport up to 60 feet to an unoccupied space you can see. You remain invisible until the start of your next turn or until you attack or cast a spell. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. Beguiling Defenses Beginning at 10th level, your patron teaches you how to turn the mind-affecting magic of your enemies against them. You are immune to being charmed, and when another creature attempts to charm you, you can use your reaction to attempt to turn the charm back on that creature. The creature must succeed on a wisdom saving throw against your warlock spell save DC or be charmed by you for one minute or until the creature takes any damage. Dark Delirium Starting at 14th level, you can plunge a creature into an illusory realm. As an action, choose a creature that you can see within 60 feet of you. It must make a wisdom saving throw against your warlock spell save DC. On a failed save, it is charmed or frightened by you, your choice, for one minute or until your concentration is broken as if you are concentrating on a spell. This effect ends early if the creature takes any damage. Until this illusion ends, the creature thinks it is lost in a misty realm, the appearance of which you choose. The creature can see and hear only itself, you, and the illusion. You must finish a short or long rest before you can use this feature again. The Friend you have made a pact with a fiend from the lower planes of existence, a being whose aims are evil even if you strive against those aims. Such beings desire the corruption or destruction of all things, ultimately including you. Fiends powerful enough to forge a pact include demon lords such as Demogorgon, Orcus, Frazer Blue, and Baphomet, archdevils such as Asmodeus, Despater, Mephistopheles, and Belial, pit fiends and bailers that are especially mighty, and Ultraloths and other lords of the Yugoloths. Expanded Spell List The Fiend lets you choose from an expanded list of spells when you learn a Warlock spell. The following spells are added to the Warlock spell list for you. Fiend Expanded Spells Spell Level Spells First Burning Hands Command Second Blindness Slash Deafness Scorching Ray Third Fireball Stinking Cloud Fourth Fire Shield Wall of Fire Fifth Flame Strike Hollow Dark One's Blessing Starting at first level, when you reduce a hostile creature to zero hit points, you gain temporary hit points equal to your charisma modifier plus your warlock level, minimum of one. Dark One's own luck. Starting at sixth level, you can call on your patron to alter fate in your favor. When you make an ability check or a saving throw, you can use this feature to add a d10 to your roll. You can do so after seeing the initial roll but before any of the roll's effects occur. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. Fiendish Resilience Starting at 10th level, you can choose one damage type when you finish a short or long rest. You gain resistance to that damage type until you choose a different one with this feature. Damage from magical weapons or silver weapons ignores this resistance. Hurl Through Hell Starting at 14th level, when you hit a creature with an attack, you can use this feature to instantly transport the target through the lower planes. The creature disappears and hurdles through a nightmare landscape. At the end of your next turn, the target returns to the space it previously occupied or the nearest unoccupied space. If the target is not a fiend, it takes 10d10 psychic damage as it reels from its horrific experience. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest. The Great Old One Your patron is a mysterious entity whose nature is utterly foreign to the fabric of reality. It might come from the far realm, the space beyond reality, or it could be one of the elder gods known only in legends. Its motives are incomprehensible to mortals, and its knowledge so immense and ancient that even the greatest libraries pale in comparison to the vast secrets it holds. The Great Old One might be unaware of your existence or entirely indifferent to you, but the secrets you have learned allow you to draw your magic from it. Entities of this type include Gonadar, called that which lurks, Thoristan, the Chained God, Dendar, the Night Serpent, Zargon, the Returner, Great Cthulhu, and other unfathomable beings. Expanded Spell List The Great Old One lets you choose from an expanded list of spells when you learn a Warlock spell. The following spells are added to the Warlock spell list for you. Great Old One Expanded Spells Spell Level Spells First Dissonant Whispers, Tasha's Hideous Laughter Second Detect Thoughts, Phantasmal Force 
Third Clairvoyance, Sending. Fourth Dominate Beast, Everd's Black Tentacles. Fifth Dominate Person, Telekinesis. Awaken Mind. Starting at first level, your alien knowledge gives you the ability to touch the minds of other creatures. You can communicate telepathically with any creature you can see within 30 feet of you. You don't need to share a language with the creature for it to understand your telepathic utterances, but the creature must be able to understand at least one language. Entropic Ward At sixth level, you learn to magically ward yourself against attack and to turn an enemy's failed strike into good luck for yourself. When a creature makes an attack roll against you, you can use your reaction to impose disadvantage on that roll. If the attack misses you, your next attack roll against the creature has advantage if you make it before the end of your next turn. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. Thought Shield Starting at 10th level, your thoughts can't be read by telepathy or other means unless you allow it. You also have resistance to psychic damage, and whenever a creature deals psychic damage to you, that creature takes the same amount of damage that you do. Create Thrall At 14th level, you gain the ability to infect a humanoid's mind with the alien magic of your patron. You can use your action to touch an incapacitated humanoid. That creature is then charmed by you until a remove curse spell is cast on it. The charm ed condition is removed from it, or you use this feature again. You can communicate telepathically with the charmed creature as long as the two of you are on the same plane of existence. Eldritch Invocations If an Eldritch Invocation has prerequisites, you must meet them to learn it. You can learn the invocation at the same time that you meet its prerequisites. Agonizing Blast Prerequisite Eldritch Blast Cantrip When you cast Eldritch Blast, add your Charisma modifier to the damage it deals on a hit. Armor of Shadows you can cast Mage Armor on yourself at will without expending a spell slot or material components. Ascendant Step Prerequisite, 9th level You can cast Levitate on yourself at will without expending a spell slot or material components. Beast Speech You can cast Speak with Animals at will without expending a spell slot. Beguiling Influence You gain proficiency in the Deception and Persuasion skills. Bewitching Whispers Prerequisite, seventh level you can cast Compulsion once using a Warlock spell slot. You can't do so again until you finish a long rest. Book of Ancient Secrets. Prerequisite, Pact of the Tome feature. You can now inscribe magical rituals in your Book of Shadows. Choose two first level spells that have the ritual tag from any class's spell list. The spells appear in the book and don't count against the number of spells you know. With your Book of Shadows in hand, you can cast the chosen spells as rituals. You can't cast the spells except as rituals unless you've learned them by some other means. You can also cast a warlock spell you know as a ritual if it has the ritual tag. On your adventures, you can add other ritual spells to your Book of Shadows. When you find such a spell, you can add it to the book if the spell's level is equal to or less than half your warlock level, round it up, and if you can spare the time to transcribe the spell. For each level of the spell, the transcription process takes 2 hours and costs 50 GP for the rare inks needed to inscribe it. Chains of Carceri. Prerequisite, 15th level, Pact of the Chain feature you can cast Hold Monster at will targeting a Celestial, Fiend, or Elemental without expending a spell slot or material components. You must finish a long rest before you can use this invocation on the same creature again. Devil S. Sight. You can see normally in darkness, both magical and non-agical, to a distance of 120 feet. Dreadful Word. Prerequisite, 7th level. You can cast Confusion once using a Warlock spell slot. You can't do so again until you finish a long rest. Eldritch Sight. You can cast Detect Magic at will without expending a spell slot. Eldritch Spear. Prerequisite. Eldritch Blast Cantrip when you cast Eldritch Blast, its range is 300 feet. Eyes of the Runekeeper. You can read all writing. Fiendish Vigor. You can cast False Life on yourself at will as a first level spell without expending a spell slot or material components. Gaze of Two Minds. You can use your action to touch a willing humanoid and perceive through its senses until the end of your next turn. As long as the creature is on the same plane of existence as you, you can use your action on subsequent turns to maintain this connection, extending the duration until the end of your next turn. While perceiving through the other creature's senses, you benefit from any special senses possessed by that creature, and you are blinded and deafened to your own surroundings. Life Drinker. Prerequisite. 12th level, Pact of the Blade feature when you hit a creature with your Pact weapon, the creature takes extra necrotic damage equal to your Charisma modifier, minimum 1. Mask of many faces you can cast Disguise Self at will without expending a spell slot. Master of Myriad Forms. Prerequisite, 15th level. 
you can cast Alter Self at will without expending a spell slot. Minions of Chaos. Prerequisite, 9th level. You can cast Conjure Elemental once using a Warlock spell slot. You can't do so again until you finish a long rest. Mire the Mind. Prerequisite, 5th level. You can cast Slow once using a Warlock spell slot. You can't do so again until you finish a long rest. Misty Visions. You can cast Silent Image at will without expending a spell slot or material components. One with Shadows. Prerequisite, 5th level. When you are in an area of dim light or darkness, you can use your action to become invisible until you move or take an action or a reaction. Otherworldly Leap. Prerequisite, 9th level. You can cast Jump on yourself at will without expending a spell slot or material components. Repelling Blast. Prerequisite, Eldritch Blast Cantrip. When you hit a creature with Eldritch Blast, you can push the creature up to 10 feet away from you in a straight line. Sculptor of Flesh. Prerequisite, 7th level. You can cast Polymorph once using a Warlock spell slot. You can't do so again until you finish a long rest. Sign of Elomen. Prerequisite, 5th level. You can cast Bestow Curse once using a Warlock spell slot. You can't do so again until you finish a long rest. Thief of Five Fates. You can cast Bane once using a Warlock spell slot. You can't do so again until you finish a long rest. Thirsting Blade. Prerequisite, 5th level, Pact of the Blade feature. You can attack with your packed weapon twice, instead of once, whenever you take the attack action on your turn. Vision of Distant Realms. Prerequisite, 15th level. You can cast Arcane Eye at will without expending a spell slot. Voice of the Chain Master. Prerequisite, Pact of the Chain feature. You can communicate telepathically with your familiar and perceive through your familiar's senses as long as you are on the same plane of existence. Additionally, while perceiving through your familiar's senses, you can also speak through your familiar in your own voice, even if your familiar is normally incapable of speech. Whispers of the Grave. Prerequisite, 9th level. You can cast Speak with Dead at will without expending a spell slot. Which Sight? Prerequisite, 15th level. You can see the true form of any shape changer or creature concealed by illusion or transmutation magic while the creature is within 30 feet of you and within line of sight. Wizard. Clad in the silver robes that denote her station, an elf closes her eyes to shut out the distractions of the battlefield and begins her quiet chant. Fingers weaving in front of her, she completes her spell and launches a tiny bead of fire toward the enemy ranks, where it erupts into a conflagration that engulfs the soldiers. Checking and rechecking his work, a human scribes an intricate magic circle in chalk on the bare stone floor, then sprinkles powdered iron along every line and graceful curve. When the circle is complete, he drones a long incantation. A hole opens in space inside the circle, bringing a whiff of brimstone from the otherworldly plane beyond. Crouching on the floor in a dungeon intersection, a gnome tosses a handful of small bones inscribed with mystic symbols, muttering a few words of power over them. Closing his eyes to see the visions more clearly, he nods slowly, then opens his eyes and points down the passage to his left. Wizards are supreme magic users, defined and united as a class by the spells they cast. Drawing on the subtle weave of magic that permeates the cosmos, wizards cast spells of explosive fire, arcing lightning, subtle deception, and brute force mind control. Their magic conjures monsters from other planes of existence, glimpses the future, or turns slain foes into zombies. Their mightiest spells change one substance into another, call meteors down from the sky, or open portals to other worlds. Scholars of the Arcane. Wild and enigmatic, varied in form and function, the power of magic draws students who seek to master its mysteries. Some aspire to become like the gods, shaping reality itself. Though the casting of a typical spell requires merely the utterance of a few strange words, fleeting gestures, and sometimes a pinch or clump of exotic materials, these surface components barely hint at the expertise attained after years of apprenticeship and countless hours of study. Wizards live and die by their spells. Everything else is secondary. They learn new spells as they experiment and grow in experience. They can also learn them from other wizards, from ancient times or inscriptions, and from ancient creatures, such as the Fae, that are steeped in magic. The lore of knowledge. Wizards' lives are seldom mundane. The closest a wizard is likely to come to an ordinary life is working as a sage or lecturer in a library or university, teaching others the secrets of the multiverse. Other wizards sell their services as diviners, serve in military forces, or pursue lives of crime or domination. 
but the lure of knowledge and power calls even the most unadventurous wizards out of the safety of their libraries and laboratories and into crumbling ruins and lost cities. Most wizards believe that their counterparts in ancient civilizations knew secrets of magic that have been lost to the ages, and discovering those secrets could unlock the path to a power greater than any magic available in the present age. Creating a wizard Creating a wizard character demands a backstory dominated by at least one extraordinary event. How did your character first come into contact with magic? How did you discover you had an aptitude for it? Do you have a natural talent, or did you simply study hard and practice incessantly? Did you encounter a magical creature or an ancient tome that taught you the basics of magic? What drew you forth from your life of study? Did your first taste of magical knowledge leave you hungry for more? Have you received word of a secret repository of knowledge not yet plundered by any other wizard? Perhaps you're simply eager to put your newfound magical skills to the test in the face of danger. Quick build. You can make a wizard quickly by following these suggestions. First, intelligence should be your highest ability score, followed by constitution or dexterity. If you plan to join the school of enchantment, make charisma your next best score. Second, choose the sage background. Third, choose the mage hand, light, and ray of frost cantrips, along with the following first level spells for your spellbook burning hands, charm person, feather fall, mage armor, magic missile, and sleep. Class features. As a wizard, you gain the following class features. Hit points. Hit dice, 1d6 per wizard level. Hit points at first level, 6 plus your constitution modifier. Hit points at higher levels, 1d6 or 4 plus your constitution modifier per wizard level after first. Proficiencies. Armor, none. Weapons, daggers, darts, slings, quarterstaffs, light crossbows. Tools, none. Saving throws, intelligence, wisdom. Skills, choose two from arcana, history, insight, investigation, medicine, and religion. Equipment. You start with the following equipment in addition to the equipment granted by your background. A, a quarterstaff, or B, a dagger. A, a component pouch, or B, an arcane focus. A, a scholar's pack, or B, an explorer's pack. A spellbook spell casting. As a student of arcane magic, you have a spellbook containing spells that show the first glimmerings of your true power. See Chapter 10 for the general rules of spell casting and Chapter 11 for the wizard spell list. Cantrips. At first level, you know three cantrips of your choice from the wizard spell list. You learn additional wizard cantrips of your choice at higher levels as shown in the cantrips known column of the wizard table. Your spellbook. The spells that you add to your spell book as you gain levels reflect the arcane research you conduct on your own as well as intellectual breakthroughs you have had about the nature of the multiverse. You might find other spells during your adventures. You could discover a spell recorded on a scroll in an evil wizard's chest, for example, or in a dusty tome in an ancient library. Copying a spell into the book. When you find a wizard spell of first level or higher, you can add it to your spell book if it is of a level for which you have spell slots and if you can spare the time to decipher and copy it. Copying a spell into your spell book involves reproducing the basic form of the spell, then deciphering the unique system of notation used by the wizard who wrote it. You must practice the spell until you understand the sounds or gestures required, then transcribe it into your spell book using your own notation. For each level of the spell, the process takes 2 hours and costs 50 GP. The cost represents material components you expend as you experiment with the spell to master it, as well as the fine inks you need to record it. Once you have spent this time and money, you can prepare the spell just like your other spells. Replacing the book? You can copy a spell from your own spell book into another book, for example, if you want to make a backup copy of your spell book. This is just like copying a new spell into your spell book, but faster and easier since you understand your own notation and already know how to cast the spell. You need spend only 1 hour and 10 GP for each level of the copied spell. If you lose your spell book, you can use the same procedure to transcribe the spells that you have prepared into a new spell book. Filling out the remainder of your spell book requires you to find new spells to do so as normal. For this reason, many wizards keep backup spell books in a safe place. The book's appearance. Your spellbook is a unique compilation of spells with its own decorative flourishes and margin notes. It might be a plain, functional leather volume that you received as a gift from your master, a finely bound gilt-edged tome you found in an ancient library, or even a loose collection of notes scrounged together after you lost your previous spellbook in a mishap. Spellbook. At first level, you have a spellbook containing six first-level wizard spells of your choice. Preparing and Casting Spells. 
The wizard table shows how many spell slots you have to cast your spells of first level and higher. To cast one of these spells, you must expend a slot of the spell's level or higher. You regain all expended spell slots when you finish a long rest. You prepare the list of wizard spells that are available for you to cast. To do so, choose a number of wizard spells from your spellbook equal to your intelligence modifier plus your wizard level minimum of one spell. The spells must be of a level for which you have spell slots. For example, if you're a third level wizard, you have four first level and two second level spell slots. Within Intelligence of 16, your list of prepared spells can include six spells of first or second level in any combination chosen from your spellbook. If you prepare the first level spell Magic Missile, you can cast it using a first level or a second level slot. Casting the spell doesn't remove it from your list of prepared spells. You can change your list of prepared spells when you finish a long rest. Preparing a new list of wizard spells requires time spent studying your spellbook and MMORizing the incantations and gestures you must make to cast the spell at least one minute per spell level for each spell on your list. Spell Asting Ability Intelligence is your spell casting ability for your wizard spells since you learn your spells through dedicated study and memorization. You use your intelligence whenever a spell refers to your spell casting ability. In addition, you use your intelligence modifier when setting the saving throw DC for a wizard spell you cast and when making an attack roll with one. Spell save DC equals 8 plus your proficiency bonus plus your intelligence modifier. Spell attack modifier equals your proficiency bonus plus your intelligence modifier. Ritual casting. You can cast a wizard spell as a ritual if that spell has the ritual tag and you have the spell in your spellbook. You don't need to have the spell prepared. Spell casting focus. You can use an arcane focus found in chapter 5 as a spell casting focus for your wizard spells. Learning spells of 1's T level and higher. Each time you gain a wizard level, you can add two wizard spells of your choice to your spellbook. Each of these spells must be of a level for which you have spell slots, as shown on the wizard table. On your adventures, you might find other spells that you can add to your spellbook. See the Your Spellbook sidebar. Arcane Recovery. You have learned to regain some of your magical energy by studying your spellbook. Once per day when you finish a short rest, you can choose expended spell slots to recover. The spell slots can have a combined level that is equal to or less than half your wizard level, rounded up and none of the slots can be 6th level or higher. For example, if you're a 4th level wizard, you can recover up to 2 levels worth of spell slots. You can recover either a 2nd level spell slot or 2 1st level spell slots. Arcane Tradition when you reach second level, you choose an arcane tradition shaping your practice of magic through one of eight schools, abjuration, conjuration, divination, enchantment, evocation, illusion, necromancy, or transmutation. All detailed at the end of the class description. Your choice grants you features at second level and again at sixth, tenth, and fourteenth level. Ability score improvement. When you reach 4th level and again at 8th, 12th, 16th, and 19th level, you can increase one ability score of your choice by 2 or you can increase two ability scores of your choice by 1. As normal, you can increase an ability score above 20 using this feature. Spell Mastery At 18th level, you have achieved such mastery over certain spells that you can cast them at will. Choose a 1st level wizard spell and a 2nd level wizard spell that are in your spellbook. You can cast those spells at their lowest level without expending a spell slot when you have them prepared. If you want to cast either spell at a higher level, you must expend a spell slot as normal. By spending 8 hours in study, you can exchange one or both of the spells you chose for different spells of the same levels. Signature Spells When you reach 20th level, you gain mastery over two powerful spells and can cast them with little effort. Choose two third level wizard spells in your spellbook as your signature spells. You always have these spells prepared, they don't count against the number of spells you have prepared, and you can cast each of them once at third level without expending a spell slot. When you do so, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest. If you want to cast either spell at a higher level, you must expend a spell slot as normal. Arcane Traditions The study of wizardry is ancient, stretching back to the earliest mortal discoveries of magic. It is firmly established in the worlds of D&D with various traditions dedicated to its complex study. The most common arcane traditions in the multiverse revolve around the schools of magic. Wizards through the ages have cataloged thousands of spells, grouping them into eight categories called schools, as described in Chapter 10. In some places, these traditions are literally schools a wizard might study at the School of Illusion while another studies across town at the School of Enchantment. 
In other institutions, the schools are more like academic departments with rival faculties competing for students and funding. Even wizards who train apprentices in the solitude of their own towers use the division of magic into schools as a learning device, since the spells of each school require mastery of different techniques. School of Abjuration The School of Abjuration emphasizes magic that blocks, banishes, or protects. Detractors of the school say that its tradition is about denial, negation rather than positive assertion. You understand, however, that ending harmful effects, protecting the weak, and banishing evil influences is anything but a philosophical void. It is a proud and respected vocation. Called abjurers, members of the school are sought when baleful spirits require exorcism, when important locations must be guarded against magical spying, and when portals to other planes of existence must be closed. Abjuration Savant Beginning when you select the school at second level, the gold and time you must spend to copy an abjuration spell into your spellbook is halved. Arcane Ward Starting at second level, you can weave magic around yourself for protection. When you cast an abjuration spell of first level or higher, you can simultaneously use a strand of the spell's magic to create a magical ward on yourself that lasts until you finish a long rest. The ward has hit points equal to twice your wizard level plus your intelligence modifier. Whenever you take damage, the ward takes the damage instead. If this damage reduces the ward to zero hit points, you take any remaining damage. While the ward has zero hit points, it can't absorb damage, but its magic remains. Whenever you cast an abjuration spell of first level or higher, the ward regains a number of hit points equal to twice the level of the spell. Once you create the ward, you can't create it again until you finish a long rest. Projected Ward Starting at 6th level, when a creature that you can see within 30 feet of you takes damage, you can use your reaction to cause your arcane ward to absorb that damage. If this damage reduces the ward to 0 hit points, the warded creature takes any remaining damage. Improved Abjuration Beginning at 10th level, when you cast an abjuration spell that requires you to make an ability check as a part of casting that spell, as in counterspell and dispel magic, you add your proficiency bonus to that ability check. Spell Resistance Starting at 14th level, you have advantage on saving throws against spells. Furthermore, you have resistance against the damage of spells. School of Conjuration As a conjurer, you favor spells that produce objects and creatures out of thin air. You can conjure billowing clouds of killing fog or some M on creatures from elsewhere to fight on your behalf. As your mastery grows, you learn spells of transportation and can teleport yourself across vast distances even to other planes of existence in an instant. Conjuration Savant Beginning when you select the school at second level, the gold and time you must spend to copy a conjuration spell into your spellbook is halved. Minor Conjuration Starting at second level when you select the school, you can use your action to conjure up an inanimate object in your hand or on the ground in an unoccupied space that you can see within 10 feet of you. This object can be no larger than 3 feet on a side and weigh no more than 10 pounds, and its form must be that of a non agical object that you have seen. The object is visibly magical, radiating dim light out to five feet. The object disappears after one hour when you use this feature again or if it takes any damage. Benign Transposition Starting at sixth level, you can use your action to teleport up to 30 feet to an unoccupied space that you can see. Alternatively, you can choose a space within range that is occupied by a small or medium creature. If that creature is willing, you both teleport, swapping places. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest or you cast a conjuration spell of first level or higher. Focus Conjuration Beginning at 10th level, while you are concentrating on a conjuration spell, your concentration can't be broken as a result of taking damage. Durable Summons Starting at 14th level, any creature that you summon or create with a conjuration spell has 30 temporary hit points. School of Divination the counsel of a diviner is sought by royalty and commoners alike, for all seek a clearer understanding of the past, present, and future. As a diviner, you strive to part the veils of space, time, and consciousness so that you can see clearly. You work to master spells of discernment, remote viewing, supernatural knowledge, and foresight. Divination Savant Beginning when you select the school at second level, the gold and time you must spend to copy a divination spell into your spellbook is halved. Portent Starting at second level when you choose the school, glimpses of the future begin to press in on your awareness. When you finish a long rest, roll 2d20s and record the numbers rolled. 
you can replace any attack roll, saving throw, or ability check made by you or a creature that you can see with one of these foretelling rolls. You must choose to do so before the roll and you can replace a roll in this way only once per turn. Each foretelling roll can be used only once. When you finish a long rest, you lose any unused foretelling rolls. Expert Divination Beginning at 6th level, casting divination spells comes so easily to you that it expends only a fraction of your spellcasting efforts. When you cast a divination spell of 2nd level or higher using a spell slot, you regain one expended spell slot. The slot you regain must be of a level lower than the spell you cast and can't be higher than 5th level. The third eye. Starting at 10th level, you can use your action to increase your powers of perception. When you do so, choose one of the following benefits which lasts until you are incapacitated or you take a short or long rest. You can't use the feature again until you finish a rest. Dark Vision You gain dark vision out to a range of 60 feet as described in Chapter 8. Ethereal Sight You can see into the ethereal plane within 60 feet of you. Greater Comprehension You can read any language. See Invisibility You can see invisible creatures and objects within 10 feet of you that are within line of sight. Greater Portent Starting at 14th level, the visions in your dreams intensify and paint a more accurate picture in your mind of what is to come. You roll 3d20s for your Portent feature rather than 2. School of Enchantment As a member of the School of Enchantment, you have honed your ability to magically entrance and beguile other people and monsters. SOME enchanters are peacemakers who bewitch the violent to lay down their arms and charm the cruel into showing mercy. Others are tyrants who magically bind the unwilling into their service. Most enchanters fall somewhere in between. Enchantment Savant Beginning when you select the school at second level, the gold and time you must spend to copy an enchantment spell into your spellbook is halved. Hypnotic Gaze Starting at second level when you choose the school, your soft words and enchanting gaze can magically enthrall another creature. As an action, choose one creature that you can see within five feet of you. If the target can see or hear you, it must succeed on a wisdom saving throw against your wizard spell save DC or be charmed by you until the end of your next turn. The charmed creature's speed drops to zero and the creature is incapacitated and visibly dazed. On subsequent turns, you can use your action to maintain this effect, extending its duration until the end of your next turn. However, the effect ends if you move more than five feet away from the creature, if the creature can neither see nor hear you, or if the creature takes damage. Once the effect ends or if the creature succeeds on its initial saving throw against this effect, you can't use this feature on that creature again until you finish a long rest. Instinctive Charm Beginning at 6th level, when a creature you can see within 30 feet of you makes an attack roll against you, you can use your reaction to divert the attack, provided that another creature is within the attack's range. The attacker must make a wisdom saving throw against your wizard spell save DC. On a failed save, the attacker must target the creature that is closest to it, not including you or itself. If multiple creatures are closest, the attacker chooses which one to target. On a successful save, you can't use this feature on the attacker again until you finish a long rest. You must choose to use this feature before knowing whether the attack hits or misses. Creatures that can't be charmed are immune to this effect. Split Enchantment Starting at 10th level, when you cast an enchantment spell of 1st level or higher that targets only one creature, you can have it target a second creature. Alter Memories At 14th level, you gain the ability to make a creature unaware of your magical influence on it. When you cast an enchantment spell to charm one or more creatures, you can alter one creature's understanding so that it remains unaware of being charmed. Additionally, once before the spell expires, you can use your action to try to make the chosen creature forget some of the time it spent charmed. The creature must succeed on an intelligence saving throw against your wizard spell save DC or lose a number of hours of its memories equal to 1 plus your charisma modifier, minimum 1. You can make the creature forget less time, and the amount of time can't exceed the duration of your enchantment spell. School of Evocation you focus your study on magic that creates powerful elemental effects such as bitter cold, searing flame, rolling thunder, crackling lightning, and burning acid. Some evaders find employment in military forces, serving as artillery to blast enemy armies from afar. Others use their spectacular power to protect the weak, while some seek their own gain as bandits, adventurers, or aspiring tyrants. Evocation Savant Beginning when you select the school at second level, the gold and time you must spend to copy an evocation spell into your spellbook is halved. Sculpt Spells Beginning at second level, you can create pockets of relative safety within the effects of your evocation spells. 
When you cast an evocation spell that affects other creatures that you can see, you can choose a number of them equal to 1 plus the spell's level. The chosen creatures automatically succeed on their saving throws against the spell and they take no damage if they would normally take half damage on a successful save. Potent Cantrip Starting at 6th level, your damaging cantrips affect even creatures that avoid the brunt of the effect. When a creature succeeds on a saving throw against your cantrip, the creature takes half the cantrip's damage, if any, but suffers no additional effect from the cantrip. Empowered Evocation Beginning at 10th level, you can add your intelligence modifier to the damage roll of any wizard evocation spell you cast over channel. Starting at 14th level, you can increase the power of your simpler spells. When you cast a wizard spell of 5th level or lower that deals damage, you can deal maximum damage with that spell. The first time you do so, you suffer no adverse effect. If you use this feature again before you finish a long rest, you take 2d12 necrotic damage for each level of the spell immediately after you cast it. Each time you use this feature again before finishing a long rest, the necrotic damage per spell level increases by 1d12. This damage ignores resistance and immunity. School of Illusion You focus your studies on magic that dazzles the senses, befuddles the mind, and tricks even the wisest folk. Your magic is subtle, but the illusions crafted by your keen mind make the impossible seem real. Some illusionists, including many gnome wizards, are benign tricksters who use their spells to entertain. Others are more sinister masters of deception, using their illusions to frighten and fool others for their personal gain. Illusion Savant Beginning when you select the school at second level, the gold and time you must spend to copy an illusion spell into your spellbook is halved. Improved Minor Illusion When you choose the school at second level, you learn the Minor Illusion Cantrip. If you already know this cantrip, you learn a different wizard cantrip of your choice. The cantrip doesn't count against your number of cantrips known. When you cast Minor Illusion, you can create both a sound and an image with a single casting of the spell. Malleable Illusions Starting at 6th level, when you cast an illusion spell that has a duration of 1 minute or longer, you can use your action to change the nature of that illusion using the spell's normal parameters for the illusion, provided that you can see the illusion. Illusory Self Beginning at 10th level, you can create an illusory duplicate of yourself as an instant, almost instinctual reaction to danger. When a creature makes an attack roll against you, you can use your reaction to interpose the illusory duplicate between the attacker and yourself. The attack automatically misses you, then the illusion dissipates. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. Illusory Reality By 14th level, you have learned the secret of weaving shadow magic into your illusions to give them a semi-reality. When you cast an illusion spell of first level or higher, you can choose one inanimate, non agical object that is part of the illusion and make that object real. You can do this on your turn as a bonus action while the spell is ongoing. The object remains real for one minute. For example, you can create an illusion of a bridge over a chasm and then make it real long enough for your allies to cross. The object can't deal damage or otherwise directly harm anyone. School of Necromancy the School of Necromancy explores the cosmic forces of life, death, and undeath. As you focus your studies in this tradition, you learn to manipulate the energy that animates all living things. As you progress, you learn to sap the life force from a creature as your magic destroys its body, transforming that vital energy into magical power you can manipulate. Most people see necromancers as menacing or even villainous due to the close association with death. Not all necromancers are evil, but the forces they manipulate are considered taboo by many societies. Necromancy Savant Beginning when you select the school at second level, the gold and time you must spend to copy a necromancy spell into your spellbook is halved. Grim Harvest At second level, you gain the ability to reap life energy from creatures you kill with your spells. Once per turn when you kill one or more creatures with a spell of first level or higher, you regain hit points equal to twice the spell's level or three times its level if the spell belongs to the school of necromancy. You don't gain this benefit for killing constructs or undead. Undead Thralls At sixth level, you add the animate dead spell to your spellbook if it is not there already. When you cast animate dead, you can target one additional corpse or pile of bones, creating another zombie or skeleton as appropriate. Whenever you create an undead using a necromancy spell, it has additional benefits. The creature's hit point maximum is increased by an amount equal to your wizard level. The creature adds your proficiency bonus to its weapon damage rolls. Inured to undeath beginning at 10th level, you have resistance to necrotic damage, and your hit point maximum can't be reduced. 
You have spent so much time dealing with undead and the forces that animate them that you have become inured to some of their worst effects. Command Undead. Starting at 14th level, you can use magic to bring undead under your control, even those created by other wizards. As an action, you can choose one undead that you can see within 60 feet of you. That creature must make a charisma saving throw against your wizard spell save DC. If it succeeds, you can't use this feature on it again. If it fails, it becomes friendly to you and obeys your commands until you use this feature again. Intelligent undead are harder to control in this way. If the target has an intelligence of 8 or higher, it has advantage on the saving throw. If it fails the saving throw and has an intelligence of 12 or higher, it can repeat the saving throw at the end of every hour until it succeeds and breaks free. School of Transmutation You are a student of spells that modify energy and matter. To you, the world is not a fixed thing, but eminently mutable, and you delight in being an agent of change. You wield the raw stuff of creation and learn to alter both physical forms and mental qualities. Your magic gives you the tools to become a smith on reality's forge. Some transmuters are tinkerers and pranksters, turning people into toads and transforming copper into silver for fun and occasional profit. Others pursue their magical studies with deadly seriousness, seeking the power of the gods to make and destroy worlds. Transmutation Savant Beginning when you select the school at second level, the gold and time you must spend to copy a transmutation spell into your spellbook is halved. Minor Alchemy Starting at second level when you select the school, you can temporarily alter the physical properties of one non agical object, changing it from one substance into another. You perform a special alchemical procedure on one object composed entirely of wood, stone, but not a gemstone, iron, copper, or silver, transforming it into a different one of those materials. For each 10 minutes you spend performing the procedure, you can transform up to one cubic foot of material. After one hour, or until you lose your concentration, as if you W air concentrating on a spell, the material reverts to its original substance. Transmutus Stone Starting at 6th level, you can spend 8 hours creating a transmutus stone that stores transmutation magic. You can benefit from the stone yourself or give it to another creature. A creature gains a benefit of your choice as long as the stone is in the creature's possession. When you create the stone, choose the benefit from the following options. Dark vision out to a range of 60 feet as described in Chapter 8. An increase to speed of 10 feet while the creature is unencumbered. Proficiency in constitution saving throws. Resistance to acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder damage. Your choice whenever you choose this benefit. Each time you cast a transmutation spell of first level or higher, you can change the effect of your stone if the stone is on your person. If you create a new transmuter stone, the previous one ceases to function. Shea Changer At 10th level, you add the polymorph spell to your spellbook if it is not there already. You can cast polymorph without expending a spell slot. When you do so, you can target only yourself and transform into a beast whose challenge rating is 1 or lower. Once you cast polymorph in this way, you can't do so again until you finish a short or long rest that you can still cast it normally using an available spell slot. Master Transmuter Starting at 14th level, you can use your action to consume the reserve of transmutation magic stored within your transmuter's stone in a single burst. When you do so, choose one of the following effects. Your transmuter's stone is destroyed and can't be remade until you finish a long rest. Major Transformation You can transmute one non agical object, no larger than a 5-foot cube, into another non agical object of similar size and mass and of equal or lesser value. You must spend 10 minutes handling the object to transform it. Panacea. You remove all curses, diseases, and poisons affecting a creature that you touch with the transmuter stone. The creature also regains all its hit points. Restore life. You cast the raise dead spell on a creature you touch with the transmuter stone without expending a spell slot or needing to have the spell in your spellbook. Restore youth. You touch the transmuter's stone to a willing creature, and that creature's apparent age is reduced by 3d10 years to a minimum of 13 years. This effect doesn't extend the creature's lifespan. 